Hello and welcome. My name is Steven Greider, and I'm really excited to tell you everything I know about testing with React Testing Library and Jest. But before we dive into any technical content, I just want to give you a quick introduction and help you understand how you can get help inside this course if you get stuck at any point in time. So as we go throughout this course and we write tests, we write code, you might eventually see a error message or some issue that is just preventing you from progressing throughout the course. If that ever happens, there's a couple of ways you can get unstuck. First, you'll notice that many different lectures throughout this course have zip files attached to them. Inside these zip files are checkpoints or pretty much all the code that is included for one particular video. So you can always download that code, check it out and understand, make sure that your code is the exact same as mine. Second place to go if you ever get stuck is the QA discussion boards on udemy.com. There's a lot of discussion going on there. They are all inside this course. You can find them really easily and ask any question that might come up. And then finally, a Discord server. Later on inside of this section, you're going to find a text lecture where I give you a link. It will take you off to a Discord server where you can get some live help from other students and TAs. All right, that's it. Now that we've got this administrative stuff out of the way, let's start to write out some code in the next video. Now that we've got some administrative stuff out of the way, let's dive into some technical content. So in this video, we're going to go through a very quick example of adding in a couple of tests to an existing React project. I've set up an existing project for us to work on. I've got a link to it on the screen right here. So I would encourage you to open up a new browser tab and navigate to this address. Once you get to this address, you'll see a page like this. On the right hand side, there's a little preview window. So again, a very small React app. I set it up for us. We're going to write a couple of tests just to make sure this app works as expected. The application is really simple. Whenever you first load it up, you're going to see a collection of different products on the screen. And all these products are randomly generated. So we don't really know what color is going to be up top. We don't really know what the title is going to be or what the price of these products are. Once we show the first six products to the user, the user can then click on the load more button down here and load up an additional six products. They can then scroll down to the bottom, click on load more again, and repeat the process as many times as they wish. So we're going to take a look at how we would test a very small application like this. Now, whenever you get into testing, I find a lot of people get a little bit intimidated. They say, well, what are we trying to test? What's our goal? How do we set up the tests? All that kind of stuff. For right now, we're going to keep things really simple and straightforward. I want to take a moment here to identify what the kind of core functionality is inside this application. And once we do that, we're going to write out a test or two just to make sure that the core functionality works as expected. So in this application, it's pretty simple and straightforward. The app starts up. We have six products visible on the screen. If we then click on the Load More button, we then get another six visible. So in total, 12. So we're going to write out two separate tests here. The first test is just going to make sure that when our application starts up, we see six products. We're then going to write out a second test and make sure that if we click on the Load More button, we then see 12 products visible on the screen. For right now, as we write out these two tests, we're not going to talk a lot about, about the code that we're actually writing. We're going to go over all the code line by line in the next video or two. So let's get to it. Let's get started on writing out some tests. Back inside this editor, on the left-hand side, I'm going to find the SRC directory. And inside there, I'm going to make a file with a very special name. The name is going to be app.test.js. Once I have created that file, I'll make sure I have it open. And then we're going to add in a little bit of code at the top. First, I'm going to write out a couple of import statements. Again, we're going to go over all this code in just a moment. So for right now, we're just going to write it out. I'm going to add in an import for render, screen, and wait for. And these are going to be imported from at testing-library slash react. Let me also increase the font size just a little bit to make sure that's super legible. I'll then add in an import for user from at testing dash library user event. And then finally, I'm going to import the app component, which is located inside the app.js file. So import app from dot slash app. I'm then going to start to write out these two separate tests. I'm going to call a built-in function called test 
and provide it a first argument of a string. That's going to describe each of the tests we're going to write out. So the first test we're going to write out is going to have a very simple description, just say shows six products by default. Because that's our goal. That's what we're trying to make sure is working. As a second argument, I'm going to put in an arrow function, and I'm going to mark it as async. I'll then start to add in the second test. I'm going to give this one another very simple description and say, clicking on the button loads six more products. And then again, I'll put in an async arrow function. All right, time to implement the two tests. So on the first one, we're going to first start everything off by rendering the app component. So I'm going to call render and put in the app component. I'm then going to try to find six products on the screen. This is where things get a little bit interesting. For me in particular, I'm going to try to make sure that I see six H3 elements. Each of these product titles, they are H3 elements. So I'm going to try to make sure that I see six H3 elements on the screen. And that's going to be kind of proof that I have six products. Now, of course, by finding six H3 elements, we're not really making sure that we're also seeing, say, a price or the add to cart button or the tag or the image at the top. We're going to go into more detail on that again in just a little bit. So for right now, we're just going to make sure that we find six titles. So to find six titles, I'm going to write out const headings is await screen.find all by role and then put in a string of heading. Notice there is no S on there. It's just a string of heading. I'm then going to make sure that I found six headings by writing out expect headings to have length six. And that should be it for our first test. So now let's write out the second one. For the second test, I'm going to again render my app component. I'm then going to try to find that button element at the bottom of the screen, the one all the way down here. We need to simulate clicking on that button. So we're going to first find the button and then simulate a kind of click event on it. So we're going to write out const button is await screen dot find by role button. And then a second argument that's going to be an object. It's going to have a name property. And then we're going to put in forward slash load more forward slash I. Notice that these are forward slashes. They are not backslashes. I'll then simulate a click event on that button with await user.click button. Now, after clicking on that button, it's going to take just a little bit of time to load up some additional products. So if I refresh the page over here, notice how when I click on the button, additional products are not instantly available on the screen. We have to wait just a little bit of time. So I'm going to take account for that by adding in a function call right after the user.click. We're going to add in a wait, wait for, put in an arrow function that's also going to be marked as async. And then inside of here, I'm going to again try to find all the different headings that are available on the screen. And this time around, I want to make sure that there are 12 of them. So I'll say const headings is await screen find by or find all by role with a string of heading. And then I will expect to find six headings or some 12 this time to have length 12. There we go. Okay, so that's it. We've now got our two tests put together. And I know there's a lot of mysterious code in here. And in particular, there's a lot of async await stuff. And believe it or not, that's actually going to be a huge focus inside this course. Last thing we're going to do is attempt to run these tests really quickly. So to run the tests and make sure that this little application works as we expect, on the preview window over here on the right-hand side, I'm going to find tests on the top right hand. And then I'm going to click on the play button or the test should automatically run themselves. If you attempt to run the tests and see that they fail, or if nothing happens at all, I would encourage you to just refresh the entire page. Make sure you save your work first, but then go ahead and refresh the page. Code Sandbox, unfortunately, the testing apparatus here, it does fail somewhat frequently. So again, if any error comes up, just make sure you do a quick refresh.
And if you're still getting an error after that, definitely double check your code and make sure you have the same thing as I. Once our tests run, we should see that two tests have successfully executed. And that means that in theory, our application is working as we expect. Okay, so this is our first taste of testing. But of course, there's just a lot of things going on here that we really need to investigate. So let's come back in just a moment and go through all this code line by line. We have finished up our first set of tests. Now I want to focus on the actual code we wrote out and start to understand what is going on here. Now, just so you know, the entire rest of the course is dedicated to understanding the code inside of here. So this is really just our first taste of understanding this testing code. You don't have to memorize any of this. I really just want to give you an idea of what is going on. So to help you understand that code, I'm going to try to answer a couple of questions you might have around it. The first thing we're going to focus on is the import statements at the top. We wrote out two import statements for outside libraries, and they both look like we are importing very similar or identical libraries. So what are these libraries? What are they doing for us? When we go into the world of testing, we're going to very quickly see that there is a very wide variety of different libraries that we need to use. So I've got the first two right here that we actually imported. But behind the scenes, there are several other libraries that we are making use of inside this project, and we'll be making use of in future projects as well. So first, testing library slash React. This is a library that is going to take one of our components and render it, get it ready to be tested. So you can think of it as being kind of vaguely similar in purpose to React DOM, but it does a couple of things on top of that that we're going to dive into in a little bit. We also made use of user event. As the name kind of implies, this allows us to simulate user input. So things like typing or clicking or focusing an element and so on. Behind the scenes, we're making use of another library called testing library slash DOM. This library is automatically included inside of our project by testing library slash react. So you are already making use of this library, even though we don't really see an import statement for it. This library helps us find elements that are being rendered by our components. So we've already used this thing three times already inside of our existing tests. We used it one time right here to find all the different heading elements, one time right here to find all the different buttons, and one time right here to find all the different headings again. To run our tests, we're making use of a library called Jest. Jest is going to collect all of our different test files, execute them, run all the tests inside, and then report the results back to us. And then finally, we're also going to be making use of JS DOM. JS DOM is technically not being used by Code Sandbox, but it's going to be used very soon in all the future projects we work on. More on JS DOM in a little bit. Okay, so next up, how were our tests found? We created that test file, and we didn't actually appear to run any specific commands or anything like that. We didn't import that test file. It just appeared that our tests magically were executed. So let's go into a little bit of detail on that. All right. So Jest, remember that's one of the libraries we just discussed, is in charge of collecting all the different test files inside of our project and executing them. Jest is going to find all the different files that satisfy one of these three different criteria and it's going to assume that they are all files that contain tests. So it's going to find any file that ends with the name of spec.js, test.js, or is a plain JavaScript file placed inside of a folder called underscore underscore test underscore underscore. So notice there are two underscores on either side. Any file that meets one of these three criteria is going to be treated as a test file. Just is going to automatically execute them and assume that they contain some tests. So that's how our app.test file was found and executed automatically. Okay, last step. What did our testing code actually do, line by line? We'll go over this really quick right now. Okay. So inside of our app.test.js file, we defined two different tests. We define a test by calling the built-in test function. The first argument is going to be a string that describes the purpose of our test. And the second is going to be a function that contains our actual testing code. In this case, we're going to focus on just the first test for right now and go over the body of that test line by line. So as you can guess, the first line of code is going to take our app component and render it. So we're going to produce some representation of HTML. Our HTML is going to look kind of something like this. There are many other elements inside there. I'm just not including it in this diagram. So step one, just render the component. That's pretty much it. Step number two, 
we use the screen variable to find all the different elements that had a roll of heading. And I'm going to give you a lot more information on what roles are and what the heading role is in a little bit. This line of code is really taking a look at our HTML and finding a set of elements inside of it. So in this case, we found all the different H3 elements. And then finally, the last line of code, received that array of headings that we just found, the array of HTML elements, and it just made sure that we actually had six of them. If we had zero, if we had five, if we had seven, or anything other than six, this line of code would have thrown an error. Jest would have detected that error and told us that our test was failing for some reason. Okay, so that's it. Once again, you don't need to memorize this just yet, just kind of a high level overview of the code we just wrote out. So now that we've got a little bit better idea of what's going on, let's get started on our next project in just a moment. In this course, we're gonna first get started with our testing career by creating a very simple project with Create React App. We're gonna build this project out very quickly and then add in some tests for it. The goal of this first project is to just get you familiar with the testing process and help you understand some of the big challenges we run into. After that first project, I'm going to give you a starter project. So kind of a mostly complete project that I've already put together ahead of time. We're going to understand the project. We're going to write out some tests for it. We're then going to add in some new features to it and add in some additional tests. So for right now, just understanding some of the basics around testing. And then later on, not that far, it's going to be just a handful of videos. I'm going to give you this larger project with more complex features, and we're going to get into the real nuts and bolts of testing. So that's it. That's the plan. Let's get started on making a very simple project right away. So let me first begin by showing you a couple of mockups on what we're going to build. Now, again, this is a very simple project. So at the very top of the screen, we're going to show a form where a user can enter in some information about a person. They can enter in a name and an email. Once they then click this submit button right here, we're going to take the name and the email and add it into a list of users or a table of users down here at the bottom. So we would expect to see a new row added into this table, and we should see the name and the email of that person. That's pretty much it. That's all we're doing for the first project. Again, the goal here is to just understand the basics of testing. Let's get started on this project right away by going over to our terminal and generating a new project using the Create React app. So over at my terminal, I'm gonna change into any old folder on my machine, any workspace directory is fine, and then I will generate my project with npx create react app. And I'm going to call this application simply users. All right, I'll let that run. It'll take just a moment to generate the project. So let's pause right here and come back together in just a moment. I have finished generating my new project. I'm going to change into the new project directory and then start up my React development server with a classic npm run start. As soon as I run that command, my browser should open up and I should see the classic React starter landing page right here. Very good. Now, in addition to starting up the development server, I'm also going to make sure I open up my code editor inside this project directory as well. I have already done so between the last video and this one. So make sure you open up your code editor inside of our new users project directory too. In this video, we're going to focus on just starting to build out the application. We're not going to worry about testing at all. Just to make this project really easy and straightforward to put together, I'm going to give you a design on the different components we're going to make. So let me show you exactly how we're going to make this thing. First, we're going to begin by creating two different components. One will be called user form, and that's going to display the form at the top of the screen. We will also make a user list. And as you guess, this is going to show the list or the table of users down here at the bottom. So we need to add in two components in addition to the usual app component that we're going to have as well. Inside of our app component, we're going to have a piece of state that keeps track of all the different users who have been added into our application. So it will start off as an array, and by default, it will be an empty array. So something like that. Over time, as a person adds in users, by using that form at the top, we're going to add objects into this array, where each object represents a user who has been added. And again, every user is going to have a name property and an email property. In order to render this list of users onto the screen, we're going to take this piece of state and pass it as a prop down into the user list component. In order to add in new users over time, 
we're going to define a callback inside the app component called onUserAd. OnUserAd is going to be passed as a prop down into the user form. Whenever someone adds in a new user by using that form, we're going to call that callback with that prop with a brand new user. And we can imagine this new user object is going to flow back up to the app component and be added into the list of users up here. Now, if this is all confusing, do not sweat it at all. We're going to write out all the code for this in due time in the coming video or two. And I'm very confident that you're going to understand exactly what's going on. I just want to give you a very quick preview of what we're going to do. Let's get started right away inside of our code editor. We're going to create the user form and the user list components. And we'll start putting together some basic elements inside of both of them. All right, so back inside my editor, I'm going to find the SRC directory. I'm going to make a new file inside there called userform.js and another one called userList.js. Let's then start adding in some code to user form. Inside of user form, I'll define my user form component. I'm going to immediately export it at the bottom as the default export. And then inside of the component itself, I'm going to return a form that's going to have a div with a label of name and then an input, which is going to eventually store the name. I'll then add in a second div with a label of email and an input for that one as well. Then finally, underneath both the divs, I will add in a button and I'll give the button some text like add user. There we go. To make sure that we are on the right path here, let's try importing this new user form component into the app component and displaying this thing on the screen. I will go to the app.js file. Here's app.js. Now we still have a ton of starter code inside of here. I'm going to clean a lot of this code up right away. So I'm going to delete the imports at the top. Inside the app component itself, I'm going to delete everything, including the return statement. And so I'm left with just what you see right here. Then at the very top, I'm going to import the user form component we just created. And inside of the app component, I will return a div that contains the user form. All right, so let's save. Over to the browser, quick test. And there's our form, enough to at least get us started. Okay, we're on the right path here. All we have to do is add in a little bit more implementation to user form. Let's continue developing the user form component. This component is going to use some state to keep track of whatever user types into these two input elements. So the input element for the name and the one for the email. Whenever a user submits the form, either by pressing the enter key or by clicking on the button down here, we need to make sure that we have a callback to catch that submittal event. So let's add in a little bit more implementation here. At the very top of the file, I'm going to begin by adding in an import for use state from React. I will then define two different pieces of state, one for email, and I'll default that to be an empty string, and one for name. And I will default that to be an empty string as well. I'm then going to connect these two pieces of state to the two different input elements. So the first input right here, I will give a value of name and an on change event handler. I'm going to write out the event handler in line right here. So I'm going to receive the event object and abbreviate it simply as E and then call set name with E target value. And I'm going to save the file just to apply a little bit of code formatting and make this easier to read. All right, there's the input for the name. Let's repeat that same process for the email one as well. So on the second input, we'll put in a value of email on change e set email e target value. Finally, let's add in an event handler to the form and watch for the form submission event. So I'll add in a prop to this thing of on submit. Whenever a user submits this form, I want to call a callback or an event handler that I'm going to call handle submit. 
I'll then define that event handler right above the JSX block. So I'll say const handle submit. I will receive the event object and call it event prevent default. And then for right now, once again, just to make sure we're going down the right path, I'll put in a console log of name and email. Okay, back over to the browser for another quick manual test. I'm going to open up my console. I'll enter in some name, some email, click on add user, and there's the console log. All right, very good. So now all we have to do is make sure that instead of a console log right here, we want to pass the new email and name up to the app component. So we have to put a little connection in there. Once we've taken care of that, we then only have to develop out the user list component, which should be really, really quick. So I think we can probably wrap up this whole application in the next video. Let's take care of it then. Time to wrap up our application. So we're going to go to the app component, and we're going to define a piece of state called users and default it to be an empty array. We'll then make an event handler called onUserAd and pass it down into the user form. Whenever a user submits the form, we're going to take the information about the user that was just entered and pass it into this event handler that was passed down as a prop. Then inside that event handler, we're going to use that use new user, add it into the big list of users in the app component, and then finally, we'll take the users list and pass it down into the user list component. Once again, I know this stuff when you kind of speak about it or when you say, hey, here's what we're going to do. Sounds a little bit complicated, but this is some pretty straightforward React stuff. So let's just write out the code for this really quickly so we can start to focus on the much more interesting part, which is the testing aspect. Okay, so back inside my editor, I'm going to find the app component that's inside the app.js file. At the very top, let's import use state from React. I'll then define a new piece of state called users and default it to be an empty array. I'll then make my event handler, which is going to run whenever a new user is added. I'll call it on user add. I'm going to assume this will be called with some new user object, and I'm going to add that into the big list of users. So we will call set users, put in a new array, copy over all the existing users, and add in the new one to the very end. I'll then pass this event handler, this callback, down into the user form component as a prop called on user add, like so. Then inside of user form, I'm going to go back over to that file. I will receive that prop by destructuring it out of the argument list. And then finally, inside of handle submit, I'm going to remove the console log we left behind. And whenever the form is submitted, let's call on user add and put in as an object. So notice the curly braces right there, name and email. And that should be it. So now we are communicating these newly added users up into the app component. The last thing we have to take care of is actually rendering out the list of users. So inside of our app.js file, at the very top, let's import user list from user list. Underneath the form, I will add in a horizontal rule just for a little bit of very light styling and then display user list, and I will pass down the list of users as a prop. All right, last step, all we have to do is open up the user list component, receive the list of users, and render them out. So I will find the user list.js file. At the very top, I will define my component. I will export it at the bottom. I will receive the list of users. I'm then going to iterate over that list of users with a map statement. So I'll say rendered users is users.map. And inside of this mapping function, I'm going to build out every row of the table. So we want to display every name and then email in separate cells of a table. I'm going to receive each individual user. I'll then return a tr element 
that has a key, and we'll use the user's name as the key, and then a TD element that displays the user's name, a TD that displays the user's email, and then finally, we'll build up the entire table, making use of the rendered user's variable. So I will return a table element that has a T head. Inside there will be a TR. We'll give it a TH of name and a TH of email. And then the T body. And inside there, we'll display the rendered users. And that's it. I'm going to zoom out on this file so you can see the entire thing. Now, if you got stuck at any point in time, or if I just kind of sped through this too quickly, don't sweat it. I'm going to attach the completed version of this code to the next video, or should, to this video, I should say. So all the completed video or co code for this application will be attached to this video. You can just download it and use that code directly. One last thing, I'm going to test this out manually just to make sure the entire application works. So back over in the browser, I'm going to refresh the page. I should then be able to add in a name of, say, Alex and alex at gmail.com. Looks good. You'll notice that the name and email inputs do not empty themselves out whenever we add a new user. That's okay for right now. We'll add in a test to make sure that we actually eventually take care of that. I should also be able to add in jane at jane.com. Yeah, all looks good. And I do not see any error messages. So that's it for the simple application. We got the kind of boring part done. Now we can start to focus on adding in some tests. I know putting together this small project right at the start of the course is not super exciting, but fortunately it is all done. So now we can start to write out some tests and make sure that these components are working as expected. So here's the process we're going to go through, and we're going to repeat this process for each individual component we have put together. The app, the user form, and the user list. In step one, we're going to pick out one component that we want to test all by itself. We're going to first begin by testing the user form component. So that is the form at the very top of the page. Once we picked out that component, we're then going to make a test file for it, if one doesn't already exist. So back inside my SRC directory, we want to test the user form component, and that's inside of user form JS. So I'm going to make a test file by creating a new file inside the same directory, and I'm going to give it a name of user form .test .js. So here's user form, here's user form test .js. We're going to write out all the tests for the user form component, you guessed it, inside this file. Next up, we're going to take a look at our component, and we're going to decide what the most important aspects or the most important parts of the component are. This part, or this step right here, is where we decide exactly what we want to test about our component. So for the user form, I've come up with what I think are kind of the two most important aspects of this thing. I think the most important aspects are that it shows two inputs, one right here and one right here, and one button. The other thing that I think is really important about this is that if we enter in a name and an email and then click on the submit button, we should call the on user add prop, that callback that is passed into our component. If it doesn't call that callback whenever user submits the form, that means something is not quite right with the component, and we would probably need to figure out what is going wrong. So these are the two important things I think that it really exist inside of our component right now. So we're going to try to test both aspects. All right, so step four, we're going to open up that test file and start to write out our tests. Okay, so back over inside of user form test.js, we're going to write out a little bit of code. And again, some of this is going to be a little bit mysterious, but I'm going to make sure it's super clear what it's all about over time in the coming videos. To get started at the very top, I'm going to import render and screen from at testing library slash react. I'm then going to import user from at testing library slash user dash event. And then finally, I'm going to import our component itself. So user form from dot slash user form. I'm then going to define our first test. Remember, we can define a test by calling the built-in test function. This is built into the global environment, so we do not need to import the test function into this file or anything like that. The test function is provided by our test runner, which is jest. 
The first argument to the test function is going to be a short description for what we are trying to test. So in this case, we're trying to make sure that the user form shows two inputs and a button. So I'll say it shows two inputs and a button. The second argument to the test function is going to be a function itself. So this is where we're going to write out our actual testing code. The structure of just about every test we ever write is almost always going to be the same. And I'm going to write out some comments just to guide you through these steps. So the first thing we're always going to do inside of our test is render the component. We need to actually take our component and render it. We need to produce some HTML that we can somehow work with. In step two, we're going to manipulate the component or find an element in it. So we might need to simulate typing inside of some text input or simulate clicking on a button or something like that. That's going to go on during step two. And then finally, step three, we're going to make an assertion. So that word is assertion, like so. It means that we're going to make sure that our component is doing what we expect it to do. So that might be it successfully calls a callback. Maybe it successfully shows some element on the screen. Maybe it updates itself. It can be any of a wide variety of different things. And over time, we're going to cover a tremendous number of different assertions that we can make to make sure the component is behaving as we expect. Okay, so again, just about every test is going to have these three same parts. So let's now go through and kind of fill in the blanks here. To render the component, we're going to use the render function that we just imported from testing library slash react. We call the render function and we put in the component that we want to render as JSX, like so. If we want to pass any props to our component when it is rendered, we would pass them in right here. So for example, if we wanted to pass in some, I don't know, name prop or something like that, we can just write it out directly. Now notice that we are rendering just the user form component by itself. So there currently is no app component. There's no concept of a user list. We have isolated just the user form component and we're testing it by itself. Now in step number two, we're going to either manipulate the component or try to find an element that has been rendered by it. So in this case, we might try to find those two user or the two text inputs that we've added in and that button as well. And the code for this that we're going to write out to try to find these different elements is going to be a little bit mysterious, but we're going to go into great detail on what it does in just a little bit. So first, I'm going to declare a variable called inputs. And this is going to be a screen get all by role. And I'm going to put in text box. I'll then put in button screen dot get by role button. All right, so again, we're going to go into detail on what the screen and these get by role functions are in just a little bit. First, let's finish up the test by writing out an assertion. So we should have found two different text inputs, and we should have found one button. So I'm going to write out some assertions to make sure that is the case. And again, we're going to go into a lot more detail on this. So I'm going to write out expect inputs to have length 2 and expect button to be in the document. You'll notice that these look a little bit different. That's, again, just something we're going to go into more detail on. All right, so that's it. I've written out my first test. And we're going to dive back into this test to understand what's going on with it. But first, let's just try running it and make sure that it actually passes. So to run a test, we're going to open up our command line, open up the terminal, and run a command to execute all the tests. The command we're going to run is npm run test. That's going to automatically find all the different test files inside of our project and run them to make sure everything is working as expected. To run these tests, I will go back over to my terminal. I'm going to open up a second terminal window and make sure that I'm still inside of my user's project directory. I will then execute npm run test. I'll see a lot of output go by. I'm going to zoom out here so I can see everything. And now if I scroll up a little bit, I'll see that it looks like one test is failing and one is passing. The test that is failing is the app test.js file. So remember when we first created our project, we automatically got one test file created for us. So there is a app test file. There's still a test inside there and it was just a default generated one. We'll eventually go and fix that up, but for right now we can just ignore it. 
If we scroll down to the bottom, we will see that all the tests inside of our user form test file have passed. So that means that we successfully have shown two text inputs and one button. Very good. Our first test is all done and passing. And now I want to go over some of the code inside of here and make sure the code just completely makes sense. Okay, so first we'll begin with a little bit of backstory here. What happens when we run our tests? Whenever we run our tests, they are being executed in a Node.js environment. There is no browser like Chrome or Firefox involved. Whenever we render our component by calling that render function, a fake browser environment is being created by a library called JS DOM. Our component is rendered, HTML is taken from it, and is placed into this kind of fake browser environment. So we can imagine that there kind of somewhat is real HTML that we are working with here. After we render our component, we can then access elements that have been placed or rendered in here by using this screen object. And we imported that screen object from the React testing library. So that's what's going on with the render function and the screen object. The next thing I want to focus on are the functions we are using to find individual elements that were rendered by our component. These functions have name like get all by role and get by role. Now, before talking about those functions too much, I just want to point out something that's really important in the process of testing. It is extremely common in just about every single test we ever write out that we're going to render a component and then try to find some elements that our component produced. This is going to happen all the time in almost every test. So for example, if we ever need to test form submission, we need to render our component and then find a button that we can click on. If we want to test navigation, we need to render our component and then find a link element to click. If we want to make sure a header is visible, we need to find a header element. So the point here is that it's extremely common for us to try to render a component and then try to find an element. Query functions are how we are going to find elements that our component has rendered. These query functions, a little bit of bad news here, the query functions can be a little bit tedious to use sometimes. So we're going to introduce them slowly throughout the course because there are many different query functions we're going to eventually use. So here's our first little taste of these query functions, which we use to find elements. These query functions are provided by React Testing Library. In total, there's about 48 different functions or so, and I've got a partial list of them right here. Now I'm going to tell you right away, you do not need to memorize all of these different functions. We usually use a small subset of them very frequently on individual projects. These different query functions have very similar names. So they are going to have names like get by role, find by role, get by label text, query all by role, find by title, a pretty repetitive name structure. And we're going to see that the names actually have a lot of meaning. Eventually you will know what function to use without looking at any documentation based upon just the name of the function itself. Okay. So that's where these two functions are coming from. They are being used or they are part of the query system. We use them to find elements that have been rendered by our component. Now the query functions we are using in particular of get all by role and get by role, we're going to use these very often. So I want to go into more detail on them in just a moment. Our test is currently using two different query functions, get all by role and get by role. I want to help you understand what this role stuff is talking about, because we're going to be making use of these two query functions quite a bit throughout the course. Okay, so the word role is referring to something called an ARIA role. ARIA roles clarify the purpose of an HTML element. This is an entire system that's been developed to help people who have disabilities, particularly around vision or eyesight, understand what is visible on the screen of their browser. These ARIA roles are most often used by screen readers. A screen reader is a piece of software that helps people just understand what content is on the screen. Now, many different HTML elements, such as tables and buttons and text inputs, have what is referred to as an implicit role. Implicit is a fancy technical term in this case. What it really means is some elements automatically get assigned a role. We can also manually assign a role to an element. You and I are not going to do this very often. The reason for that is really simple. The ARIA role system is very easy to make mistakes with, and even very highly trained engineers sometimes assign roles incorrectly. So usually if you are not a total expert and you know exactly what you're doing, it's usually best to try to not manually assign roles to an element. So you and I are not going to do manual assignment too often. We're really just going to depend upon the implicit role of different elements. Okay. A little bit more information here. 
So like I said, many different HTML elements have an automatic or implicit role assigned to them. Here's a partial listing right here. So some elements like h1, h2, h3, and so on, all have an ARIA role of heading. That means if you ever display an h1, h2, h3, and so on, and a person with a screen reader selects this element or asks their screen reader software to tell them what this element is doing, the screen reader will say, this is a heading element, and it will tell the user exactly what text is inside that heading. ULs and LIs have a role of list, buttons, button, anchor elements, link, and an input of type text or an input without any type attribute assigned to it is going to have a role of text box. So that's what's going on here with these two function calls. We are saying, go and take a look at the HTML that was produced by our component and find whatever elements were rendered that have a role of text box. That's going to find our two inputs and find some element that has a role of button. That's going to find our button. Now, this entire role system is the primary or the preferred way of finding elements that have been rendered by our component. React Testing Library really pushes you in this direction. They want you to try to find elements based upon role. This might sound a little bit tedious because it pretty much means that we need to understand this entire ARIA role system in order to test our components. Well, yes and no. Understanding the role system, you're going to see it gets pretty easy pretty quickly. It's not the trickiest thing in the world. And if you don't want to use roles at all, there's not a great reason not to, but if you don't want to use roles at all, there are many other ways that we can find elements that our component has rendered. So in this course, we're going to be using these roles quite a bit, so you're going to get a lot of practice with them. The last thing I'd like to take a look at around our test are the assertions down here at the bottom. So remember, these are referred to as assertions. They are where we are going to make sure that our component is doing exactly what we expect. In our case, we have two different assertions, one to make sure that we found two different inputs and one to just make sure that the button we found is actually visible on the screen or present in the document. Whenever we want to make an assertion, we're going to use the expect function. Expect is provided by the Jest testing framework. It is a global variable, so that means we do not need to import it or anything like that. Whenever we call expect, we are always going to pass in some value right here. We're then going to chain on a function that we refer to as a matcher. A matcher is going to take a look at the value we passed in and make sure that some property or attribute of it is equal to maybe something we provide or just make sure that the value we provided is present in the document or exists or any of a variety of different checks. There are many different matchers available to us. Once again, you do not need to memorize this full list, but there are several that we're going to focus on throughout the course. The matchers that we have available to us inside of our project and all create React app projects are coming from both the Jest testing library and some additional matchers are provided by React testing library. The matchers that come from Jest are kind of more general purpose, test just about anything, React components, Node.js code, pretty much any JavaScript. So the matchers coming from Jest are going to have names like to have length, to equal, to contain, to throw, to have been called. You can find a full list of all these different matchers at the link you see right there. The other set of matchers that we get access to, again, they're coming from React Testing Library. Technically, a library called Jest DOM is the one that's providing these extra matchers. You can find a link to the documentation for this right there at the bottom of this diagram. These matchers are going to have names like to be in the document, to be enabled, to have class, to have text content, to have value. All of these matchers are generally concerned with making sure that some DOM element has some particular attribute or is present, has text, and so on. We're going to be using matchers from both these libraries throughout all of our different tests quite a bit. The nice thing about these matchers is that they usually have very plain text names that you can kind of read and very quickly understand what they do. So for example, expect an element to have class. Well, there's really only so many things this could be talking about. Maybe it's talking about a JavaScript class, or in this case, what it's actually talking about is an element having a class name. So you can pretty much very quickly figure out what the different matchers are checking for without even looking at the documentation. Okay, so that's, again, just a little bit on these different matchers. We're going to use a wide variety of different matchers throughout the course, so we're going to get a lot of practice with different ones. All right, I think that's enough around this first test. So we're going to start to work on our next test in just a moment, where we're going to try to enter some text into our form and attempt to submit it. 
The next test we're going to add around our form is to make sure that we can type inside of the name input, the email input, and then click on the submit button. And whenever we do that, we should call the on user add callback with the information out of the form. If you do not remember what on user add is, that's totally fine. Let me give you a quick reminder. When we made the user form component inside of user form JS, we expect this component to receive a prop called on user add. When the form is submitted, on user add gets called with a name and the email out of the form inside of an object. This is a huge core component or core interaction inside of our component. So we really want to make sure we have a test around this to make sure the form submission process is definitely working as expected. That's why we are adding in a test around it. All right, so let's open up user form test JS. At the bottom of this file, I'm going to add in a new test with a description of it calls on user add when the form is submitted. Now, just so you know, I'm going to put a comment in here right away. And I'm going to say, not the best implementation. So we're going to write out a version of this test that is maybe not the best way of doing things. I'm then going to write out the test. We're going to put it all together and it's going to work. The test is going to work as expected. We'll then take a break. We'll then discuss exactly why this isn't the best implementation. And then we're going to fix everything up. Part of testing is not only knowing what to test, but also the best way to do the test. And so that's what I really want you to understand here. I want you to understand there's many different ways we can do this, but one way is possibly a little bit better than the others. All right. In addition to that comment, I'm also going to add in a couple of other comments just to guide myself and describe what I'm trying to do in my test step by step. So first I'm going to try to render my component. I'm then going to find the two inputs. I'm going to simulate typing in a name, simulate typing in an email. I'll then find the button, simulate clicking the button to submit the form. And then I'll write out an assertion to make sure on form or excuse me, on user add, that's the name, gets called with email and the name. So that's it. That's what we're going to try to do inside this test. Well, let's get started right away on step number one. So we're going to try to render our component the exact same way we did previously. I will call render and put in user form. Next, I'm going to add in some code that's going to find those two text inputs. And we can do this the same way we did it up here with that get all by role. Get all in particular, notice how this one is called get all, the other is get by role. Get all is going to try to find multiple different elements that have a role of text box. Get by role is going to find only just one. If get by role ever finds zero elements or more than one, it's going to throw in error. So we most often use get by role when we expect to find exactly one element with a given role. All right, to find the two text inputs, I'll get my inputs, the screen, get all by role. And I'm looking for elements with a role of text box, because that is the implicit role that is assigned to all input elements that do not have a type or elements that or inputs that have a type of text. Once we find those two inputs, we then want to simulate typing in a name to the first one and an email to the second. So I'm going to do a little bit of destructuring here because I want to get a reference to the first input and the second one. So I'm going to replace inputs with square brackets and then destructure. I'll call the first one name input and the second email input. Next up, we need to simulate typing inside of the first input. To, to simulate typing, we're going to use a library that we already imported into this file at the top, the user event library. When we import the user event library, we get an object called user. This object has a couple of functions tied to it that allow us to simulate very common user events, such as clicking and typing. The two most important functions we're going to use off that library are user.click and user.keyboard. User.click is going to simulate a click event, clicking on some particular element that we provide as the first argument. We're going to call user.keyboard and then put in a string anytime that we want to simulate typing some string. And if we ever need to simulate pressing a control character, such as the command key 
or the enter key, arrow keys, and so on, we'll put in the name of the key and surrounded by curly braces. So for example, user.keyboard, curly braces enter is going to simulate pressing the enter key. So in our case, we want to simulate first clicking on the input because we need to focus it. And then we're going to attempt to type in it by calling keyboard. So we'll put in user.click on the name input and then user.keyboard and I'll enter in a name of Jane. I'm then going to repeat the same process on the email one. So email input, user, keyboard, there we go, jane at jane.com. Just some random email. That totally works. Okay, this look, is looking good so far, but rather than have this video go on too long, quick pause and we'll finish up the test in just a moment. Let's start to wrap up this test. The first thing we have to do is find the button inside the form. We can find the button by using some code very similar to what we did on the last test. So we can use screen get by role and look for some element that has an aria role of button. That should give us the button inside the form. Okay, back down here, we'll say button is screen get by role button. We're then going to simulate clicking on that button, which should trigger a form submission. We can simulate clicking on that button with a user.click on button. There we go. Now we still have to write out an assertion, but before we do, I would like to save this file, try to run our tests, and just make sure that we're kind of on the right path for right now. So I'm going to save the file, go back over to my terminal. And as soon as I do so, you'll notice that we have two tests failing. That means that the test we just wrote out is probably failing, and we probably still have a failure from that app test.js file. Right now, these errors are really hard to read. There's like a ton of feedback here, and I just have a hard time, honestly, trying to figure out what is going on. So I would like to try to run just one test file right now. I do not want to run the app test file because it's just making interpreting this feedback here really, really challenging. Running our tests is the Jest testing framework. Jest has the ability to run just one single test file at a time. We can run a single test file by running our test with npm run test and then pressing W on our keyboard. You'll notice there is a message down here that says press W to show more. So I'm going to press W and then it'll say, okay, press one additional key. In this case, I'm going to press P, which allows me to filter which test files I run based upon their name. So I'm going to press P on my keyboard and now I can enter in the name of the test file I want to run. I'm going to type out user form. And I'll be told that if I use this as kind of a filter, I'm going to only run the user form test.js file, and I will not run the test inside of app test.js. So I'm going to press enter. And now I'm running only the tests out of user form. So it's now it's going to be a lot easier for us to understand why our test is failing, because we are not seeing all the output from that other failing test inside of app test.js. Now, since we've done the filtering, we can actually scroll up a little bit and get a better sense of why the test is not passing or why it's even throwing an error right now. So scrolling back up to the top, we'll see that right now, whenever we attempt to submit the form, we get an error message of on user add is not a function. So what's going on here? Well, remember, this is a really important thing to keep in mind. Inside of our tests, we are rendering just the user form component. There is no app component. It's not being tested right now. So we are taking just this component by itself. We're attempting to run it and we're attempting to type in it and clicking on it and so on. Right now, whenever we render user form, we are not passing in any props to it whatsoever. No props. So inside of user form, whenever we render this thing, it is not being given an on user add prop. We did not provide one. So when we simulate submitting the form, handle submit is called but there is no function called on user add. We did not provide it. So on user add is essentially undefined. And that's why we are seeing an error message whenever we'd run our test right now. So we need to fix this up. One way we could fix this up is by going back over to our test and putting in right here on user add and then an empty arrow function. If we do this, so if we save it and flip back over to our terminal, now our test is going to pass because whenever we simulate submitting the form, 
there is a on user add prop. There's a function there that can be called. Now this definitely makes the error go away, but there's a little bit of a problem. Remember, the entire goal of this test is to make sure that the on user add function gets called and make sure that it gets called with the correct email and name. So we need to somehow provide a function right here where we can somehow verify that it gets called. And on top of that, make sure that it gets called with the correct arguments. Let me show you one possible way of doing this. And it's not really the best way, but it's gonna kind of work for right now. Remember, this is not the best implementation. So we're gonna fix this up and put in something better in just a moment. Right above our render call, I'm gonna define a new function called callback. Whenever this function is called, I'm going to receive all the arguments that it gets called with by putting in dot, dot, dot args. I'm then going to define an array right above called arg list. Whenever callback gets called, I'm going to take the arguments that was provided and I'm going to push them into arg list. So we can do that with an arg list dot push args like so. So if you look at callback, this function really just records what it gets called with. It stores them in that array and that's all it does. It really doesn't do anything else. I'm then going to take that and provide it to on user add. So now what does this really do for us? Well, now, whenever we try to submit our form, we should be able to take a look at arg list and see inside there, the list of arguments that on user add or our function was provided. So we can use arg list right here. We can use this array to verify that our callback function actually was called and that it was called with an appropriate email and password, or excuse me, email and name. I keep saying email and password. We want to make sure it gets called the appropriate email and name. So here's one way we could do that. We could write out expect arg list to have length one. So that's going to make sure that our callback function got called at least one time. We could also make sure that the arg list where we're storing all those different arguments has the correct email and name. So we might do something like expect arg list at zero at zero. I'll show you why we need the two there in just a moment. We want to make sure that that equals name of Jane and email of Jane at Jane.com. I'm picking specifically name of Jane and Jane at Jane.com because that is what I typed into the two inputs up here. Now let's save this and see if our test is passing. So if I flip back over, the test is passing. So that means that I am correctly verifying in theory that the on user ad callback is getting called and that it's being called with the correct email and name. I can really easily verify to make sure the test is working correctly if I change maybe the name right here. So if I put in the name of ASDF or something like that, save this, flip back over again, I'll see an error message. So I expected my test is checking to see for that gibberish right there, but it was actually Jane that was received. So this is kind of proof that the test is working correctly. Okay, so the test right now, once again, it works, but things are not the best. So we're going to come back through. I'm going to point out some big issues with our test, and then we're going to start to fix these issues one by one. And again, the entire purpose of this is to give you a better idea of exactly why we write tests the way we do. All right, my friends, time to fix things up. So again, this is not the best implementation we put together inside of this test. We're going to figure out exactly what's wrong with it and figure out how to make a couple of improvements. So the first thing I'd like to fix up is this callback setup right here. I know this part of the code right here is a little bit confusing. The idea is we need to verify and make sure that whatever we pass down as the on user add prop actually gets called and we need to make sure it gets called with the correct arguments. So this is one kind of hacky way of doing it, but it turns out that recording and making sure that functions actually get called is something that happens all the time in our tests. It happens so often, as a matter of fact, that the jest testing framework gives us a little tool to kind of automate this process of making sure that a callback function gets called and make sure that it has the correct arguments whenever it gets called. So this is going to be something called mock functions. A mock function is a fake function that doesn't really do anything when it is called. All it does is record the fact that it got called and it also records the arguments that it was called with. So you can think of it as being almost identical to this very simple code that we just put together right here. This is a function that doesn't really do anything when it is called. 
It just records whatever arguments are received. That's it. The word mock in English, just in case you're not a native English speaker, means not real. So whenever you see mock functions, it means kind of like fake or not real. We most often use mock functions whenever we need to make sure that a component actually calls a callback. There are several other cases where we are going to use mock functions, and we'll see many uses of these things over time inside the course. So let's take a look at a diagram to understand what's going on here. So we're going to create a mock function. We're going to pass it down as the on user add prop to our user form. The mock function is going to have some internal storage of sorts. It's going to record how many times it has been called. It's also going to record all the different arguments it receives whenever it gets called. So we're going to pass that down as the on user add prop to our form. We're then going to simulate the form submission. And whenever we submit the form, our component should call this function and it should provide some name and email inside of an object. So the mock function is going to store that argument it received. And it's also going to say, oh, I was called. So I'm going to increase this counter right here. I've been called one time. We can then write out a couple of assertions to make sure that our mock function was called exactly one time. And we can also make sure that it was recalled with the correct arguments. So essentially do the exact same thing we have already done in our test, but do it in a more appropriate way, rather than making this kind of fake callback thing as we have done, it's a little bit challenging to understand. Okay, so here's how we're going to create and test a mock function. I'm going to delete this arg list and callback right here. I'm also going to delete the comment because we are on the way to doing a correct implementation. I'm going to create a variable called mock. And this is going to be jest.fn, like so. So this is how we create a mock function. It is simply jest.fn. Mock is now a function, so we can call this thing if we want to. And whenever we call it, it's going to have some internal storage. It's going to keep track of the fact it was called. I'm going to take that mock function and pass it down to the on user add prop. Then later on inside of our test, we're still going to type inside the input, type inside the input, and then submit the form. After submitting the form, we need to again, make an assertion. We need to make sure that the mock function was called and that it received the appropriate props. Jest has some built-in matchers to make sure that a mock function gets called and to make sure it gets the appropriate props. These matchers are going to be expect mock to have been called. So that's going to make sure the mock function just plain was called and that it got called at least one time. We'll then also make sure that it received the appropriate arguments. There's another matcher to verify the arguments the mock received. So it's expect mock to have been called with. And then we can put in as an argument here, what argument we expect the mock function to have received. So once again, for us, it will be an object with a name of Jane and an email of Jane at Jane.com. So name of Jane, email of Jane at Jane.com. All right, let's save this back over to our terminal. And there we go. Looks like our test is still passing. So the code that we have now and the code we had before is pretty much equivalent. We were passing down a function just to verify that it got called at some point in time and make sure it got called with the appropriate arguments. But we're usually not going to write these functions out by hand. Instead, we're going to use these mock functions just because they greatly simplify the testing process. And that is not the only thing we need to fix up inside of our test. There's one or two other things, so let's fix those up in just a moment. Let's take a look at the next thing to fix up inside this test. So the next problem is around this find to input step right here. We are currently trying to find all the different elements inside of our component that have a role of text box. And the real issue here is that we assume that there's always going to be exactly one input that's going to serve as the name input, and another one's going to serve as the email input. The reason that this is an issue is that our components change over time. We might eventually decide to add in additional inputs to our form. So back inside of user form JS, we might decide to reorder these inputs. For some reason, we might decide that putting the name second in the email first is better. We also might decide to add in additional inputs. So maybe something like age or something like that. If we make just about any change to these inputs, be it the order, their name, anything like that, well, we're going to start to have a failing test here. 
So we would say that this test is brittle. It is brittle, it is easy to break, because if we change the ordering of the inputs, if we decide to add in additional inputs, this test is going to break even though the component itself might still be working correctly. So the current way in which we are finding these two inputs is not that great. Let's find a better way of doing this. So a better way is going to require us to understand a little bit more around forms and inputs and labels in particular. So here's a little bit of backstory. All right, so this is a label and an input element. I want to tell you a little bit around some normal, traditional HTML stuff. So this is not really React specific. If you are ever creating a label with an input next to it, you can give the label a for attribute. In JSX, we have to write it out as HTML4, but if you were doing normal HTML, it would be just for. If a label has an HTML4 that is equal to an input elements ID attribute, then clicking on the label is going to focus the input. Let me give you a quick demonstration of this. So back inside of our component, here is user form. I'm going to find the name label. Actually, let's do email first. So on the label, I'm going to give this thing a HTML4 prop of email. And then on the input right after it, I'll put in an ID of email. So we have now created a pairing between these two different elements. If I save this, go back over to the browser. And then if I find the label for the email right here and click on the label, the input will be selected. If I go up to the name and click on the label, the input is not selected. So this is just a little accessibility and usability thing, particularly for mobile devices where a user might accidentally tap on the label when they really need to select the input. We can take advantage of this nice little feature when we are trying to select or find particular elements inside of our tests. So let me show you how this relates to our testing. Okay, here we go. So if we have correctly set up the pairing between a label and an input, then we can select the text input very easily and make sure we get the correct one by using either of these two selecting functions, these two query functions. So one way we could do this is by calling screen get by role, look for an element with a role of text box, and then put in a second filter object that has a name with a regular expression of enter email. The name attribute here is going to take a look at the label's text. In this case, my label has enter email. So it's a regular expression. It's going to look for some label element with text of enter email. It's then going to find the paired input element, the element that is paired up with that label. So in this case, it is the input right there. So this query function is going to find the input. Another way we could do this is by using another function called get by label text. And you might be able to guess what this does. It's going to find some label that has text that matches this regular expression of enter email. And it's going to give us the input element that is associated with that label. So either of these query functions would be absolutely appropriate to use. Now, React Testing Library itself prefers or recommends that you use roles to select elements. So we are going to go with the recommendation. We're going to use the get by role technique. All right, let me show you how to do this. So first off, back inside of user form JS, I'm going to find our first label input. I'm going to make sure that label has an HTML4 of email for the email, and the input has an ID of email. I'm then going to repeat that same process for the other label input pair. So for the label, I'll give it an HTML4 of name, and the input I'll give an ID of name. Then back inside of our test file, we now have a much better and slightly more specific way of finding the appropriate text inputs. So we can now remove this query function right here and replace it with name input is screen get by role text box and we'll put in a name with a regular expression and the label for the name input was just name so name like so we're going to put in an i on the regular expression which is going to make the regular expression not worry about lowercase or uppercase characters we'll then also find the email input. So screen, get by role, 
text box. This one is going to be enter email. We could also just put in email by itself, and that will match against just the email part of that string. Okay, let's save this now. And if we flip back over to our test run inside the terminal, it looks like the test is passing. So the very nice thing about this approach here is that now our test is a little bit more flexible. We can add in additional labels and inputs, and it's not going to cause our test to break. We can also reorder our inputs. We can change the order. We can put the email first and the name input second, and the test is not going to break. So what we're really testing here is exactly what the test says. We're making sure that we can type in some text and the form is going to call the appropriate callback whenever it is submitted, because that's what we really want our test to do. And we don't really care so much about whether or not the inputs are in the correct order. All right, so this is a good improvement. And I would say that this test is now in a pretty good spot. So we started off with not so great a test and made a couple of changes to refactor it into a much better and flexible test. We have added in some pretty good tests around the user form component. So we're now going to move forward and take a look at testing the user list component. Remember, the user list is going to receive a list of users or an array of users as a prop. So this should be an array that has objects, and every object should have a name and an email. The user list is then going to render out a table. And the table should have two columns inside of it, along with one row or one TR element, really, for every user that was passed in. So let's think about what is critical or what is important around this component and decide on what we want to test. Well, I'm going to make a couple of arguments here. I'm going to say perhaps we should try to make sure that the table shows one line for each user. We also want, might want to verify that it shows the correct name and email for each user as well. Now, this is a very simple component. It's a simple table. Do we really need to add in a bunch of tests? Well, it really comes up to you and the project you are working on. Some engineering organizations are going to say we want to test every component. Others are going to say we really only want to test the most critical and most complicated components inside of a project. So we're going to take a look at testing everything, but it's really up to your engineering organization, the job you're working at to decide what is an appropriate test. Okay, so let's get to it. To test the user list component, we first need to create a new test file inside of our project. Inside the SRC directory, I'm going to make a new file of user list test.js. At the very top, I'm going to add in an import statement for render and screen from at testing library slash react. I will also add in an import for the user list component, which is inside of the same directory, so it's just a dot slash. In the last test file, we also had an import for user from that react testing user event library. We only need to import the user whenever we need to simulate input or really kind of any input. So maybe typing on the keyboard or clicking. The user list component doesn't have any event handlers. There's nothing related to user input that we really need to test. So in this case, we do not need to import that user thing. All right, once I've got this put together, I'm going to save the file. I'm going to immediately go over to my terminal. Back at our terminal, we still have Jest configured to run tests only inside of the user form component. Let's change that really quickly. So to run tests inside of this new user list test file, I'm going to again press W, then P, and then I'm going to search for user list. And I should see user list test JS appear right there. I'll hit enter. And now I am only running tests inside of this new file. The file right now is failing because it doesn't have any tests inside of it, but of course we're going to fix that up very quickly. All right, back over inside of our editor, inside of our new test file, I'm going to write out our two tests. So we want to have one test that is going to make sure that we render the correct number of rows. Maybe a better description here would be something like render one row per user. It's a little bit more descriptive. And I also want to eventually have a test where we render the email and name of each user. And we're going to take care of just the first test right now. So I stubbed this one out. I threw in some initial test, but we're not going to worry about it just yet. So both these tests are going to be very similar. We're going to once again render the component. We're going to somehow find all the rows in the table and we'll write out an assertion. We're going to make sure that we have the correct number of rows in the table. 
specifically one row for each user. To get started rendering the component, we can call render and put in user list. Remember, whenever we render the user list, it expects to receive a list of users or an array of users as users prop. So I'm gonna make a fake list of users right above. I'll say const users is in an array and I'm going to put in two objects. One will have a name of Jane, an email of Jane at Jane.com. And I'll put in another one with maybe Sam and an email of Sam at Sam.com. I'm then going to use this as the user's prop and pass it down into my component. All right, so next we need to take a look at the rendered output of our component and attempt to find all the rows in the table. Remember that whenever we are trying to find elements that have been rendered by our component, we're going to use that query system that is provided by React Testing Library. We can use functions like get by role or get by all roles and so on. Now, in this case, I don't really know exactly off the top of my head what the most appropriate query function would be. Should I use get by role? Should I use get by all roles? Is there some other query function that would be more appropriate? Well, let's take a pause right here before this video gets too long. When we come back in just a moment, I'm going to show you a fantastic tool that we can use to very easily get an idea of how to best select elements that have been rendered by our component. We are rendering our component, but now we need to figure out how we can find the number of rows that have been rendered. Now, in this case, you might not know off the top of your head how to write out a query function. And remember, query functions allow us to find elements that have been rendered by our component. So you might just not know off the top of your head how to write out a query function to find all these different rows. Fortunately, there's a really nice tool we can use, a nice little trick to help us understand how to find particular elements. Okay. So again, memorizing all the query functions, all these roles, it's challenging. So if you ever need a little help, we're going to go into our test and inside of one of our tests, we're going to add in a little line of code. It is screen log testing playground URL. Notice URL is capitalized, all three letters. Whenever you run this function, your test is going to take all the HTML that is currently rendered by the component, and it's going to generate a link that includes that HTML. And it's going to send you off to a online tool called testing playground. And the only way to really understand what's going on here is to play with this ourselves a little bit. So let me show you how this actually works. Back over inside my test right here, I need to write out a query to somehow find the number of rows. I don't really know how to do that. So to fix this, I'm going to add in screen dot log testing playground URL. When I write that out, you'll notice I get a red underline. And if I hover over it, it says unexpected debug statement. So this is not an error message that is popping up. It is a little bit more of a warning. It is saying, hey, just so you know, you've got a line of code in here that is going to try to console log some stuff while you're running your tests. It's really just a warning to say, don't forget, you've got this extra little bit in here. So again, not an error, totally fine. I'm going to save this. I'll then go back over to my terminal. And where my tests are running, I'll now see that I get a console log of a pretty long URL. The URL is going to go to testingplayground.com. You'll notice that there's a long kind of sequence of characters. That is all of the HTML that your component produced in an encoded format. So this link right here includes all the HTML produced by our component. Okay, I'm going to take this link right here. I'm going to change over to my browser. And I'm going to navigate to that link. And I'll see a page like this up here. So this is testing playground. And again, it is all about helping you write out these query functions correctly. Once you come to this page, you'll notice on the top left hand side is a little code editor. And this is our HTML that was produced by our component. So it has been automatically loaded up into this little editor right here. And we can see a preview of it on the right hand side. Now on the right hand side, we can click on different elements manually. And whenever we click on one, we will be given a recommendation on how we can write out a query function to find that particular element. So for example, if I click on Jane, I will be given a recommendation right here. I will be told that I can find that element by writing out a query function that looks like this right here. So as you guess, this is really fantastic for understanding how to use these query functions and roles in particular. 
Now, this tool is not perfect, having said that. First, I want you to notice that on the left-hand side, there's a little bit of code on the bottom left here. It looks like a query selector. And then on the right-hand side, we've got a lot more information. So what's going on here? What's with the two panels? Well, the stuff on the left-hand side is how to write out a plain query selector to find the element you just clicked on. And it's guaranteed to work. It's probably going to work like 100% of the time. On the right-hand side, this suggested query, what it's really saying is, hey, it'd be nice if you used this role selector instead. It might not always be possible because maybe you don't know the exact name that's going to appear in there, but if possible, try to use a query like this one right here. In other cases, this blue box will show up as green and will say, hey, we really recommend you use this particular query. At the end of the day, we're usually going to take a look at this box right here, and if it gives us a recommendation, we are going to try to use it. This tool has one other downside. Right now, you and I are really trying to find these TR elements. We're trying to find the rows. We care about the rows. That's all we care about. So if I tried to click on one of these rows, well, no matter how much I kind of move my cursor around, I can't quite seem to highlight the entire row. It just seems like I can't click on the row itself. And so it's kind of hard for me to get a recommendation on how to select just the TR element. If you are ever in that scenario, we can use a little bit of a trick. We can add in some custom styling to the HTML right here directly, just to add in some additional padding, essentially, to make elements easier to click. So for example, I'm going to find this TR right here. I want to try to select it. I want to get a suggested selector, but I can't click on the TR. So as a workaround, I can go to the TR, add in a style attribute with maybe a border 10 pix solid red and a display of block. So now that TR element has a huge red border around it, and I can very easily select the row. And so I can select it, click it, and I'll be given a suggested query right here. Hey, if I do a get by row role with row, I'll be given that element. So you sometimes are going to have to use this little styling workaround again, just to make sure elements are actually clickable. All right, so that's testing playground. So we can use this tool to get recommendations on how to select different elements. The takeaway is that I think in our case, we are trying to find these rows. It looks like we can use a role of row. If we use a role of row, that should, in theory, give us all these different TR elements. So let's try that out back inside of our test really quickly. Back over inside my editor. Here we go. I'm going to delete that statement right there, because again, we really just run it one time to get that link presented for us. I'm then going to try to find all of my rows with something like screen get all by role row. So remember, get all is going to be used whenever you want to find more than one element. We are going to have probably two rows here because we have two users. So I'm using get all because I want to find two separate rows. Once we have found those rows, we can then write out an assertion around it. So I'm going to put in down here, expect rows to have length two. And as you guess, this matcher is going to receive an array and just make sure that there are two elements inside of it. Okay, so this looks good, right? This looks pretty reasonable. It looks like this test would work. Well, unfortunately, it's not. But let's save it, and then we'll do a little bit of debugging and figure out what is going on here. So I'm going to save the file back over to my terminal. And sure enough, we end up getting an error. If we scroll up a little bit, we expected to find two. So we wanted to find two, but we were actually finding three rows. So why is that? What is going on here? Well, you'll notice that right here, received array is printing out what we actually found when we ran that query function. And we are getting a pretty unexpected result. It appears that we found three rows. One row is actually the header. We found the header. So there's the header, the TR with a TH of name and email. And then we found the first user and the second user. So that's a little bit unexpected. We found more rows than we expected we ended up selecting the header row. Now, this is going to end up being a little bit of a challenge. So let's take a pause right here, come back in just a moment. I want to make sure it's super clear what's going on here, why we are running into this problem. And then we're going to take a look at a couple of ways to deal with it. We just spent a whole bunch of time writing out a query, 
to find the number of rows inside of our table. And again, we didn't quite get it right. We expected to find two, but we actually got three. So the first thing I want to do is make sure it's super clear why we are getting that answer. Okay, so in this diagram on the right hand side, I've got the HTML that is being produced by our component. This is our table. On the left hand side, I've got so many different elements that exist inside of our table, and they're implicit or automatically assigned ARIA role. So T head elements have a role of row group. T body have a ro role of row group. TR has a role of row. So when we ask React Testing Library to go and find all the elements that have a role of row, we are going to find this one right here, which is good. That one right there, which is good. But then we are also are going to get the TR element up inside of the header. That's where the three is coming from. That's why we are seeing three rows come back. We got one, two, and three. So we're going to kind of cut to the chase here. Clearly, trying to select these elements using this role system, it's probably not going to work the way we expect. It's probably not going to be quite as easy as we expect to find all these elements based upon only ARIA roles. You might think that we could do a workaround. You might say, all right, Stephen, we can't do this based upon only the role role of row, it's a tongue twister, maybe a workaround could be to find the T body element. So this one right here, and then find all the rows that exist inside that. Well, unfortunately, T body and T head elements have an identical role as well. So if we try to find all the elements that have a role of row group, we're going to find this one right here and this one right here. And then if we go and try to find the number of rows in each of them, well, again, we're going to just go ahead and find the same exact collection of elements. So once again, clearly this role approach is not really going to work out for us. So here's the workaround and a couple of notes around this entire situation. So at some points in time, as you're writing tests, you're going to find that trying to find elements by role, it just doesn't work. And I've got a big recommendation for you, a big tip. I really recommend you do not sit around for any more than three or four minutes trying to figure out how to select an element based upon its role, because you can spend a lot of time on it and there just might not be a good solution. So there are two workarounds here, two kind of escape hatches that we can use to find elements when this role approach doesn't work the way we expect. And we're going to take a look at both these escape hatches in this video and the next one. So first, fallback number one. Fallback number one is to find elements by using an attribute called a data test ID. Understanding what this data test ID thing is all about is really easy if we just look at the code rather than diagrams or anything like that. So let me just show you how we would find the number of rows by using data test ID. All right, back over inside my editor, I'm going to first begin by finding our user list component. Here it is right here. Inside of our user list component, we are returning some JSX at the bottom. I'm going to find the T body element right here, and I'm going to give it a prop of data dash test ID equals users. Notice that the ID on here not capitalized. It's lowercase data test ID. I'm then going to save the component. I'm going to go back over to our test. At the very top of the file, I'm going to find our import statement from testing library React. And I'm going to import a third function called within. So notice the import right there. Next up, I'm going to update our query function right here. I'm going to say const rows is within screen dot get by test ID users. And then on the outside of the within function, I'm going to chain on a get all by role of row. Now, before talking about what this does, let's just save this, go back over to our terminal and make sure the test is passing and sure enough it is. Okay. So what do we do there? Well, first inside of our component, we assigned a very special prop, a prop of data test ID. And I assigned to that an arbitrary string, a string that doesn't really have any meaning. This could be users. It could be that it can be my users, it can be anything I want. Only requirement is it has to be a string. By assigning this prop right here, we are given the ability to select or find this particular element. So we can now inside of our test, write out some code that's going to find this T body element. 
then as you probably guessed from that point on inside of our test, we first used a query function right here to find the T body element. We found it based upon the test ID that was assigned to it. So I found specifically users. So that has to match the string that we assigned right there. Once we found that T body element, I said, look inside of that T body element by using this within function and inside of the T body, find all the elements that have a role of row. So now we are getting only these two TRs right here. There's two of them. And so now our test is passing because we are not going to find the TR element up there inside the T head. So that is workaround number one. We can use this data test ID property to get kind of a pointer or a little handle on one very particular element. Personally, I think this is not that great. I am not a fan of this very much because we are adding into our code base here, we are modifying our component solely for the purposes of testing it. And usually just my experience has been modifying your component in order to make it more testable or just kind of give it a testing apparatus or a handle into the testing world. Usually not the best idea, usually just not that good. That's my experience. Other engineers disagree with me entirely. Other engineers say, oh yeah, this is totally fine, completely appropriate and acceptable approach. So not everyone agrees with me. If you agree, fantastic. If you don't, totally fine. I am only here to show you how to use this library. And this is one possible way to find an element that is otherwise kind of hard to get a handle on. Okay, so that's approach number one. Quick pause right here. And we'll take a look at one other possible fallback in just a moment. Let's take a look at one other possible way of solving this problem. So this will be used in the case where maybe assigning a test ID is not very easy, or maybe you just don't like the idea of adding in this test ID thing to your components solely for the purposes of testing. Okay, so let's give it a shot back inside my editor. I'm going to begin by finding that render statement right here. And when we call render, we're going to get back an object that has a couple of helper properties on it. One that we're going to use in this case is called container. So I'm going to destructure off this container thing. Container is a reference to a HTML element that is automatically added into our component. Let me help you understand what it's all about. Okay, so back inside of testing playground right here, you might have noticed this is a very, very small detail, very subtle, but you might have noticed that our component that we are currently testing produces a table as its top level element. So our users list, the top or outermost JSX element it returns is a table. Whenever React Testing Library takes our component and renders it, it's going to add in an additional div element outside or wrapping our component. This div right here, this is referred to as the container. Again, it is automatically added in. The container is that property that we just destructured off. So container right here is a reference to that HTML div element that is automatically added in whenever we render our component. So this is an HTML element and has all the HTML or all the methods that a typical HTML element would have. One of them is query selector, the qu same query selector function you might have used many times on your own in the browser or any JavaScript project. So let's say that we want to find the table element. If we want, want to find the table element and we don't want to use roles or test IDs or anything like that, we could just say const table is container dot query selector table. So go and find some element within the container that is a table. You'll notice that as soon as we write this out, we get a red squiggly right here. The red squiggly is not indicating an error. This is not an error right here. It's a little bit misleading in my opinion. It is trying to tell you not to do it, but it is absolutely fine. So it's really more of a warning. It's saying, hey, if you can avoid it, try not to access the container element. Try to use things like get by role instead. But we have just seen that making use of roles in our particular case here is not super easy. So this warning, totally fine, we can ignore it. The other warnings we see here are pretty much talking about the exact same thing. Try to avoid directly accessing HTML elements. Instead, try to use those query functions instead. So now just to make sure this works as expected, I'll put in a console log of table. I'm gonna save this. I'm gonna flip back over to my terminal. And there we go. There's a console log of the table element that we just found. 
Okay. So now to use this to kind of solve our particular case where we want to find the number of rows, I'm going to replace that line with const rows is container query selector all. We are using all because we want to find multiple elements. Query selector is used when we want to find just one. So the query selector all, I want to find all the different tr elements that are inside of the t body. So that would be the selector we would write out in this case. And again, this is a classic CSS selector here. So that should give us back an array with all the different row elements that exist inside the t body. And so now we can uncomment our assertion because we should have two rows. I'm going to save this again, flip back over, and there we go. Our test is passing. The last thing we might want to do is disable this little warning right here, because again, it is a warning, even though it's a red underline, it's saying, if possible, try not to do this. Try to use something like get by role instead. So in this case, because we have found that, well, this maybe is just the best way to select these elements, I would want to disable this error so other engineers don't think that this is something that needs to be fixed. I can disable the error by putting a comment right above that says eslint dash disable dash next dash line. That comment is going to tell eslint to just not worry about checking the next line. We know what we are doing, just ignore the issue. And that's it. Okay, so that's the two ways where we can kind of get a fallback or a workaround when these role selectors aren't really working the way we expect. And I just want to repeat one more time, please don't spend hours trying to figure out how to use roles correctly in every single case. Maybe spend, when you're first getting used to testing, a couple of minutes to find the right one. But at some point in time, just fall back to using a test ID or a plain query selector. You really don't want to spend a ton of time writing out your tests because the goal is to save time. That's why we write tests in the first place. We do it so we can save time. And if you're spending hours putting them together, well, maybe you are not really saving much time. Now, because the data test ID fallback is a little bit more preferred, I'm going to undo the changes here. So I'm going to do a whole big undo. Or you know what, I'll just rewrite it really quickly. So I'm going to do a remove the container. Don't need that anymore. And I'll say within screen, what was it? Get by test ID users, get all by role row. So I'm going to go with the get by test ID approach, just because once again, it's a little bit more preferable. Looks like my tests are still passing. Very good. Okay, so that's it. We've got our first test here done. We've learned a lot along the way. One more test and we'll be done with this user stuff. Let's work on the second test we have here. So rendering the name and the email of each user. This test is going to generally look very similar to what we did above. We're going to create an array of fake users, render our component, passing those users in. We're then going to take a look at the HTML that was produced. And in this test, we want to make sure that the name and the email of each of these different people is visible somewhere within the table. So let's give this a shot. The first step inside of the new test, we need to render the component with some fake list of users. So to save time, I'm going to copy the little bit of setup code that we have up here. So I'm going to copy that, go down to our second test, and paste it in. Next, we need to write out some selector or some query function and try to find all the elements that are going to have the name the email of Jane, and the name and the email of Sam. Once again, just like above, I might not know how to do this off the top of my head. So to get a little bit of help, we can use that playground testing tool once again. So just as a reminder, we can write out screen log testing playground URL. And remember, URL is all capitalized. I'm going to save this back over to my terminal. There's my link. So I'm going to copy it over to my browser, navigate to the link, and there we go. So now we can click on some of the elements in here and get a better idea of how we can select these different things and find to make sure that we are showing the correct name and email for each of our users. So I can click on Jane, for example, and I'll be told that to find a cell or kind of an individual part of a table, I can use get by role cell. Get by role cell is gonna find TD elements within a table. If I just try to find all the different elements with a role of cell, I'm going to get many different cell elements returned to me. 
so I can be a little bit more specific by putting on a query. If I put on a little filter there as a second argument, where it's an object with a key of name, this is going to be used to take a look at the text content of each of these different elements. It's going to be a little bit more specific and try to find only the cells that contain the word Jane. Okay, so with that in mind, let's go back over to our test and try to put an implementation together. Back over here, I'm going to delete the debug statement. I'm then going to write out a for loop. I'm going to iterate through all of our different users, one at a time. And for each of our different users, I'm going to take a look at our rendered HTML and make sure that the user's name and email is present within a cell inside the table. So here's what it's going to look like. I'll say for let user of users screen, or first let's do name is screen, get by role. I want to find a cell that has some text content, and we can specify that by putting in a name here of user.name. I'll then find the email element with a get by role cell with the name of user.email. Then to make sure that we successfully found these elements, we can set up two separate expectations. We can say expect name dot to be in the document and expect email to be in the document. So find the name and the email of the first user, make sure that those are visible on the screen, and then repeat the same process for Sam as well. Let's save our test over to our terminal, and it looks like we passed. Very good. Okay, so in this test, we have really focused on the usage of the React testing library playground tool. Again, really fantastic for figuring out what the different roles you might want to use for all these different elements because memorizing them can be a little bit challenging. Our test is all done, but there's one last thing I want to do inside of this user list test file. You'll notice that inside of both of our tests, we have some identical setup. So in both of them, we declare the list of users and then render our component. Down here, same exact thing, create the list of users, render the component. So we just have a little bit of duplication between our two tests right now. I want to clean this up. I want to extract this setup logic into a helper function. So we're not just duplicating a ton of code throughout our test file. To do so, at the very top of the file, I'm going to define a new function called render component. I'm then going to cut the users and the render call. I'm going to paste it. And then our second test, it needs to know the list of users to work correctly. Remember, the second test is going to take a look at the name and email of each of these people. So we need to make sure that we return the list of users so the second test can use it just to run normally. So down here, I'm going to return an object that contains the list of users. So now we can use this function to do some common setup between our two different tests. On the first test, I will call render component. And then on the second test, I can delete all these duplicate code, call render component. And then I'm going to destructure out the list of users from the object that we are returning. Okay, let's save this. Once again, back over to the terminal, just make sure everything is working. Yep, definitely is. All right, this looks good. Now, one thing I want to touch on very quickly, you might be familiar with other testing frameworks or other testing setups where you make use of before each functions. So if you're not familiar with it, totally fine. I'll explain what I'm talking about really quickly. In many testing frameworks, it's very common to use a before each function. This is a function that is built in as a global variable when you are using Jest. When every A before each function is found, Jest is going to run this arrow function right here before running each individual test. So traditionally, that makes this before each function a great place to do some initial setup. However, the React testing library, if you try to render something in there, they're going to put a big error in. And this is not strictly an error, it's really a recommendation. React testing library highly recommends that you not attempt to render your component inside of a before each function. This is technically totally fine. You absolutely can do this. It's just a recommendation by React Testing Library. So if you try to do it, 
yeah, they're going to kind of yell at you and say, don't do that. Take this approach instead. So they recommend defining functions like render component, and then just calling that at the top of every one of your tests, as opposed to using a before each. So just so you know, throughout the course, we are not going to use before each functions just because they are slightly discouraged by React testing library. Okay, so that's it. I think our testing file is looking good here. Our tests are passing. We don't really have any duplicated code. So I think this is great. All right, my friends, one last component to test. It's going to be our app component. So as a reminder, if we open up our app.js file, this is the central coordination point between our user form and the user list. Testing this component is going to be very, very similar to the other two we have already put together. So we're going to render the app component. We might then try to fill out the form that is displayed by user form and then submit the form and just make sure that we get a new user displayed by the user list component. So it's really kind of taking the entire application and testing it all put together. To test this component, we're going to open up the existing app test.js file. Remember, this was created for us when we first generated our project. There's already a test inside of here, but it's a test around some link being present on the screen. We don't really need this test at all, so I'm going to delete it. I'm then going to replace it with a new test, and we'll say it can receive a new user and show it on a list. Then inside the test, we will render our app component. And then we're going to use techniques very similar to what we have seen on the previous tests. So we need to find our two inputs, the one to enter a name and an email. We need to click on them. We need to type in them. We need to click the button to submit the form. Then we need to write out some code to make sure we can find this new email and new name in the table. So to get started, I'm going to add in an import for user from at testing library slash user event. I'm then going to find the name input. And remember, we can do that with a screen dot. Let's go back over to our actual test here around the form just as a quick reminder. So back inside of user form test.js. Here we go right here. Here's our reminder. So we can do a get by role text box and then look for a name of name. Something similar for the email as well. Remember, this name is going to look at the text inside of the label associated with our input. So we can do back inside of our app test file, get by role, text box, name of name. And the I is for case insensitivity. So remember, that means we're going to ignore capital versus lowercase letters. I will also find the email input. We're then going to simulate a click on each of these and then a little bit of typing. So I will do a user click name input. We will keyboard, press a couple of keys here. So I'll put in maybe Jane for the name. I'll then click on the email input, type in Jane's email. And then finally, we need to find the button and click the button. Let's group together all of our kind of element query code. So back up here, I'll put in another query for the button. And remember, we can find a button with the get by role button. After filling out the form, we need to click on the button. So that'll be a user dot click on the button. And that should be enough to hopefully get the user visible on the screen. Now, just to make sure that things are working the way we expect, let's add in right here a nice little debug statement. It is screen.debug. This is another function that is built onto the screen object. Once again, when we add this in, you'll notice our editor is complaining about this. This is for the same reason we saw around that log testing playground URL. It is not an error. It is a warning. It's just saying, hey, just so you know, you have a little bit of a debug only console log here. Usually we don't want these hanging around. That's why it's showing up. It's just letting us know, don't forget about this. You might want to clean it up when you're done with it. Whenever we run our test now by saving the file, we can go over to our terminal. I'm still running only the test file of user list. To make sure I run the app test file, I'm going to press W, then P, then app. And there's my app test.js file. 
And when I run that test file, if I scroll up now, here's the result of the screen.debug. It's going to take all the current rendered output from our component and print it out on the screen. So we can use this to very easily see what the current state or what the visible state really is of our component. If I scroll down a little bit, I will see that inside the table, I am in fact correctly showing Jane and Jane at Jane.com. So that means that I am correctly submitting the name and the email right now inside the form and the table is being updated. So this is just telling me that I am going down the right path when writing my test. It's just giving me a little bit of immediate feedback. So because I know that all of this code right here is working correctly, I can remove the screen.debug statement and I can add in some code to just go into the table and make sure that I am in fact finding Jane and Jane's email. So I can do that. Let's try selecting Jane's name. We can do so by using that same approach we saw back inside of our user list test file just a moment ago. We can do a screen get by role cell with a name of Jane and an email of screen get by role cell with the name of Jane at Jane.com. And once again, remember the name that we're talking about here. One is the name of a user. When you see this name property here, we're not talking about the name of a user. This is just the name of the text that we're going to try to find in a cell. So name Jane right here means go find a cell element, find one that has text content of Jane. Once we find these two elements, we can do what we did in our previous test. We can just make sure that they exist in the document, that they are present. So we can do an expect name to be in the document. And same for email. There we go. All right, let's save this. Once again, back over to our terminal. Test is passing. Very good. We have tested our entire application, but there's one last thing I would like to do here. You might recall that if I ever enter in a name and an email and submit the form, we still have some stuff selected inside these inputs. Traditionally, whenever we submit a form, we really want to en empty out the inputs. And so I would like to add that in. But as a little catch here, I want to try adding in a test first. So we're going to add in a test first to make sure that this behavior works. The test is, of course, going to fail initially. We're then going to come back, add in some code to implement the feature, and hopefully the test will then be working. So let's give this a shot. First, which file do we probably want to add this new test to? Well, this new behavior we are talking about is all about the form, and it really has nothing to do with the overall app, has nothing to do with the list of users. So I think that we should open up our user form test file and add in a new test. Back inside my editor, I will find user form test.js. I'll then go down to the bottom and I'm going to add in my new test. So I'll say it empties the two inputs when form is submitted. Once again, the initial setup is going to be pretty straightforward. I'm going to render the user form component. And remember, whenever we render the user form, and attempt to submit the form itself, this component is going to attempt to call a prop called onUserAd. So we need to provide some callback here. We need to give it some prop, some function to run whenever the form is submitted. But in this case, you and I, we don't care about doing anything with the submitted value. We also don't really care that the callback actually gets called. Remember back up here right above, we put together this entire test just to make sure that we call on user ad. And we went through that entire process, creating a mock function and whatnot. But that was because we really cared about making sure the callback function got called. In this case, we don't care at all. So we could put in a mock here. We could create another mock function and pass it in, but we're not really going to do anything with it. So maybe another way we could handle this is to just put in an empty arrow function. So now user form has a callback to call whenever the form is submitted. Whenever it gets called, well, nothing's going to happen, but in the context of this particular test, that is totally fine. We don't care about on user ad getting called at all. Nonetheless, we still want to be able to submit the form without it crashing. Okay, so that looks good. Now, once we've got the form 
rendered, invisible, we still want to fill out a name and an email and then attempt to submit the form. So I'm going to do pretty much exactly what we just did in the last test. I'm going to find the name input with a screen, get by role, text box, name of oh, regular expression name. There we go. Get by role text box, name of email. We'll then click the name input, type, click the email input, type, find the button, click the button. So same thing we just did a moment ago. So we'll do a user.click, user.keyboard, click email input, type in the email input. We then need to find the button. Again, I'll put the button finding code right here. Find an element with the role of button. We will click the button. And now right here, it is time for us to take a look at the name input and the email input. And we want to make sure that they have no value whatsoever. A matcher we can use for this is expect name input to have value. So I bet you can guess what this matcher does. It's going to take a look at a text input and make sure that it has a currently assigned value of whatever you put right there. The goal of our test is to make sure that the inputs end up with no value whatsoever. So go back to the default of empty string. We can then repeat that same assertion for the email input as well. There we go. Okay, that's it for this test. So I'm now going to save this. I'm going to go back over to my terminal. I'm going to make sure I'm running this test file. And right now I'm going to expect this test to fail because we currently have not implemented this feature inside of our component. So I'm going to go back over to the terminal, press W, press P, search for user form, hit enter. And there we go. Our test is failing. So it looks like we got all the way down to the assertion. And at the assertion, we expected the element to have no value. So empty string, but it still has a string of Jane. That is what we had typed into it in our test just a moment previously. So that's it. The test is failing, which in this case is good. So now we can go back over to the form in just a moment and start adding in the implementation for this feature. Let's go over to our user form component. Once again, as you guess, yeah, we're going to implement this feature. It's really easy, so it shouldn't take too long. Inside of user form.js, I'm going to scroll up and find the handle submit function right here. So right after we call on user add, we want to reset the two inputs. We want to set the email and the name piece of state back to both being empty strings. So right after calling on user add, I'm going to call set email with an empty string and set name with an empty string. I'll then save this. And rather than testing this out manually inside the browser, I'm going to go and look at my test instead running inside the terminal. And sure enough, it says that my test is now passing. So in theory, I don't really have to go and test this inside the browser. I already know my component is working as expected. Nonetheless, I'm going to go test it anyways, just to make sure everything is totally fine. So inside the browser, I'm going to refresh the page, enter in a name, enter in an email, click on add user. Yep. Sure enough, they get emptied out. Perfect. All right. That is it for this application. We've put together a very simple app three different components, and we've added some tests around each one. The most important things that I want to walk away from this application with is just a basic understanding of what we're doing when we are writing out a test. So we call a test function, put in some description. We're going to render our component, go through some amount of setup, which is almost always going to involve trying to find an element that was rendered by our component. To find elements that were rendered by our component, we're going to use those query functions. They have names like get by role, get all by role, and so on. There are many different query functions available to us. Memorizing them all is a little bit challenging, but over time, we're going to see that they all follow the same naming structure. So you're going to eventually be able to use these different query functions without memorizing them, just because you know what the word get implies and what the word role implies.
We also learned about how different HTML elements sometimes have an implicit or automatically assigned ARIA role. Whenever we are using React Testing Library, we really like to select elements by using this role approach. And the reason for that is that it just makes our tests a little bit more flexible. We can go back and change or move around different elements without breaking the underlying test, which is sometimes desirable. Last thing we learned about was expectations. So down here, we put down an expectation, also referred to as an assertion. The entire line is an assertion or expectation. And the second part right here, we refer to that as the matcher. There are many different matchers available to us. Some of them are in the default Jest testing library. Others are implemented in testing library. Dom, Jest DOM is the name of it. There's so many library names here, it's ridiculous. Okay, so that's it for this first application. Now this is just kind of getting our feet wet, just kind of, you know, getting in, getting a sense of what's going on. The next app we work on is going to be far more complex. And that's where we're going to start to really dive into some much more complex aspects of testing. We've gotten through our first little project and we've seen some aspects of React testing library. And right away, I think you can start to tell that there are a lot of very small details that you need to understand. So there are, for example, many different query functions. There are many different matchers. Trying to build a single app or even multiple apps to take a look at all these different query functions and all these different matchers, well, that would just take a really long time. And in this course, we just plain don't have a lot of time. So here's what we're going to do. I made a little command line tool for us specifically for this course. It is called RTL Book. So it's a tool we're going to run at our terminal. This is going to give us an interactive little cheat sheet environment, just a place where we can write out very small components we can test them and we can write some notes and comments along the way. The entire goal of this is so that you can have a cheat sheet that you can use in the future whenever you need to refer back and understand what these different query functions do and some of these different matchers that are really very useful, but take just a little bit of time to remember. So in this video, I wanna show you how you can run this RTL book tool and just give you a very quick overview on it. All right, so first, to run the tool, we're going to go over to our terminal and execute npx rtl-book serve and then the name of a JavaScript file. Now, the JavaScript file does not need to be an existing file in a project or anything like that. The name of the file that you're going to put on the end here is going to be where you want to save these notes. So it's kind of like a notebook of sorts. Once you run this command, a web server will be started up on your machine and you'll be given a link to navigate to in your browser. Once you go to this page, you're going to see, well, just a simple kind of notebook experience. So let's try this out really quickly. Over at my terminal, I'm back in a workspace directory. So this can be really anywhere on your computer. And I'm going to run npx rtl-book serve and then roles notes.js. Once I run this command, I'll be given a little message here. It says that a file has been created and opened called roles notes. And I'm being told to navigate to localhost port 4005. So I'm going to do that right away. Over in my browser, I'll go to localhost 4005, and here we go. All right, so now that we have this tool open, quick pause, we'll come back and I'll give you a quick overview on how this tool works. I've got RTL book open, and I'm at localhost 4005. Now, the first thing I want to tell you is that if you ever need to close down this tool, so let's say I want to close it, I'll hit control C. And if I want to open up the same exact notebook that I just made, I can run the same exact command and put the name of the file or the notebook that I had created right here. So to open up that exact same file, I can run the same command and then back over to the browser and yep, same content here. And when you first come to this page, you'll notice a little bit of default content on the screen. Everything you see here is editable. So each of these big boxes right here, here's one big box at the top, another one down here that has some code inside of it. I can click on this text one and edit the text inside of it. So if you want to, you can take notes as we are going through these videos. The text in here is using a markdown syntax. So if you are familiar with markdown, you can use that to format the text. As you can notice, you can also put in some amount of code. Whenever you write out some code, you will also be given a preview window over here on the right hand side. If you ever need to add in additional cells to contain some code or some text, you can hover on this little toolbar between these two cells. So for example, if I want to add in some additional code cell, I'll click on that button and there we go. I can now add in some code right here. Now, some other technical details on this environment, just very, very quickly. 
the different code cells kind of cascade in execution. So you can imagine that all these different cells are kind of smashed together and then progressively executed one by one. So that essentially just means that in this upper code cell, I can define a variable like say my component, and then I can refer to that on later cells down inside of the same document. But if I define a variable down here in the second one, I cannot really refer to it up here in the first one. So it's kind of cascading downwards. Another thing to understand here is that in a real test environment, usually we only make use of that render function that we import from React testing library up here. We usually only run that inside of a test. But in this notebook environment, we can use the render function either inside of a test or outside of it in order to see a preview of our component on the preview window over here. So just one very small difference between a normal test environment and the one we are running. Other than that, they are pretty darn similar. We're still going to have import statements, components, JSX. We can write out tests. We can make assertions, run query functions, all that kind of good stuff. All right, last quick note here, and then we will jump into our first topic. So you can insert te text cells and add in some notes. As you're going through the next couple of videos and creating a couple of different notebooks, I don't really want you to panic and have to type out a bunch of notes as we are going and try to keep up with what I'm saying and taking notes at the same time. So just so you know, after we finish each of these different notebooks, I'm going to attach a completed version to a lecture. And these completed notebooks I put up, they will have a lot of comments that I add in myself. So you do not have to add the comments in or documentation or stuff like that. I will give you kind of a final version of the notebook that you can take away and refer back to in the future very easily. Now that we understand this environment a little bit more, time to use it to learn more about React Testing Library. So to get started, I'm going to first delete all the cells I have inside of here. I'm going to start off completely from scratch. I'm going to add in a new code cell at the top. Now, our first notebook here is going to be all about roles. So we have discussed roles a little bit. I've told you that a lot of HTML elements have implicit or automatically assigned roles. I want you to see a somewhat complete list. It's not going to be really truly a complete list, but I'm going to show you some of the roles that you're going to need most often as you are testing components. So we are going to create a very small component in this first code cell right here. It's going to have a ton of different elements inside of it. They're all going to have implicitly assigned roles. We're then going to write out a test in a second code cell, and we're going to try to select a lot of these different elements using the role system. So again, just trying to give you a better idea of what these roles are all about and when you are going to be using them. So first, let's add in a couple of imports at the very top. We'll then create a very small test component. So I will begin with a import render screen from testing library React. There we go. I'll then make a new component called role example. Inside of here, I'm going to return a div element. And then inside the div, we're going to add in a total of about 10 or 12 elements. So many different elements. And again, the goal here is to just give you a demonstration of how we can select these very common elements using roles. So a little bit of typing here, really a good amount of typing. I'm going to first put in an anchor element. I'm going to give it an href of just forward slash, and then I'll give it text of link. I'll put in a button element that has text of button. I'll put in a footer element that has text of content info, an h1 with text of heading, header with text of banner, an image element with an alt attribute of description. And right after the image element, I'm going to put in just some plain text of image, or IMG for short. I'm then going to put in a couple of different input elements. So we will do an input of type checkbox. And then after that, I'll put in text of checkbox, an input with type of number, I know there's a lot here, but we are almost done. So spin button, text on that one. Input with a type of radio. And text of radio. And then just two more. Input with type of text. And right after that, I'll put down some plain text of text box. 
And then very last one, let's do an li with list item. And how about a ul with text of list group. Okay, so a lot of elements here, a lot of very commonly used elements you're going to see in a lot of different applications. After writing out all these different elements, after the component at the very bottom of this little text cell, I'm going to call render and put in my role example component as a JSX element. So role example, like so. And then on the right hand side, we should see a lot of gibberish looking stuff. So that's the result of all these different elements that we have rendered. Okay, so like I said, we've now added in a lot of very commonly used elements. So now we're going to take a quick pause, come back, we're going to write out a test, and we're going to see how we can use the role system to select each of these different elements very precisely. We've completed our component, and we've got a ton of different elements here. Let's go down to the next code cell. We're going to write out a test. We're going to try to select just about every one of these different elements by using a role selector. All right, so down here, I'm going to add in a new test, and I'll give it a description of something like can find elements by role. So inside of here, I'm going to make first a render statement for my role example component, just to make sure I render my component for the test. I'm then going to define an array called roles. And inside of here, I'm going to list out a bunch of different roles. Each of these is going to be a simple string. We're going to use these very special names. So everything that goes in here is the name of a very specific role. We're then going to iterate over all these roles we add in. And for each one, we're going to write out an assertion, making sure that we can find a matching element out of this list right here, and that the element is just plain included in our component. So the entire goal here, again, is to just understand, hey, how do we find an anchor element by using a role? How do we find an image using a role? li, ul, all these different elements. So inside this long list, we're going to put in, once again, a little bit of typing here. Don't worry, this is the only notebook where we have to do a lot of typing, by the way, and we're almost done with it. So I'm going to put into this list here, link, button, content info, heading, banner, IMG, checkbox, spin button, radio, text box, list item, and list group. Then right after that array, I'm going to iterate through all those different roles. We'll say for let role of roles. I'm then going to try to find an element inside of our component with each of these different roles. Once I find an element, I'll just write out a very simple assertion to say that the element is included inside of our components output. So we'll say const L, short for element, screen, get, by role, and then pass in the role we are currently iterating over. I will then put in an expect statement. I will expect L to be in the document. And you'll notice right away that I made a very small typo on the very last one, just so you can see an example of a failing test here. So all of our tests are running, or I should say all these different assertions are running. And they're only being output or we're kind of only running these tests inside of this single panel right here. If any test fails, we're going to get a big red box pop up like this, and it shows us the fail message or the reason that our test failed. So in this case, the very last element I put on here was list group. And the intent was to try to find the UL element right there, the very last element inside of our list. You'll notice that whenever we try to find an element and we fail, we're going to get a print up from React Testing Library telling us exactly what elements are visible on the screen or which we can select by using the role system. So in this case, here are the accessible roles. These are the elements that we can try to find by using a get by role query. So we can try to find a link. We can try to find a button. We can try to find a content info, and that would give us the footer element, heading, banner, IMG, checkbox, and you can see the entire list here just by scrolling down. So in our case, I tried to find an element based upon the list role, or excuse me, list group is what we tried to use, but in reality, to find a UL element, the correct role would be simply list. 
So I'm going to change list group to just list. And now the test is passing. So this is, once again, an example of how we can find these different elements based upon their role. And we've now got this list right here. Each element is being printed out along with the role name that we would use. A lot of the roles that go along with HTML elements are very self-descriptive, and you can kind of figure out what they do very easily. So for example, an anchor element is going to have a role of link. A button is button. An H1 is heading. But others are a little bit less obvious. For example, to find a footer element, its role is content info. To find a header element, the role is banner. Well, those are not quite expected. Others also that are not very expected, an input of type number is a spin button. And it's a spin button because if you click in the number input right here, you'll notice you get those two little buttons you can click on. So you're kind of spinning the input up and down, so to speak. That's the thought process there. Okay, so again, this is a test that just shows you some very common elements. We're going to use these very often in a wide collection of different components, not only in this course, but on your own personal projects as well. To select these very common elements, you just need to start kind of getting in your head or memorizing some of these different role names. And once again, a lot of them are going to be very obvious and you are going to very easily remember, but others are a little bit less obvious, like say to get a footer element, we'd use a role name of content info. So memorizing those, just a little bit more challenging. The next example we're going to take a look at is how we can find an element within a component if there are two elements with the exact same roles. So at the very bottom of our cheat sheet, I'm going to add in a new code cell and make a new component inside of it. So I'm going to call this component accessible name. And notice there are two C's and two S's in the word accessible. I'm going to return a div element that has two buttons inside of it. The first button, I'm going to give some text like submit. And on the second one, I'll give it some text like cancel. I'm going to render this component. There we go. All right. Now let's try to add in another code cell here. We're going to add in a test and we're going to try to find each of these different specific buttons. So I'm going to add in another code cell. I'm going to put in a test. I'll give it a description of something like can select by accessible name. I will then render my component. And now, just like the test says, I want to try to find each of these different buttons one by one. So I want to be able to do something like const submit button is screen get by role button. But if I run that code, I'm going to find, well, two different buttons. Whenever we try to run the get by role function, the expectation is that we are going to find exactly one element. So in this case, if I try to get by role with button, I'm going to find two buttons, and the result is we get an error message. So in this particular case, it says that we found multiple elements with the same role. Here are the two that have that role. So again, get by role is going to give us an error if we ever find anything other than one element. So we need to be a little bit more specific in this case. We need to add in a little bit more of a filter criteria to this query function, and we need to say exactly which button element we are trying to find. One possible way to do this is by using the accessible name of an element. So accessible name is a technical term of sorts. The accessible name of an element is going to be the text within it. In some cases, some elements do not have text inside of it. For example, input elements. An input element, as we write it out, like so, it doesn't have any text inside of it. It is a self-closing tag. So an input element is not going to have a accessible name that we can add in by just inserting text. We define the accessible name in a slightly different way that I will show you in a minute. But for any element where we are able to add in some text directly to it, the text inside is the accessible name of the element. To find an element based upon its accessible name, we can add in a second argument to the get by role function. It's going to have a name property. And then in here, we're going to put in the accessible name of the element. So in this case, for the submit button, its accessible name is the text submit. So I would put in submit, like so. And now that error message goes away, which means my test is passing. Now, 
whenever we are trying to find an element based upon its accessible name, a very common pattern is to not use an exact string. You might instead use a regular expression. So we could put in submit in between two forward slashes and then an I. And the I here, again, we saw this a little bit earlier, it indicates that this is a case insensitive regular expression. So find any button that has a text of submit and don't worry about capital or lowercase letters. So now we can use the same kind of technique to find the other button as well. The other one has an accessible name of cancel. So to find that second button, we would do a screen get by role with button. And this one would have a name of cancel. Now I can write out two assertions. So I can expect submit button to be in the document and cancel button to be in the document. Very good. No failures over here, which means the test is passing. Just a moment ago, I told you that the accessible name is going to be whatever text we put in between these two tags. But in some cases, like input elements, we are not really supposed to make two separate open and close inputs and put text in between. Instead, inputs are really intended to be self-closing. Something like this. So in this case, how would we use an accessible name with an input? Well, let me show you that really quickly. This is something that we've seen on our previous application we worked on, but I just want to kind of document this in the notebook so you've got a record of it going into the future. Down here at the very bottom of the page, I'm going to add in another code cell. I'm going to add in a new component here. And I'll give this component a name of, how about more names? I'll then return a div. And inside of here, I'll put in an input, another input, and then I will give each of these a label. So how about for the first one, I'll give it a label of email. Second one can have a label of, I don't know, color. How about search? That's fine. I'll then render this component just to make sure that it is working as expected. Very good. Doesn't, well, I should say, doesn't look very good, but at least it works. So now I'm going to add in another code cell. I'll put a test inside of here. And for this test, I want to make sure two inputs rendered. And that description isn't that great because if I just wanted to make sure that two inputs were rendered, well, I could just try to find all the inputs. So maybe I'll change that description to something a little bit more clear. I'll say shows an email and search input. That's better. I'll then render my component. And then once again, I want to try to find that input right there and the second one underneath it. Naturally, if we try to do a simple query function, like screen get by role text box, we'll end up with a failed test because there are two elements that have a roll of text box. Both the inputs do. And because we are finding two different elements here, the get by roll function is going to throw an error because again, it expects to find just one single element. Now, if we try to use the name shortcut here, well, in this case, there really isn't any name because yeah, again, there is no accessible name right now being applied to the input because we've not added any text inside of the tags because that's not valid JSX or HTML. So in this case, to apply an accessible name to an input, we have to use the labels for property and assign an ID to the input. So again, this is something we saw just a little bit ago. So to give an accessible name to the first input, we would have to give the input itself an ID of maybe something like email. And then on the label, if we were writing plain HTML, it would be simply for. But because we are writing JSX, it is HTML4 instead. So again, HTML4 is a JSX specific thing. And this label is for the input with an ID of email. So HTML4 and ID, that's what links these two elements together. So now we can attempt to find that input element based upon its accessible name. 
and the accessible name is going to be whatever text is inside of the label element. So now down here, when we try to find the email input, we can look for some text box with the name of email. We can put in the exact string, or what is usually better practice is if we put in a regular expression instead, so that we don't have to worry about lowercase or uppercase characters. So now we can repeat the same process for the search input as well. I'll give this one an HTML4 of, how about search, an ID of search, so that's what links the two together. And now the input will have an accessible name of search. So we can try to find the search input down here. And then once again, just make sure that these two elements are being rendered by our component. And we can do that with a simple expect email input to be in the document. And duplicate that down for the search input as well. Okay, I do not see any errors over here on the right hand side. So that means that the test is working. And we are definitely correctly trying to find both these different inputs. I know trying to find elements based upon their role and going over this stuff for many videos in a row, I know it's kind of boring. So there's just one last thing I want to show you here. And this last thing is actually going to be pretty important because it's something that I think you're going to run into on real projects rather frequently. So at the very bottom of the page, I'm going to add in one last example component. I'll give this component a name of icon buttons. And then inside of here, once again, return a div. I'll put in a button. And inside of here, it's very common to have buttons that simply have icons inside them. As a matter of fact, you can see some examples over here on the top right hand side of this cell. These are button elements and they have no text. They have only a very simple icon. So the question here is, how exactly would we find buttons based upon an accessible name if they are showing icons? Very often, icons will be represented by SVG elements. So very often when you use an icon library and it's being provided to you in the form of React components, when you try to show in those components, what's actually being rendered on the screen is an SVG. It's not the case 100% of the time, but very often we represent icons using SVG elements. So if we have an SVG inside of here, as opposed to some, say, plain text, how would we try to find this button element based upon an accessible name? So let's try this out. I'm going to put two buttons, one right after each other. And they're both going to be kind of fake icon buttons. So they both have SVG elements. I'm going to render this component at the very bottom. And you'll notice that we're going to get a really weird result when we try to render some empty SVGs. We are going to get two buttons, but they're going to be really, really large. So they are buttons. They contain SVGs. I know it looks weird, but they are essentially buttons that contain nothing but an icon of sorts. So now let's try to write out a test and just make sure that we are showing both these buttons or really just try to select each of them independently. So I'm going to add in another code cell. And I'll give this one a description of something like find elements based on label. Once again, render my component. Now, of course, if we do button one with a screen get by role uh, button, yep, we're going to get a nasty error because we just found two buttons. So we need some way of discerning, figure out which one is which. So another way that we can clarify what the accessible name of an element is, if the usual way doesn't quite work out, because again, we don't really want to put any text in here, we want to put only an icon. So to clarify the accessible name of this button element, there is a fallback. We can add a prop of aria-label. And notice that we are kind of violating a traditional rule of JSX. The attribute name is not aria capital L label, instead it is aria dash label. And then inside of this string right here, we can add in some, some name to this element, something that clarifies what the purpose of the button is. So maybe this first button right here, maybe its goal is to close something. So I might give it, or how about a more practical example, how about we make this a sign in button. And then maybe the other one is supposed to be a sign out button. 
So in this case, for whatever reason, we decided not to not give the buttons plain text content that say very clearly sign in and sign out. Instead, we've got the icons. But now we at least have a way to select these two individual buttons. We can use sign in and sign out as their accessible names. So down here inside of our test to find the, let's give this one a better name. How about sign in button? To find that one, we can use a name of sign in. And for the sign out button, a name of sign out and an I. And then as usual, we'll do a quick expect sign in button to be in the document. And same for sign out button. Oh, I got the word sign in there twice. There we go. Very good. So I do not see any errors over here, which means, again, the test is passing. So we're going to use this fallback whenever trying to use an accessible name doesn't quite work out because we don't want to put plain text into an element. And this is going to happen very, very frequently whenever you are trying to show a button that contains an icon. That's definitely like the number one most particular use case where this is going to come up. We have finished up our first notebook. Attached to the lecture right before this one, you should have found a zip file containing the completed version of our roles notebook. So I just went back through, it's all the exact same code. I've just added in a couple of comments to explain what's going on in here. It's absolutely up to you if you want to download this and have the completed version. If you do download the completed version, remember you can open it up by using the RTL book command line tool once again. All right, now that we are done with this first notebook, we're gonna move on to our next one. I know that these notebooks are not super exciting, like not really a lot of big projects going on here just yet. But remember, in the world of React Testing Library and Jest, there are tons of these different query functions to find elements and these matcher functions that we can write out in our tests. So as you start writing out your own tests, you're going to eventually take a look at the documentation around React Testing Library and Jest, and you're going to see all these different things. And if you don't really understand some of the big concepts around them, it can be really, really frustrating when you're first getting started. And I say that from experience, trust me. Okay, so we're going to create a new notebook. We're going to learn about another topic around query functions. Let's get to it. First, back at my terminal, I'm going to stop my running RTL book server with a control C. I'm then going to create a new notebook with npx RTL book serve, and I'm going to call this one query notes.js. I'll then go back over to my browser. And I'm going to go back to localhost 4005. If you're already there, you can just refresh the page. Once you do so, you'll see the default template for a new notebook up here. I'm going to immediately delete the code cells inside of here. I'm going to create a text cell. And then I'm going to paste in some notes that I put together ahead of time. Now there's a lot of notes here, a lot of stuff. You do not have to read through this just yet. You don't have to, well, you don't have to read through it ever, really. These are notes that I'm going to give to you in the completed version of this notebook. So you will eventually be able to get access to all these notes. So again, you don't have to copy these. You don't have to memorize them. You don't have to read them, anything like that. I just want to give a couple of notes right away. So we got some place to kind of get started on this notebook from. So as you can guess, we're going to talk about query functions. Query functions are these functions that we're going to use to find elements that have been rendered by our component. We've already made use of one or two quite a bit. We made use of get by role. We've also made use of, I think, get by, get all by role a little bit. So we've done a little bit here, but we haven't really done a whole bunch just yet. It turns out that there is a huge variety. I think in total about 48 different query functions. So 48 different functions, memorizing the name of all of them. Yeah, that's really challenging. But we're going to see really quickly in this video and the next couple that there are a couple of little shortcuts that we can use to understand what all these different query functions do. So we're going to first focus on all these different functions, taking a look at the start of the function name. So all these query functions are always going to start with the words get by, get all by, query by, query all by, find by, and find all by. For example, you are going to see query functions in the documentation called get by role, get by text. You will see query by title, query all by text. You will see find all by text, find all by display value. 
So you can notice really quickly that they all begin with the same couple of words. And they usually end with the same couple of words right away. So you can figure out what these different query functions do just by understanding the basic rules around what the start of the function name means and what the end of the function name means. So as you guess, right now we're going to focus on what the start of these function names implies, and then we're going to eventually take a look at what the end of the names imply. Now the start of the function names are really telling us what is going to happen if we ever find zero, one, or more elements. It's going to tell us whether or not we're going to get back a single element or an array of elements. It's also going to tell us whether or not the function is going to take a look at the output of our component instantly, so kind of synchronously, or if it's going to take a look and watch the output of our component over a period of time. So that's a little bit more of an asynchronous operation. The short rules here to just get us started, if we're looking for a single element, we're going to use get by, query by, and find by. If we're looking for multiple elements, get all by, query all by, find all by. And then each of these things, once again, they behave a little bit differently based upon whether or not we find zero elements, one element, or more than one elements. Now, out of all this stuff, what I really want you to understand is when in the world should we use each of them? Because, hey, that's great that all these different variations of these query functions exist, but who cares? When should we actually use them? Don't worry. This is the real focus here, and we're going to spend a decent amount of time to say, hey, here's when you should use each of these different kinds of query functions. All right, so that's enough of a lead up. I think we got a reasonable idea of what we're going to focus on here. So quick pause, come back, and we're going to create a component and then add in a couple tests. We're going to start to understand how these different query functions really are working. Let's create a very small component. It's not really going to do a whole lot. We're just making this component so we can select different elements inside of it and understand how the different prefixes, that's what these things really are. They are prefixes or the start of a function name. We're going to see how these different prefixes react when we try to find different elements. Okay, so inside of a new code cell, I'm going to make a very small component. I am going to first begin by importing. I think we only need one import here, just render and screen from at testing library slash react. I'm then going to create a component. It is going to be very simple. I'm going to call it color list. I'm going to return from this component a UL element, an LI that says red, and then two other LIs with blue and green. I'm then going to render that component down here just to make sure that it's working as expected. And sure enough, yep, it is. All right, I'm going to add in a couple of comments to this JSX really quickly. Do not add in these comments. I'm going to delete them myself. I just want to point out a couple of things because we're going to test some different aspects of this component really quickly. So first reminder here, this UL element, remember it has a role of list. That's the role of a UL element. So at present, our component is displaying exactly one UL or one element with a role of list. Then each of these different LI elements have a role of list item. So we have three of those. And then finally, this is maybe going to sound strange, but simultaneously kind of obvious. We do not have any text inputs in here. So there are no elements with a type of or a role of text box. So if we tried it to find any elements with the role of text box, well, we would get back zero. So we're going to write out a couple of tests. We're going to see what happens with each of those different function prefixes when we try to find a role of list, list item, and text box. That's the goal. All right, so I'm going to remove those comments. Again, just putting them in as a quick reminder. I'm then going to add in another code cell down here. I'm going to write out my first test. So we're going to investigate and understand how get by, query by, find by, react to finding zero elements. What do they do? So if we run some query function that begins with one of these prefixes, what happens if we end up finding zero elements? Are they going to just return null? Are they going to throw an error? What exactly happens? Now, we're going to be looking at a variation of each of these functions where we look for a role. So we're going to use get by role. We're going to use query by role. And we're going to use find by role. Remember that there are many other query functions available to us that start with the same prefixes. So for example, there is also get by text. There is 
Query by text. There is query by display value. Right now, we are only focused on what the prefix or the start of each of these functions names really implies or how it's kind of modifying the function's behavior. All right, so at the top of this test, I'm going to render my color list. I'm then going to attempt to call get by role, query by role, and find by role. And we're going to write out a test to just verify and kind of confirm what happens when we make use of each of these. So we'll first begin with get by. If we do a get by role and we try to find an element that does not exist inside of our component, so something like screen get by role, and I look for a text box, the default behavior of any function that begins with get by is to find one element. And if we don't find exactly one, if we find zero or greater than one, we're going to end up getting an error. And we can confirm that immediately right here. This is telling us that, hey, we did not find any elements with a role of text box. So we've kind of seen this already. I'm really just repeating it. We've seen this once or twice already inside the course. If we ever try to find a element using get by, any function that begins with the words get by, and we find zero or more than one, Yes, we're going to get an error. That means our test is going to fail. So like I said, I want to write out a test that just confirms that that is how get by role exists. So to write out a test that confirms that this line of code right here is going to throw an error message, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to write out expect. I'm going to put in an arrow function. Inside there, I'm going to call screen.getByRole text box. And then I'm going to chain on a matcher of to throw. So what this does, it passes off a arrow function to jest. It says, hey, jest, here is a function. Try to run it for me. And if you run it, it should throw an error. So this test is only passing because trying to call screen get by roll, the text box is throwing an error. So this is kind of, if you ever read this code right here in a test, it would be confirmation that, hey, in this scenario, this line of code throws an error and we really expected it to throw. So when you look back at this test in the future, if you're ever looking at this notebook, you could look at this test and say, oh yeah, if I try to find a role that does not exist, this function is going to throw an error. That's what this test is really doing for us. All right, let's now repeat something similar for the other two. If you ever do a query by role and you try to find an element that does not exist, any function beginning with the words query by is going to return null. So we can expect a query by role of text box to give us back a value of null. So we can once again write out a test and just confirm that is the case. All right, last variation is find by. So find by is a little bit dissimilar from these other two because it operates asynchronously. It's going to watch the output of your component over a span of one second by default. And many times within that second, by default, I believe it's about every 50 milliseconds, it's going to try to find some element within your component. If it doesn't find that element within the span of one second, then it's going to throw a error. Or in this case, it technically returns a promise that gets rejected. So let's give this one a shot. If I do a find by role for text box, we're going to wait just about one second. You'll notice how we can see the text on the screen or see our component for about a second. And then after one second, we see an error pop up. So that's telling us that, hey, our component was rendered. We then waited about one second trying to find a text box. We didn't find it. And so this line of code eventually threw a promise that re it rejected the promise that was returned is the correct technical term here. If we want to write out a test to make sure that is how this thing works, here's what we do. I'm going to mark the enclosing test function right here as async. Then we have to do this. It's a little bit tricky to write out an asynchronous test that confirms something throws in this browser environment. So we've got a little bit of a workaround here. Here's what we do. I'm going to say let error thrown equals false. I'm then going to wrap up that find by role with a try statement. I'm going to await it. I'll then put in a catch error. Inside of the catch statement, I'll do an error thrown equals true. And then right after the try catch, I'm going to expect error thrown to equal true. 
and now the test is going to pass. So take a look at this quickly, or very carefully, I bet you can figure out what is going on here. We're attempting to run this line of code. We're gonna wait that one second, see if a text box ever shows up. It does not, so it throws an error. We're gonna end up in the catch. We're gonna flip the error thrown variable over to true. And then after doing all this stuff, we're going to expect that we did in fact enter that catch statement. So air thrown should be true. All right, so that is it. We've now seen how get by, query by, and find by respond to finding zero elements when we expected to find one. So get by instantly is going to throw an error. Query bys are going to return null, and find bys are going to be asynchronous. After one second, they're going to throw. We have seen how these get by, query by, and find by variants work when we are finding zero elements. So now we're going to repeat the same process. We're going to go much more quickly because we understand the basic idea now. And we're going to see what happens when we find one element and multiple. So it should be pretty quick. I know, once again, not the most exciting stuff, but believe me, you're going to end up having to use these functions very often. And so it's very advantageous to just understand how they work. Okay, so we're going to write out another test. And we're going to take a look at what happens when a get by, a query by, and a find by when they find one element. I'm going to mark this test function right here as async right away, just to save myself a little bit of time. Then inside of the test, I'm going to render my color list. And then we're going to write out a test, or we're going to attempt to find an element of which one exists inside of our component. So remember, inside of our component back up here, there's one UL element, and it has a role of list. So let's make use of these three different variations. So a get by role, a query by role, and a find by role to find that list. And we're just going to say, hey, we did in fact find the element. So super simple stuff here. To get started, I'll do an expect. If I do a screen get by role for list, that should give me back a single plain element. So I'm going to use a matcher here of to be in the document. And I'll see that test passes right away. So now we can repeat the same process with a query by role. And I can do a find by role. And for the find by, whenever we call find by, we get back a promise. So we need to wait for that promise to be resolved. To await it, all we have to do is add in the await keyword. So again, remember the find by variation, we're looking, we're kind of pulling multiple times over the span of one second, and eventually we are hoping that the given element will show up and that there will be only one. All right, so that's pretty much it. So we've got the get by, query by, and find by variations. They all work pretty simply whenever we are correctly finding just one element. So now the last variation here, and again, this will be really quick. We're going to do all three of those. When we find greater than one elements. I'm going to mark the enclosing function as async. Don't forget that. I will then render my color list component. And then in this case, we're going to pretty much expect the same exact thing as what happened back up in our earlier test. So I'm going to go back up to where we wrote out some tests where we found zero elements. So if we attempt to get by, query by, or find by for zero elements, we end up getting errors. And that's pretty much what we're seeing here. The exception of query by gives us back a null. If we ever attempt to do a get by, query by, find by, and we find more than one element, they're all going to throw errors. So to write out a test that confirms that and just save myself a little bit of time, I'm going to copy these three statements right here, these three blocks from the first test. I'm going to take them down to the test we just started writing out down here. I'm going to paste in. And then I'm going to change the by role statements, so the thing we are looking for, I want to attempt to find those list items. Remember, there are three list items. So that will simulate attempting to find more than one element. So I'll do a list item there, there, and there. 
And then the only other change I need to make, if a query by function ever finds more than one element, it's going to throw an error. So I'm going to change the assertion there, the entire setup. I'm going to put in an arrow function that's going to run query by role. And then in this case, I expect that to throw. And that's it. And the test passes. Okay, I know, once again, I've repeated this like three times, this stuff is a little bit laborious. The reason I'm spending so much time on this and showing you every different variation is that I absolutely, I can't tell you enough, when you start writing out your own tests, you're going to go to the documentation, you're going to see all these functions with these different names, and you're kind of rarely going to actually see the complete name of the functions. They're kind of in the documentation. You know what? Let me just pull up the documentation for you here really quickly. So here's an example. So you'll notice that on the documentation, here's a list of all the different queries. They are not saying anything about get by or find by or query by. All they show to you is by role, by label text, by placeholder text, by text. So what's going to happen here is you're probably going to click on one of these and say, okay, like, how do I actually run this function? If you just look right here, you would get the impression that the only function that is available is get by label text. And it's not really immediately clear why this one is called get by label text, but we're in the section called by label text. So the documentation, it once you read through it, it does make it pretty clear what's going on, but it's just a point where you might get a little bit frustrated. And that's why I want to spend a decent amount of time on this to make sure it's super clear what these different variations of these different query functions do, because on tests, you're going to be making use of these nonstop all the time. Okay, so hopefully that's a good little pep talk to help you understand why we are spending a little bit of time with this. We're going to get through the last three variations all together in the next video. We're going to see what happens when we are looking for multiple elements intentionally, as opposed to the ones we've been using so far, where we are looking for a single element. All right, my friends, last little bit here around some of these query functions. So we're going to take a look at what happens when we are intentionally looking for multiple elements. If we are ever looking for multiple elements, we're going to use query functions to begin with words like get all by, query all by, and find all by. Once again, we're going to write out a couple of tests down at the bottom. We're going to do this really quickly because these are a little bit easier to understand compared to the single element variations. Okay, so down at the very bottom of this page, I'm going to add in a new code cell. I'll add in a new test and give it a description of get all, find, or I'll stay with the same pattern. We'll do get all by, query all by, and find all by. So inside of this test, we're going to render color list. And then we're going to attempt to just find the LIs. That's all I want to do. And I just want to show you what happens when we attempt to find those LIs. In the case of get all by and query all by, these functions are going to be synchronous. They're going to immediately give us back the list of LIs. Find all by, once again, asynchronous. So we have to call this function, find all by role in this case. It's going to give us back a promise. We're going to await it, and it's going to eventually resolve into the array of elements that we found. So I'm going to do a expect screen dot get all by role list item. That's going to give me back an array of elements instantly, and there should be three. So in this case, I'm going to write out a test that just confirms that the array I get back has a length of three or three elements inside of it. So we do a two have length three. Similar for query all by. So screen query all by role list item to have length three. And then finally, the find all by variation. This is asynchronous. Whenever you see the word find, that means asynchronous. So we're going to mark this in closing function as async. And then if we do an expect await screen find all by role list item. Once again, that should resolve into an array of three elements. So we can do a two have length three. And it works. I do not see any error. Just make sure these tests are actually running. I can always change one of these threes to say a two. And now I should see an error. And in fact, I do. Okay. So that's really all I want to go over on the get all by, query all by, and find all by variations. The last thing I want to mention about those really quickly 
is that if you are looking for multiple elements and you find zero, query all by is going to give you back an empty array, whereas the get all by and find all by variations are going to throw an error. So now that we've taken a look at these different prefix variations, the last thing we're going to cover, we're going to do this pretty quickly as well in the next video, I'm going to tell you exactly when you want to use each of these. All right, my friends, last little bit here around these function prefixes. So we're going to speak pretty briefly around when we're going to use each of these. So we're going to go over a couple of quick examples here, hopefully as fast as possible. First two will be really quick. Last one will take just a little bit longer because it's kind of a more complex scenario. We're going to make a new component to demonstrate this last case really quickly. Okay, so first, if you're ever writing a test and we just want to prove that an element exists, it is being rendered by our component. We're going to favor making use of get by and get all by. So let me show you an example of this really quickly. It's going to be just about identical to other tests we have written, but I want to point out an interesting aspect of it, something that's going to prevent you from making a mistake at some point in the future. So at the very bottom of the document, I'm going to add in a test with a description of favor using get by to prove an element exists. I will render color list. I'm then going to try to find, I'm going to call this variable element. I'll do a screen get by role. And I want to try to find the UL element, which I can find with a role of list. I will then expect element to be in the document. So that's it. That's all it is. So if you ever want to say, yes, this element exists, if we want to definitely find it, we're going to favor all the different query function that begins with the words get by or get by all if we're trying to find multiple. Now, I mentioned very briefly just a second ago, there's kind of an interesting aspect of this. So the interesting thing here is that if we ever attempt to find an element that does not exist, the query function is going to throw an error. And if that throws an error, the test is going to fail entirely. So we can see that very easily. If I change the get by role to look for an element with the role of text box, the query function is going to throw an error. As soon as this thing throws an error, the test ends entirely. So the interesting aspect here, the thing that's kind of just weird to think about, is that whenever we use get by, having an assertion later on that just confirms that the element is in the document is actually kind of pointless. Because if the element wasn't in the document, we would have already thrown an error on the earlier line of code. So putting in the, both the get by and the assertion yeah, it kind of doesn't make a whole lot of sense. We're kind of repeating ourselves. So with that in mind, you might be tempted, and I'm going to encourage you not to do this. You might be tempted to write out tests that just look like this. So think about this for a little bit. If we render our component and then attempt to find an element and we are expecting it to exist, if it doesn't exist, then this line of code is going to throw an error and our test will fail. So we can kind of skip the assertion. But again, I encourage you not to do that. And the reason is very simple. Let's imagine that we have something like this, where we attempt to find the element using a get by role. And then for some reason, we decide not to add in the assertion. What would happen if another engineer came by and said, oh, you know what, for my purposes, instead of using a get by role, I want to use a query by role. So if another engineer made that change, now we are not finding a text box still because one does not exist, but because query by does not throw an error, now our test is not going to fail and it's going to pass incorrectly. So this would definitely not be good. So if another engineer again came by and made that change, yeah, the test would start to pass when it really should not have passed at all. So that's why even if we are making use of get by just to confirm that an element exists, we are still going to write out the full assertion. Okay, I'm going to change that back to list. And there we go. Okay, next one, very quickly. This is the exact opposite. Whenever we want to prove that an element does not exist, we're going to favor making use of query by or query all by. So quick demonstration of why this is. Down here at the bottom, another test. I'll say favor query by when proving an element does not exist. I will render color list. 
And now I'm going to say maybe, I don't know, element screen query by role. I'm going to look for a text box. There is no text box inside of our component. So let's write out an assertion to make sure that it does not exist. So we can say expect element not to be in the document. And that test is going to pass. So the reason that we're going to favor making use of query by in this scenario is very, very simple. If we put in a get by instead, then the test is going to immediately fail because we didn't find a text box. We were trying to prove that there was no text box, but this is going to fail. And that's not what we want. We want to know that there is no text box and we don't want to get an error when we check for it. So that's a very simple reason of why query by exists at all. Okay, so that's it. Finally, why do we and when do we make use of find by and find all by? So this is going to come down to whenever we do data fetching. Now, like I said, we're gonna write out another component very quickly to test this, but this video is already a little bit long. So we're gonna pause right here, come back in just a moment. We're gonna write out another component very, very quickly. That's going to simulate a little bit of data fetching. And we'll see how we can test it by making use of the find by and find all by query functions. All right, last example here of when we want to use one of these different function prefixes. So whenever we are trying to make sure an element eventually exists, and this is really talking about data fetching. Now we're going to go over a ton of stuff around data fetching in tests, but for right now, we're just going to kind of do it at a high level. I'm going to show you a very simple component. We're going to fake a network request. We're going to have it kind of do a fake request for data. And we're going to make sure that some elements eventually appear on the screen by making use of the find all by variation. And we're going to see that if we try to use get all by or query all by, in fact, our test is going to fail. So as a quick preview of what we're going to do, we're going to make the same component, same kind of color list thing. The only difference here is that we're going to attempt to fetch the list of colors from, again, kind of a fake network request. So we're going to have to make use of state, probably a use effect function. Let's give it a shot. I'm going to go down to the very bottom of the notebook once again. I'm going to import use state and use effect from React. I'll then make a function that's going to simulate a network request. So I will call it fake fetch colors. Inside of here, I'm going to return promise.resolve. I'm going to call resolve and I'm going to put in an array with red, green, and blue. If you are not familiar with promise.resolve, that is totally fine. Just to understand that this is kind of like simulating a network request. So it's roughly equivalent to doing something like fetch to some API or doing something like axios.get to some API. The only difference is that it's going to give us back a promise that resolves instantly. So we're not going to have to wait for the entire data fetching process to occur over maybe several or several hundred milliseconds. After that, we're going to make our component. I'm going to call this one loadable color list because we're kind of loading up some data here. Inside this component, I will define some state called colors, and I will define it or initialize it to be an empty array. I'll then define a use effect function. I only want it to run one time, so I'll put in an empty dependency array right here. And then inside of this, I'll do a fake fetch colors. I'm then going to chain on a dot then statement. I'm not going to bother using any async await syntax here, even though we definitely could just a little bit faster to chain on a dot then. I'm going to receive the list of colors, which is going to be that array right there. And I'm going to call it simply C, I'm just going to abbreviate it as C. So C right here, that is the array of colors, red, green, and blue. And I'm going to use that to update the colors piece of state. So I will call set colors with C. Then after that, I'm going to iterate over all of our different colors. I'm going to map over that array and build up the list. So let's say rendered colors is colors.map. For every color, I want to return an li element that's going to contain the color. And I'll put on a key here as well. And then right after that, I will return a ul element that contains rendered colors. And then to test it out, I will call render at the bottom and put in loadable color list. And 
Okay, looks like I've got a little typo here. Oh, I never actually called fake fetch colors inside the use effect. So I just missed my parentheses. That's better. Okay, so now I will see red, green, and blue. Okay, simple enough. So now let's add in a test here. And we're going to see very quickly that if we try to use the query all by or the get all by, well, the test is just plain going to fail. And we're going to end up having to use find all by. So I will add in a test. I'll give it a description of favor find by or find all by when data fetching, or really just kind of waiting for some content to show up or some element to show up. This is definitely going to contain some asynchronous logic. So I'm going to mark the enclosing function as async. And I know you can't quite see that because it's behind the format button. Here we go. That's better. So notice I've got the async right there. Inside the test, I will render loadable color list. There we go. I'll then try to find some elements, which I will abbreviate as simply L's. And let's first do this the wrong way. Let's try doing a get all by role. We're going to try to find all the elements with the role of list item. And I'm going to expect L's to have length three, because that's how many colors we just fetch. So as soon as I run this, yep, sure enough, we end up getting an error. And the error is, sorry, but there's just plain no elements with a role of list item. So I bet you can guess what is going on here. We are rendering our component, and then in the next instant, we attempt to find all the different list items inside of it. However, by that point in time, the instant after we render our component, we have not yet received our list of colors from the fake API. It's going to take kind of a fraction of a microsecond later. It's going to be the smallest amount of time possible in this JavaScript environment to actually get the list of colors and render them out on the screen. So we are simply checking for the presence of those list items too early. That's all, a fraction of a second too early in this case. So this is a absolutely ideal scenario where we, where we would want to use the find all by role query function instead. Find all by role is going to check for the presence of these different list items several times over the next couple of milliseconds. In this case, again, by default, it is one second. And as soon as it finds any list items, it's going to automatically resolve and assign a list of elements that it found to that variable right there. So I'm going to update this code to do a find all by role, and I will await that. And there we go, test passes. Okay, so that's it. So at long last, I know the last six videos. I think it's the fourth time I've repeated this now. Not super exciting stuff, but we really, really had to get through it. We've now got a good idea on why these different query functions have these different names. And we've also got kind of a vague sense right now on when to use each of them. One more quick notebook around finding elements based upon a given criteria. So this is going to be similar to the last notebook, but it's going to be way faster and the kind of takeaway is a lot easier to understand. So let's get to it. Once again, at my terminal, I'm going to stop my running RTL book program with a control C. I'll then create another new notebook with an NPX RTL book serve, and I'll call this one criteria notes.js. Then back over to my browser at localhost 4005, I'm going to refresh the page and I'll see the new default notebook up here once again. I'm going to delete all the code cells inside of here. And then again, I'm going to add in a text cell and I'm going to paste in some notes just like last time. Again, you can find all these notes in the completed version of this notebook. So this time around, we're going to be taking a look at the words on the second half of all these different query functions. So we've been making use of query functions quite a bit that end with the words by role. We're going to quickly look at some of the ones that end with by label text, by placeholder text, et cetera, et cetera, all these other ones. Now, like I said, this is going to go really quickly because we're basically just trying to understand what the search criteria is. And in many cases, it's really simple, really basic. We're also going to briefly discuss when we're going to use each of these. Matter of fact, you know what, let's just do it right now. The real takeaway on when to use these is we're always going to prefer by role. That's always the preference. So as much as possible, we want to find elements based upon their role. And if we can't, then we'll fall back to using one of the others. If we cannot make use of by role, we can use pretty much any of the others 
except for by test ID. That's not really preferred. We kind of want to save by test ID as one of our last choices. All right, so let's get to it. Quick example here and a couple of tests. Actually, just one test. Like I said, it'll be pretty quick. I'm going to make a code cell. I'm going to create a new component. And let's also not forget our import statements at the top. So I will get screen and render from at testing library slash react. There we go. Almost forgot that step. I'll then make a new component and I'm going to call it data form. I'm going to render data form right away. And then inside the component itself, I'm going to declare a piece of state called email. I'm going to give it an initial starting value of ASDF at ASDF.com. Basically any email you can imagine. Because I'm making use of use state, I'm also going to remember to import that at the top from React. I'm then going to return a div. And we're going to add in a whole bunch of elements inside of here. This is meant to kind of simulate a form. I'm not using a form element. We absolutely could use a form instead of the div. And you know what? Let's just do things right. I'm going to replace that div with a form just to really be complete here. There we go. And then inside the form, like I said, we're going to add in a whole bunch of elements. These are pretty much just random elements. We're just adding them in here so we can understand how to select them using some of these different query functions. So here's the collection of elements. Once again, a good amount of typing. I'm going to put in an H3 that says enter data. A div with the data dash test ID of image wrapper. Inside that div, I will add in an image element with an alt of data and an SRC of data.jpg. After the div, I'm going to add in a label element with an HTML4 of email. And the label will have text of email. After that, an input. This thing is going to have a couple different properties. So I'm going to make the input a multi-line JSX element. I'll then give it an ID of email, a value of the email piece of state, and whenever someone changes this thing, I'm going to take the event object and use it to update the email piece of state with an e target value. Then another label and input pair. So I'll do a label with an HTML4 of color. And I'll give the label some text of color. Then an input element with an ID of color and a placeholder of capital R red. And then last step here, a button element. I'm going to give it a title attribute of click when ready to submit. And I'll have the button just say submit as well. And that's it. There's our form. Okay, so you'll notice that we put together a whole bunch of elements here, and a lot of them had a couple of miscellaneous props added to them. As you guessed, these props are going to be absolutely key in helping us select some of these different elements. Now, there's some attributes we added in, or props I want to point out in particular. Notice that on the color input right here, we gave it a placeholder of red. By putting in a placeholder of red, notice that there's the input right there. It just has placeholder text. So it's kind of some pre-populated text. As soon as I type anything inside of here, the placeholder disappears. If I delete the text, the placeholder comes back. The only other prop that might be a little bit mysterious is the button having a prop of title. So any HTML element can have a title assigned to it. This title really does, if I mouse over the submit button, but do not click it and just hold my cursor there for a moment, I'll get a little tooltip. And I'm sure on the video, it's very, very small and hard to see, but there is a little tooltip that automatically pops up and it says, click when ready to submit. So that's what the title does. It just really adds in a tooltip to a given element. Like I said, everything else inside this form, I think you probably have a reasonable idea of what it is doing. In many cases, we even just covered things like label and input pairs just a moment ago. All right, so there is our component. Now I'm going to add in a code cell right after it. I'm going to write out a test and I'll give it a description of selecting different elements. 
I'm going to render the data form. I'm then going to create an array called elements. For right now, it's going to be empty. After creating that array, we're going to fill in the contents here in just a moment. But before we do, I'm going to write out a quick for loop. I'm going to iterate through all the different elements within this array. And for every element we find, we're going to write out a very quick assertion and just say, hey, this element is visible on the screen. So I'll say for let element of elements expect element to be in the document. There we go. All right. So last step here. This is really the entire point of this whole video, the entire point of this notebook. We're going to go through and we're going to try to select a bunch of different elements out of that form by using some of these different query functions. We're going to add them all into this array. And all we are really attempting to do here is make an assertion that, hey, we were able to successfully find a given element. So let's start learning about these different query function suffixes. That's the English term for the part of a word that's kind of the second half of the word. So like get by role, by role is kind of the suffix in this case. So we're going to learn about these different function suffixes in just a moment. All right, let's continue on. Like I said, we're going to try to find some of these different elements by using these different query functions that end, end with these different names. We've already seen get by role. We've seen get by text. We're going to take a look at some of the other ones in here as well. Now, remember, all these different end of function names, we can mix them up with all the different prefixes that we learned about a little bit ago. So for example, we can make use of a get by display value. We can do a find by display value. We can do a find all by display value, a query by display value. So we can take every start and pair it up with every different end. And we end up with a query function that we can use to find an element. All right, so let's get to it. Now we're going to be using the get by variation on all these different query functions. So let's try one right away. We're going to do a get by role, which doesn't really need a lot of explanation because we've done it so many times already. We're going to attempt to find the button element. So that would be a screen dot get by role button. I do not see any error, which means the test is passing. I was able to find the button element right there. So we're going to repeat this process. Just try to find some of the different elements that are visible on the screen by using some of the other query functions that are available to us. And again, remember, it doesn't have to be a get by role here. We could have just as easily done, say, a query by role. But whenever we are trying to prove that an element exists and is visible on the screen, we're usually going to favor making use of a get by. Okay, next one. Let's try to find the email input. That's that one right there. We're going to do it one different way we've seen already we can do a get by role and we can apply a name filter to it another possible way this is really going to seem like a repeat very much screen dot get by label text so go and find an input element find the label or find a label whose text matches whatever we put in here as soon as we find the label find the element the input element it is paired up to so in this case email there we go Next up, we'll try to find the color input based upon its placeholder text. So we can do a screen get by placeholder text. And notice that the H in placeholder is lowercase. So this would be red. Very good. Next, we'll try to get the H3 at the very top based upon the text it contains. So a screen get by text of enter data. And that will get us that H3. All right. I know this stuff, yeah, it's pretty repetitive. Just a couple more really quickly. We can do a display value, which is going to find an input element based upon the value it is currently assigned. So we'll try to get that email input. And we know that its current value is asdf at asdf.com. So we can do a get by display value, asdf, asdf.com. Test passes. Very good. Just three more. We'll try to find the image element based upon its alt text, which in this case is data. So screen get by alt text data. We can try to find the button based upon its title prop. So that would be a screen get by title. And the title in this case was a little bit long. So we can scroll back up 
find the exact string it was click when ready to submit. So I'll put that in. There we go. And we found the button successfully. And the last one, we're going to try to find that image wrapper element. That was the div around the image based upon the test ID. So we can do a screen get by test ID. And remember the D here in ID is lowercase. And the ID on that one or the test ID was image space wrapper. And that's it. Okay, that's pretty much it. I just want to show you one instance of each of these and just give you an idea of what they are all about. And really more than anything here is to point out that some of them are duplicates of methods we have already learned about. So we've got, say, labeled text. Well, we could have just as easily done a get by role. Try to find a text box, so an element with a role of text box, with a name of email. And that pretty much does the same kind of search as a get by labeled text. So a lot of these, yeah, they exist. You can definitely use them, but at the end of the day, I think you are very often going to fall back to using a by role. That's kind of our primary absolute go-to as much as we possibly can. I think you're also going to use very often a by text, just because it's very easy to use. And very often we want to confirm that the correct text is visible on the screen. And we don't always really care exactly what element it is placed in. We just care that, hey, some text shows up. So this one is very useful. And then finally, test ID as a real fallback if we can't really figure out a more clever way of trying to find an element. Very last thing I want to mention here, many of these different functions accept regular expressions in addition to a plain text string. So for example, get by text, that's going to find an element that has text of exactly enter data with that capitalization. If I want to be a little bit more flexible here, I could instead put in a regular expression of enter data put the I on there again, just to indicate I don't really care about uppercase or lowercase. If I want to be even more flexible, I could do just enter. And that's still going to find the element because I'm finding just the word enter in there. We can do this same kind of technique with say get by label text. So I could do email with an I. I can do the same thing with say, how about get by title? This is a good one. Having to go back and find that exact whole string, that was a little bit annoying. So we could just say, you know what, just find some element that has a title of ready to submit. And that will work just as well. Okay, so that's it. And thankfully, after spending a whole bunch of time on it, we are done with these query functions. I know, a little bit tedious. But like I said, there are a ton of them. And now we've got a good idea. We've got some good fundamentals. We understand some of the rules around them. So to be honest with you, I don't think you're going to very often have to refer back to the documentation on what these functions do. As long as you've got a reasonable sense on what some of the basic parts of the words of these functions are, like what get by does as opposed to query by, well, you really don't have to look at the documentation too much. You can just look at the name of the function and very quickly have an idea of what it does. In this video, we're going to create another notebook. It's going to be a lot faster than the other notebooks we have created. And unlike the other ones, we're not going to be going over some really dry, boring content. Instead, I'm going to show you something else, something a little bit more interesting that you're not going to very easily find in some documentation. So let's get to it. I'm going to begin by creating a new notebook. I'm going to give this one a name of Matcher Notes. I'll then go back over to my browser and refresh at localhost 4005. I'm going to delete all the existing code cells inside of here. And then once again, I'm going to create a text cell and I'm going to paste in a couple of notes right away. Remember, you can get these notes I'm pasting in by downloading the completed notebook at the end of this section. In this case, the note is really simple. Not a lot of stuff going on here. So as you can guess by the title, we're going to talk about matchers. A matcher is one of those functions that we add to the end of an expect function. We've already made use of several different matchers, and I've already mentioned a couple of times that whenever we generate a project using Create React App, we get access to some matchers defined inside of the Jest library and some that are defined inside of Jest DOM. Jest DOM is usually going to be all the matchers that are related to finding DOM elements or making sure that DOM elements are visible on the screen. So we've already been making use of a very commonly used matcher from Jest DOM called to be in the document. And again, as you guess, just make sure that our component is generating some particular element. 
Now we could sit here over the next couple of videos and we could go over 30 different matchers coming up with an example of each one. But I'll be honest with you, I don't think that's a good use of time because first off, the documentation at the two links right here, it's really good documentation. A lot of these different matchers, you can just read the name of the function and immediately have a reasonable idea of what is going on. So I don't think it would be a good time for you and I to sit down and try to go over a ton of different matchers. Instead, we're going to do something a little bit more interesting. We're going to come up with our own custom matcher. We're going to write one out ourselves. So in addition to using the matchers that are included inside of these libraries, you can write your own custom matchers. And this is very often going to save you a lot of time if you are ever writing out a series of different tests that are all tending to be really similar in nature. Okay, so that's the goal. To get started, we're going to first create a very simple component. We're then going to write out a simple test around it, and we're going to say, hey, you know what, maybe there's a better, more efficient way to write this test. So I'm going to create a code cell down here. I'm going to add in some imports at the top for screen, render, and also a function called within. Make sure you get that within import as well. And we'll get all that from testing library slash react. I'm then going to make a component called form data. I'm going to return a form element, a button that says save, and a button that says cancel. Now to select a form element, you cannot just use a get by role. In order for a get by role on a form element to work, it must have an aria label assigned to it. So I'm going to assign to the form element an aria label of simply form. That's all. Then to make sure that the component works, I'll put in a render down here of form data. Okay, there we go. So now I'm going to add in another code cell. We're going to write out a very simple test. I'm going to say the form displays two buttons. I'm going to render my component. And then looking at the test description, I bet you can get a reasonable idea of what we're going to try to do here. I want to try to find the number of buttons inside of the form. And initially it's going to look like this is really, really simple and easy. But then we're going to make a very, very small change to the component. And we're going to realize eh, maybe it's a little bit more challenging than we might think. So I'm going to find the number of buttons very simply by using a get by all role function. So we'll do a buttons is screen get all by role. I want to find all the elements with the role of button. And then we can expect this array that we got back to have two elements inside of it. So buttons to have length two. And right away, the test is going to pass. Not a lot of difficulty here, right? Okay, quick pause here. We're going to come back. Like I said, we're going to make a quick change to our component and realize maybe the style of test right here isn't going to be working quite as well in all scenarios, quite as much as we think. We've got our test put together and it definitely works. But now we're going to make a change to our component and we're going to realize that the way we have written out our test is not that great. So here we go. Here's the change we're going to make to our component. I'm going to find the form right here and I'm going to wrap the form with a div. And then outside of the form, I'm going to add in another button element. And we're going to pretend maybe this is a button to leave the form entirely. So maybe we will give it some text like go back or whatever else. As soon as we add in that button element, our test down here is of course going to start to fail because now there are three buttons that we are finding inside of our component, as opposed to just the original two that we are looking for. So there are two possibilities here now. Our test was specifically saying that we wanted to find the form in particular and make sure that the form itself displays two buttons. So we could try to update our test so that we find the form and look inside of there in particular to find those two buttons. Alternatively, we could say, you know what, I want my component to just check for all three buttons. That's definitely a possibility. But in this case, the original goal of the test really was to find the form and make sure that it has two buttons. So I want to stick with that goal. I want to make sure that this test specifically looks inside the form element and tries to find two buttons inside there. So let me show you one way that we could update our test to put in that kind of check. To do so, I want to remind you that we wrote out an import statement up here and we imported a helper function called within. This allows us to specify a query that looks within or only tries to find elements within another. 
So in this case, we're going to try to first find the form element. We're then going to write out a new query that's going to look only for buttons inside the form. So here's how we would do it. I'm going to say const form is screen get by role form. Then on the next line down, I'm going to delete all that stuff right there and update it to be within the form element that we just found, do another query and look for all the elements with a role of button, like so. And now our test is going to pass. So this wasn't too bad, right? This is absolutely doable, not a lot of trouble here, obviously not a lot of codes to write, lines of code to write this out. But for just a moment, I want you to imagine that we are working on a project where we have to write out tests that look like this nonstop. Let's imagine we just have to write tests like this all day, nonstop, and we are tired of doing it. So one way to slightly automate this process would be to create a custom matcher. Let me show you what we're going to do. I want to make a new custom matcher that we can use to kind of automate aspects of this test. Ultimately, our want, I want our goal to be to be able to do something like this. I want to be able to find the form and then be able to write out expect form to render role, or how about to contain role button, and then put in two, just to specify that I want to find two button elements inside there. So there is no built-in matcher like this inside of Jest or Jest DOM. If we want to use this matcher, we have to build it ourselves. And that's the goal. We're going to make a custom matcher here. So instead of having to write out these additional lines of code right here, we only have to write out the one single line. Now, I know that seems like it's going to be a very small reduction in code, but obviously the real goal here is to just get an example of making a custom matcher. Okay, so now that we understand the goal, we understand what we're trying to do, let's start making a custom matcher called to contain role in just a moment. Let's try making this custom matcher. To get started, I'm going to add in a new code cell right above our test. We're going to define our custom matcher inside of this code cell. To define our custom matcher, we're going to make a function and we're going to name it after what we want our matcher to be named. So in our case, we called ours to contain role. So I'm going to make a function up here called to contain role. Next up, this function is going to be called with some arguments automatically. The first argument is always going to be whatever we pass into the expect function. So in this case, we can imagine that the form is going to be teleported up and up here right there as the first element. Because we might not always be putting a form in right here, we are expected to put in an HTML element. So I'm going to call it simply element. We could also, maybe this would be a better name, call it container, because it's the element that we expect to contain some other elements. Okay. Now the other arguments that are going to show up here are going to be whatever we pass into the matcher function itself. So in this case, to contain role, we're going to call it with a string that's going to be the role we are looking for, and then the number of elements that we expect to find inside there. So I'm going to receive the role as an argument called simply role, and then quantity. To make our custom matcher function a little bit more flexible, imagine that we might eventually want to find just one button inside of here. And it might be just a little bit tedious to make people always put in a one right there. So again, just to make it a little bit more flexible, I'm going to assign quantity a default value of one. So I'll put in equals one right there. So now if anyone ever calls our matcher with just a role, we're going to assume that they only are trying to find one instance of an element with that role. But in this case, of course, we are trying to find two. Okay. Now inside of our custom matcher function, we're going to put in some implementation in just a moment. But first, let me show you how to connect this function to the expect function, how we can add it as a brand new matcher. Really simple to do so. All we have to do is call expect extend and then put in an object with to contain role. And that's it. So now expect understands that there is a new custom matcher available. All right, now it's time for us to do some implementation. To make use of our custom matcher or to have it actually do something, we are going to do some number of checks inside of here. The checks that we're going to add in really just come down to what custom matcher we're trying to implement. So for you and I, we will probably want to write out some queries. We want to take a look inside of this container, find all the elements with a given role, 
and then make sure that we found the appropriate number. If everything kind of matches up correctly, if we find the correct number of elements with the correct role, then we are going to return an object with a pass property of true. As soon as I do that, you'll notice that our test now he down here is now passing. So pass means everything is good past the test. If we put in a pass of false, we are also going to put in a message property that is going to be a function that is going to return a string or something to describe exactly what went wrong. So maybe we could put in a message of something like the container did not contain two buttons. And obviously we would probably want to customize that message a little bit more based upon the role and quantity that were passed in. But you can see down here that now our test is failing because we have a pass of false and the message that we are returning right here is gonna show up inside the failed test message. Okay, so that's the general idea. You just return an object, it's gonna have a pass of true, of true or a pass of false along with a message function. So now I'm gonna delete that and we're gonna put in some actual logic here. So we want to look inside the container and we want to try to find some number of elements matching that role and that quantity. So here's the actual implementation. The first thing I'm going to do is take a look at quantity. So it's one in this case. I'm going to attempt to find all the elements with that role and I'm gonna make sure, I'm gonna to check to see if it has that quantity or if we got that number. So I'm going to do a const elements. We're gonna look within the container element and I'm going to do a git or how about a query all by role. We're going to look for whatever role was passed in. I'll then check to see if elements.length is equal to the quantity that was passed in. And if it is, let's just go ahead and return with a pass of true, because everything is looking good. Otherwise, if we get past the if statement, we can return a pass of false and put in a message. And this time we're gonna customize the message a little bit to describe exactly what went wrong. So I'm gonna put in a template string. Notice the back ticks here, not single quotes. And I'll say expected to find, and I'll put in quantity, role, elements, and then found elements dot length instead. Okay, that looks good. So now we're going to go back on down. And you'll notice that our test is passing. To make sure that our matcher actually is working as expected, we could try to find maybe one button. And if we try to do that, well, yep, we get a nice error. If we try to find 10 buttons, okay, that's gonna work. If we try to find zero buttons, yep, looks good. If we try to find maybe zero links, that's going to work because, well, we don't have any links. If we try to find 10 links, yep, that's gonna work as well. Okay, so this is looking pretty good. I think that we've got a custom matcher put together. And even though it's a very small amount of automation that we've added in here, hey, at least it's something. So this is looking good. Again, we could go spend a lot more time around matchers and take a look at the full list that are included in Jest and Jest Dom. But I really just want to spend a little bit of time to help you understand how to make a custom matcher because this is a little bit more high value. Than I think memorizing a big list of matchers is. Attached to the text lecture right before this one, you should have found a file called codesplain.zip. Make sure you download that file. You're going to need it in this video. Inside of the zip file is a little starter project. So it contains some existing React project I put together just for us. We're going to take a look at this project in this video. We're going to test it out, understand what it does. And then as you guess in the coming videos, we're going to add in a complete ton of tests around it. So in this video alone, just a little bit of setup, and I want to show you what the project is all about. To get started, I'm going to go over to my terminal where we have been running our tests. I'm going to stop the test runner with a control C and then close that terminal window. I'm also going to find the terminal window that is running my React development server. And I'm going to stop that with a control C as well. Once I've shut those things down, I'm then going to find that 
codesplain.zip file. I'm going to extract it. And then wherever I extracted that folder to on my computer, I'm going to change into that directory at my terminal. So I'm going to go and find that folder. Here it is right here for me. Again, you're going to have to navigate to it on your computer at the terminal. Once you've changed into that directory, do a npm install to install all dependencies for the project. For me, this command is going to run very quickly. For you, it might take a couple of minutes. That is totally fine. Once you have installed all dependencies, then go ahead and start up the development server with a classic npm run start. Now, when you run this project, there are two separate servers running. One is the React development server. There's also an API that is running on port 8000. If you have any other servers running on your computer right now, you might get an error around a port already being in use. So please make sure if you scroll up through the logs here, you should not see any errors or anything like that saying that a port is in use. You might get a warning message around some middleware stuff. That is totally fine. You can ignore the warning. Once you've started everything up, you should see a page like this appear at localhost 3000. So again, this is the application I put together for us. It's already got a good amount of functionality in it. I'm going to show you what the functionality is and what this application does right now. And in the coming videos, like I said, we're going to add in some tests. We're also going to add in some completely new features as well. So we're both adding tests, we're adding in features, and we're then going to test those features. Right now, like I said, let's just understand what this project is all about. So right here, I'm at the landing page. I'm going to go up to the top right hand side and find a little box called search repositories. And in there, I'm going to search for React. Now, when you do a search, you are searching over all the different public repositories that are hosted on github.com. So everything you see right here, these are real repositories from, Re from GitHub. I'm going to find the first one, which is for the real open source repository for React itself and click on it. Once I do so, I'm going to be taken to a code editor. This code editor is showing you all the different files and folders inside of the official React repository. I'm going to scroll down a little bit on the left-hand side and find a file called dangerfile.js and open it up. Now inside of here, you'll notice that there is a lot of code and some of it is a little bit mysterious. In particular, right here, there's something about a, I don't know, kilobyte formatter, kind of strange code. So let me show you the real purpose of this entire application. The goal of this app is to browse open source repositories, look at the code inside them. And then once you find some code that is a little bit mysterious, we're going to highlight it. So I'm going to highlight that segment of code right there. That's a little bit strange. And I'm going to click on the button at the bottom right hand corner that says explain code. When I click on that, I'll get a little pop up. And then after a couple of seconds, I'll see a explanation of this code. So that's what this is right here. When you click on that button, the code that you selected is being sent off to a code analyzing AI, essentially. I hate using the term AI, but that's pretty much what it is. This chatbot of sorts is going to analyze the code that you highlighted and try to come up with an explanation for the code, try to explain what it does. And in some cases, it's really, really good. And it can give you a really good insight or a good idea of what the code is doing. In this case, I don't think this was a very good explanation. Let me try a different one right here. Maybe this one. So I'm going to highlight it. I want to know what this code does. So I'm going to click on explain code. Yeah, that's better. So now I've got a kind of interesting example or description of what the code does. And it should be fairly accurate, to be honest. It kind of surprises me rather frequently with how well it kind of explains code. So that's it. That is this application. It's all about browsing open source repositories hosted on github.com. You can take a look at all the files and folders inside the repository and then highlight some text, click on explain code, and it gives you a description of what that code is doing. Naturally, this project also has some authentication stuff tied to it. Lots of odds and ends, things like that. And like I said, we're going to add in a couple of additional features as well. So that's pretty much it. That's what this app does. Now we've got a better idea of what the application is doing. We're going to take a quick pause, come back in just a moment. I'm going to give you more of a technical overview on this project, help you understand how it's all put together. And then we're going to start to add in some tests to it. As I promised, I'm going to give you a very quick technical overview on this project and just help you understand some of the different libraries that go into it. As you probably guessed, we're going to have to have a fair good idea of how the application works in order to test it. So quick overview, here we go. 
All right, first off, on the left-hand side, we've got a classic Create React App Generated Application. So this is the same base you would get if you generated a new React app right now today. As you guess, of course, there's React in there. For navigation between these different pages, we're using the React Router Library. There's a lot of data fetching that goes on. So every time that you browse or search for different repositories, every time you navigate to a repository, every time you open up a folder or a file, data fetching is occurring. For all this data fetching, I'm using two different libraries. One is called SWR, the other is called Axios. Axios is being used to fetch actual data. SWR is kind of a coordination layer. So it's taking data that has been fetched by Axios and serving it up or making it available to React components. There's another wide variety of different small libraries inside of the React application. So it's using Tailwind CSS for styling, for example. It has a couple of different icon libraries. Well, really just two. And there's a couple of other assorted libraries in there as well, just natural stuff that's required in a typical React application. There's a lot of stuff going on on the back end as well. So right now on your computer, as a part of the starter project, there is an Express API running on port 8000. This Express API is handling things like authentication. It's storing a lot of data inside of a local SQLite database. I'm only using SQLite here so that you do not have to set up a more heavy duty database like Postgres or MongoDB or something like that. The Express API is also making use of a second API, which is hosted somewhere online on a public cloud server by me. This outside API is what is providing access to the GitHub API and something called the OpenAI API. That is where the code is actually being analyzed and then a response or kind of explanation is being sent back to you. The Express API still has a good amount of functionality in it. The Express API, we're not really going to test too much because, again, this is a course about React testing, not Express. But don't worry, we are really, really going to have our hands full with just testing the React app alone. Now, quick note here. This is really, really important. I cannot repeat this enough. If you are not familiar with React Router, if you have never heard of SWR, or if there's some other library that I'm going to eventually reference that you have not used before, Good. That is all I can say. If you have not heard of some of these things, that is so fantastic. I want that. I don't want you to really be too familiar with a lot of stuff that is going on inside this project. The reality here, and we're going to spend a lot of time talking about this in the coming videos, the reality is that you're not always testing code that you just wrote yourself. On real professional projects, there's going to be an incredible amount of time that you spend writing tests that's going to involve code that has been written by other engineers. And in so many cases, that is going to be possibly bad code. It's going to be hard to understand. It's going to be complicated. So if I just gave you a course here and I said, hey, let's write some code and then immediately test it, that would kind of be dishonest on my part because that doesn't really reflect reality. The reality is you very often have to spend time understanding other engineers' code in order to test it. And that's really the goal here behind this project. I want you to learn not only how to test code, but also to go through the process of understanding how other people's code works. And that's what we're going to focus on in the coming videos. How can we find code inside an existing React project, somehow change it, test it, and make sure that it works. Okay, so that's kind of my pep talk, just to be clear. So again, if some of this, these libraries are confusing, really, that is, that's good. That is okay. Don't sweat it. All right, we got a lot of work ahead of us. So we got kind of a overview on what is going on here. So let's start to dive into some nuts and bolts. We're going to understand what we're going to test in the coming videos in just a moment. All right, my friends, as I mentioned just a moment ago in this video, we're going to expand upon this idea that sometimes testing is really about figuring out and understanding how code works when it's been written by other engineers. So in this video, I'm going to lay out a plan on what we're going to do on this application, the code splaying app, and how we're going to get a better idea of testing by working on it. All right, so a couple of diagrams here, really quick stuff. So a lot of people, even you in this course, might think that testing is all about writing some code for some brand new feature that has never existed before, and then immediately writing some tests around it, having just written the code that you're trying to test. And in the process of writing those tests, you're going to find it really easy because you just wrote that code a moment ago and you have a perfect understanding of how it works. In reality, this is just plain not what happens. Yeah, of course, it's going to happen every now and then, 
But in the vast majority of cases, you are going to be working on features that involve other features that other engineers have already put together. It is rare for you to start a brand new project that doesn't interact with anyone else's code and have to immediately test it. Instead, here's what really happens. Here's what goes on in reality at just about every software engineering company in existence. So the reality is someone at your company is going to develop a feature and they're going to deploy it. Users are going to use that feature and they're going to start to complain about bugs in it. So they're going to reach out to your company. They're going to reach out to your company's support team and say, hey, there's this bug. I keep on getting an error message whenever I try to do X, Y, Z. And the support team is going to maybe initially try to give users a workaround to that bug. But eventually the su support team might get a little bit tired of having to tell people how to fix this bug all the time. So they're going to turn around and tell a project manager at your company about this bug and say, hey, our users keep on running into this issue. We really need to get it fixed. The project manager then is going to turn around and tell an engineering manager, so one of your software engineering bosses, that there's a bug and the bug needs to be fixed. The engineering manager then in turn is going to tell you, one of the engineers, that you need to fix the bug. And at this point in time, when the engineering manager has been told that there's a bug that needs to be fixed and they've told you that it's your job to fix it, we are now like four levels removed in communication. So everything started off with the user running into a bug. The user probably doesn't understand really what the bug is. They just know that something is not working correctly. They're then telling a support team. The support team might not really know what's going on. The support team is then telling a project manager. Project manager is telling the engineering manager. And by that point in time, all the details, all the understanding of what the actual bug is, well, it might've been lost. So you might be told to fix something and you might not even really be getting a good definition of what the problem is and what the expected behavior is. And without a doubt, you're probably not going to be told how to fix it either. So you're going to have to sit down. You're going to have to come up with a process for finding the bug, find the code, find the relevant files, understand what the bug is, understand how to fix it. And then very often, the real key here is that after fixing the bug, we want to write a test. And the goal of writing a test is to confirm that the bug is actually fixed so that you can say to those users all the way back up here at step one, hey, users, bug is fixed. We're very confident that it is fixed and the bug is not going to repeat itself at some point in time in the future. So you can start to see some of the big issues here that start to arise. Once again, you might not be given a lot of details about the issue. You're probably not going to be told exactly where the issue is inside the code base. You're probably not going to know how the code works and you're probably not going to know how to even test it to make sure that it is fixed. So in the coming videos, we're going to start to go through this entire process together. So you and I, in the coming videos, we're going to pretend that we are engineers working on the Codesplain project. That's the name of the project we are working on. It's called Codesplain. We're going to receive some fake bug reports. I put them together, but we're going to pretend that they are real. And these bug reports are very often going to have not a lot of information attached to them. So they're not going to tell us directly precisely what file a bug is in. Instead, I'm going to show you some techniques on how we can figure out where a bug might exist. We're going to try to track the bug down. We're going to try to fix it. And then of course, along the way, the unending focus here, because this is the point of the course, we're going to understand how to write code and write tests around it. Again, that is the entire point of the course. Obviously, I really want you to walk away from this understanding everything there is about testing, but I also want you to understand why we write tests in the first place, because why we write tests hugely shapes the kind of tests we write. Okay, so that's it. That's the plan. We're going to tackle our first bug in just a moment. I'm really excited about this video because we're going to go through the process of receiving a fake bug report. Yeah, it's fake, but we're going to pretend it's real. And we're going to figure out a process to track down the source of this bug, fix it, and then write a test to confirm it is fixed. You'll notice that between the last video and this one, I've opened up my code editor inside the Codesplain project directory. Make sure you open up your code editor in here as well. All right, once you've got that open, we're going to first begin by taking a look at a fake bug report. So we're going to imagine that this is a bug report that has been provided to you, a software engineer, working on the Codesplain project. Inside of this bug report, we're going to be given a little bit of information around some bug, hopefully a screenshot or two, hopefully something to say what the 
expected behavior of the application is. And then it's really just up to us to figure out how to solve this, how to fix it. So this is a very real world experience right here. This is exactly what you will go through on a job. So in this case, I'm using a GitHub project. I'm using this to kind of record and present bug reports. You might use totally different bug reporting software. It really doesn't matter. At the end of the day, you're going to be given some document, some page to go to, which might have a title. It gives a brief description of a bug, possibly some steps on how to reproduce or experience the bug on a given project, what the expected outcome is. So basically what a user wants to see and what is currently happening. So this is usually going to describe exactly what the bug is. In this case, the bug report also includes a screenshot to help clarify what the goal is or what we're trying to fix. In this particular bug, let's kind of read it through really quickly. So the title is the list of repositories should show the repositories main language. You'll notice right away that it doesn't really say, well, how you reproduce the bug or where to find this bug in the application. So we're clearly going to have to read more to understand how to find this. In this case, we can follow through the steps to reproduce. So it says enter a search term. Right away, you'll notice it doesn't say where we are entering the search term into. But you and I can probably infer that it's talking about entering a search term up here on the top right hand side. So we're supposed to enter a search term and then press enter. Well, let's do that really quickly in our own project. So I'm going to enter in, say, React, press enter, and then I get a list of repositories presented. Okay, that's a good start. So now the expected result is that we should see some search results. You and I definitely do right now. And for each repository listed, we should see the number of stars that the repository has, the number of issues, forks, and most importantly, the primary language used in the repository. So just so you know, a little bit of backstory, all GitHub repositories, I shouldn't say all, I think there might be corner cases, but most GitHub repositories have a listing that records the primary programming language used in that repository. So we expect to see the primary language used in the repository, but right now the search results are visible, but it's not showing the primary language. And then down here, there's a screenshot to very clearly illustrate the issue. Underneath the description for each repository is the number of stars, the number of issues, the number of forks, but it doesn't print out or say what the primary language used in the repository is. So I think that in this particular case, the bug is kind of clear, and we can probably very quickly get an idea of what the problem is, and we can probably start to think about how to fix it. So let's now continue. We're going to walk through a couple steps on how we can really approach this issue and figure out how to fix it most efficiently. Okay, step one of the bug fixing process, and this is always the most critical step. We have to find the relevant component in the code base. So clearly, somewhere inside of our code base, there is a component that is printing out this listing of repositories. A very good first place to do some bug fixing is to try to find that particular component. So we need to find the component that is printing out that list of repositories. Now I've got some strategies on how we can find a relevant component right here in this diagram. So step one, one possible way that we can find the relevant component in this case is to use the React Developer Tools. The React Developer Tools is a Chrome extension also available on Firefox. It adds in an additional panel to your developer console. It just makes it easy to browse through all the different components in a React project. If you do not have these installed already, you can navigate to that address. If you're using Chrome, if you're using Firefox, you can just search for React Developer Tools and you'll see an extension you can install. So if I'm using that extension, and I am in this case, I can open up my Chrome Developer Tools. I'm going to open a little expander right here and go to Components. So that selection is going to be made available only because I have the React Developer Tools installed. I'll then be presented with the entire component hierarchy. So I can see all the different components that are in use in this project right now. On the top left-hand side, you'll notice there are two arrows here. The upper arrow is to browse through the different HTML elements visible on the screen. That's kind of the default selection. The lower one right here is to select a given element and try to find the component that is producing it. So that's the one we want in this case. So I'm going to click on this and then hover over the text down here. And I'm hovering over this text because this is the text where we expect to see the programming language listed for a repository. As soon as I hover over this stuff down here, I'll see in the component hierarchy which component is rendering that content. So in this case, it appears that it is a repositories summary. That's the name of the component that is producing, in fact, that entire line, all the text right there. 
So I think that a very good, very logical first place to start do some debugging is by taking a look inside of our code editor and finding the repositories summary component. So let's open up our code editor and we're gonna to try to find that component. Now, one way we could do this is of course, to just browse through everything inside the SRC directory, but we might have hundreds or even thousands of different components. So a much more effective way is to just search for it. We can either search for it by doing a command or control shift F and then searching for repositories summary. And it looks like we will see a couple of results right away. There's a file called repository summer summary right there. Another slightly faster way of doing this on your keyboard, you can press command P or if you are on windows control P and you can type in the name of a file to navigate to inside of your project. So I want to find repositories summary. And there it is right there. So I can click on it and open up that component file. So pretty quickly, we have found the component related to the bug. Now we can continue on. I want to very quickly show you another couple possible ways we can find a relevant component. This will be really, really fast. Don't worry. Another possible way we can find the relevant component is by taking a look at some actual HTML or text or icons or even class names that the component is producing. So for example, you and I know that we are trying to debug something or some content related to a component that is producing this HTML right here. You'll notice that in this HTML, there's the text issues need help. So we could do a search over our entire code base for a string of issues need help. And we might be able to find what component that text is being rendered by. So for example, back inside my editor, I will do a global search. So again, that's a command or control shift F for issues need help. And sure enough, I get one result. It is the repositories summary file. So the same file that we just found a moment ago. Two other ways. If an error is being thrown, we're not getting an error in this case, but if there is some distinct error being thrown, we can of course look at the stack trace. So it will hopefully tell us exactly what file contains the code that is throwing an error. So we look that up inside of our browser console. And of course we can always just ask another engineer, but usually that's kind of what we want to put down lower priority. We always want to solve problems or attempt to solve problems ourselves. We're only going to fall back to asking other engineers if we just can't really seem to figure out what is going on within a reasonable amount of time. All right. So at this point in time, we have found the relevant component. We know exactly, maybe not exactly, but we've got a good idea of what component we might need to change to solve this problem. So let's move on to step two. And we're going to pick up speed here in the coming videos. Don't sweat it. So step two, and hopefully a little bit more than that in the next one. Step two in our bug fixing process. It is very clear that we have one single component that is producing the stars, the forks, the number of issues, all that stuff, and printing it out on the screen. It is the repository summary component. So we probably need to figure out how this component works. And a really good way to get started with that is by taking a look at all the state, the props, and otherwise what data it is receiving. So we can do that very easily by going back over to our component file. And again, we're going to find repositories summary. You'll notice that I have not even really expanded the relevant folder on the left-hand side. I want you to get used to kind of navigating and searching for files without really having to crawl through all these directories, because on larger projects, you're going to see navigating through a bunch of different folders is really tedious. And sometimes it gets really messy. So if you get lost at any point in time, if you accidentally close the repositories summary file, remember you can always hit command P or control P and research for repositories summary. So inside this component, we need to figure out where its prop state, all of its data is really coming from. Luckily, in this particular case, this component is very, very simple. As you glance at this, you'll notice right away, there is no state. There's no context. Doesn't look like there's anything like Redux or anything like that involved. It is solely a piece of data that is coming in through the prop system, something called repository. Off this repository object, we are immediately destructuring off a couple of different properties. They are called stargazers count, open issues, and forks. And as I double click on these to select them, I can also see that the use of these variables are highlighted later on down inside the file. So clearly right away, I can tell that the number of stars that this repository has, the number of issues and the number of forks is coming from this 
repository object. So that is the number of stars right there, the number of issues, and the number of forks. Remember that the bug that we are trying to fix is to make sure that we list out the primary language of this repository next to those numbers. So if that repository object that we just saw has some information about the repository, chances are, stands to reason, it might also have a property that tells us what the primary language of the repository is as well. You'll notice that at this point, I'm not even really that concerned with what stars are or issues or forks. I haven't really explained what those are in the context of GitHub. I normally would in a course, but in this case, I just want to point out, I'm not really explaining that because it's not really super relevant for fixing the bug. All we really need to understand here is that our component is trying to print out some information from the repository object. Our component needs to print out some more information. It needs to also print out this language property. So chances are this additional information is probably going to come from that repository object. So right away, I'm kind of homing in on that object. I think that object might be very relevant in our bug fixing process. So once we have kind of narrowed our searcher here a little bit, and we've kind of figured out the piece of data that we are really concerned about, there's a couple of ways we can investigate that data further and understand whether or not it's going to help us in fixing this bug. So here's a couple of ways we can very easily understand the data we are working with. One possible way, just do a simple console log. Another possible way, we can set a debugger. I'm going to show you all these very quickly. We can also use the React developer tools if the data we are trying to investigate is coming from the prop system or state system. And yet another way, the data that we are currently trying to print out on the screen, and a lot of the data that you try to print out in real applications, it's coming into React application through network requests. So we can always try to take a look at our network request log, try to figure out which request is producing or kind of serving up the information that our component is using, and then just look at the raw request and understand what data is being served up to the React app. So I'm going to show you all four of these approaches very, very quickly. So approach number one, a simple console log. Inside of repository summary, if we can, yep, very simply, console log, the repository object. Then back over at the browser, I'm going to make sure my console is open. And there's the console log. You'll notice that we get many different console logs. It is because we are currently showing many copies of that repository's summary component. Each of these different items is a repository summary. So I can pick pretty much any one at random. I'm going to go up to the very first one myself. If I expand this object, I'll see all the different properties that the repository object has. And right away, I'll notice that there are a tremendous number of different properties. That's fine. Let's just look through it really quickly and see if there's anything relevant for our purposes. As I scroll down, I'll notice pretty quickly, hey, how about that? So it turns out that the repository object has a language property. In this case, it is JavaScript. That seems really relevant because we are supposed to print out the language of the repository on this listing right here next to all these other little facts about the repository. So right away, I see that the repository object has a language property. Yeah, that's probably relevant. That's probably the piece of information that we want to print out. We might take a look at another one of these repository objects and just confirm that they all have that language property. So I'm going to pick out another one of the objects. Yep, it also has language right there. I'm going to pick out another one at random. And yep, this one has a language as well. All three of the ones I've looked at now have a language of JavaScript. So I might try searching for a completely different kind of repository, something that is not React. How about something related to Python? And by doing this, we can just confirm that the language property is going to change for these different kinds of repositories. So if I search for Python and then pick an object at random and scroll down, there's language. In this case, it's null. So that makes me a little bit worried. It makes me think that, well, maybe these do not all have a assigned language. Well, let's check another one. Here's another one down here. This one has a language of Python. So at least somewhat, some number of time, it looks like this language property is going to be assigned, and it probably is the data we care about. All right, so that's how we can address this using a simple console log. Like I said, one other possible way, we can put in a debugger. If you're not familiar with a debugger, totally fine. We write out the keyword debugger. And then over inside the browser, if our console is open, as our component is executed, 
we're going to stop execution of our code at that debugger statement. We can then press Escape on our keyboard to open up our console. And now at this debugger statement, we can print out and work with all the different variables that are in the current scope. So for example, in the console, I can write out repository, and that will print out the current value of the repository prop that flowed into our component. So now I can take a look at, say, repository.language, and again, confirm that there is in fact a language. In this case, it is Python. All right, the other two ways we could do this. Oh, one other thing really quickly here. Once you have set a debugger, you'll notice that I can keep continuing execution of my code by clicking on the blue arrow right here. But because I have many different repositories, I keep on pausing on the debugger statement. To get this to go away, I can just close my browser console, go back over to my editor, and remove the debugger and save the file. So just closing the console will stop the debugger process. Okay, two other ways very quickly here. So we can use the React Developer Tools. So once again, inside of our console, I'm going to go to Components. I'm going to click on that repository's summary component, or the text generated by it. And then I'll notice right away that if I click on repository summary, the actual component in the listing on the right-hand side, I'll see the props that this component has received. So in this case, it received a prop of repository. So I can expand it, take a look at the object. Once again, I'll see very quickly, it has that language property. Finally, we can take a look at the network request log. We're going to do this one very quickly as well. So inside of my network request log, I can filter by fetch and XHR requests. I can then trigger a search request, which I can do by typing in just some repository I want to search for, like let's say React. We are using a library called SWR to fetch data for this application, and it does some aggressive data caching. So you'll notice that when I search for React, I didn't actually get any requests here. That's fine. Just to force the request, I can always just refresh the page. I'll now see that there are two requests being made whenever I load up the page. One around a user, that's probably not relevant, and another to fetch a list of repositories. So if I click on that, I'll notice that it has on this preview tab, a list of items. So I can expand that. And we'll notice right away, this looks like those same kind of repository objects. So I can scroll down. And again, I can confirm that these different repositories have a language property. Okay, I know this video has been a little bit laborious, but clearly there are many different ways to understand the structure of data that is flowing into our component, even if the component is not well documented. So we can use these strategies to figure out what data is available. And as you guess, it's going to be really valuable for eventually fixing our bug. As we went through the last video, I know it's a little bit tedious and you might've been thinking to yourself, all right, Steven, I get it. We can understand the data or whatever. And it might've seen not at all relevant to testing. You might be saying, Steven, why are you covering this stuff in a testing course? Well, in this video, we're gonna test or we're gonna write out a test for our component and we're going to eventually fix it. And in this process, you're going to realize really quickly that writing a test for our component really, really depends upon the steps that we just went through. As a matter of fact, if we didn't go through these steps, writing an effective test would be really challenging, even in the context of this video. I was kind of dreading earlier on how I would explain what the structure of a repository object is and what properties exist inside of it. Like as I was making videos a couple of videos ago, I was thinking, okay, how am I gonna explain what a repository object looks like? But because you and I went through the process of understanding the data, you already understand what those repository objects contain. You understand that they contain things like that language property and so on. So again, it's going to make the testing so much easier. Okay, so with all that in mind, let's get to it. Now, I know on this diagram right here, I said, let's implement a fix and then test it. But you know what? Let's reverse it. Let's try first writing out a test. We're going to write a test to render the repository summary component, and we're going to make sure that it prints out a language. And then after that, we, we will run the test. We'll make sure it's failing to start. We will then fix the component and then run the test again, make sure that it is passing. Okay, let's get to it. So step one, back inside of our editor. Remember, we are trying to fix or make a change to a repository summary. So I want to add to this thing's test file if one exists. If a test file does not exist for the component, we need to create it. I'm gonna first figure out where this component lives inside the project. 
And I can do so very easily by right clicking the tab at the top and then clicking on Reveal in Explorer View. So that's going to expand the folder that the file lives in. It looks like there's no test file related to this yet. So I'm going to make a new file inside the same directory called repositories summary.test.js. And then from here, it's going to be writing out a test absolutely identical to what we've done in the previous section. So at the top, we're going to add in some imports for screen and render from at testing library slash react. We need to import the component itself. And we're going to double check the spelling on repositories because it is a tricky little word. So please do double check the spelling. And then we're going to write out a test to confirm that our bug fix is going to work. So I'm going to write out a test that says something like it displays the primary language of the repository. Then inside the test, we can render our component. And when we render our component, remember, this component absolutely expects to receive a repository object. Inside the component definition, here's repository summary right here. The first thing this component does is receive that prop and then attempts to destructure some properties off of it. So if we do not provide a repository object, then our component is going to instantly crash. It's going to say something like cannot destructure properties off of undefined or something like that. So we need to provide a repository object that has all the different properties that this component expects to receive. So a stargazer's count, an open issues, a forks, and presumably a language property as well. Because remember that language is what we are really trying to print out. So right above the render statement, I'm going to make a fake repository object. And we know that it must have a language because that's what we are trying to display on the screen. I'm going to give it a language of JavaScript. We know based upon reading the component itself that it must have a stargazer's count, open issues, and forks as well. So we need to add in a stargazer's underscore count, forks, and an open underscore issues. And you'll notice I'm putting in numbers here. I'm just making these up on the fly. The numbers don't really matter for this particular test. I just want to get some number that I can print out on the screen. Once I create that repository object, I'm then going to pass it as a prop down into our component. And based upon reading the component itself, we know that the prop must be called repository. Once we have rendered this, now it's time to actually do a test. So we're going to try to find an element. We've gone through those query functions a little bit so far. And then once we find hopefully this language printed out on the screen, well, then we're going to just make sure that that element exists. So let me show you how we're going to do this. We're going to use a query function. Remember, query functions are the ones that allow us to find elements that our component is rendered. We're going to use a query function we have not used before. Don't worry, you're going to understand what it does instantly based upon the name, but we'll go into more detail on it in a little bit. So I'm going to say language is screen.get by text. And I'll put in JavaScript. And yeah, I bet you can guess what this function does really, really quickly. It's going to try to find some element visible on the screen that has the text JavaScript inside of it, exactly JavaScript. And I'm putting in exactly JavaScript right here because that is what I passed in as the language on this repository object. So now we can write out an assertion very similar to ones we've done previously. I'm going to expect language to be in the document. So essentially, it should be rendered by our component. And that's it. That's our test. So we're going to run our test. And of course, right now, our test is going to fail because our component is not printing out the language. We'll then fix the component and then make sure the test is passing. To run the test, we're going to do the same thing we did on our previous project. Back over at our terminal, I'm going to open up a second terminal window. So I've now got two. The one on the left is running our development server. The one on the right is a new terminal window inside of my CodeSplain project directory. And we're going to run our tests with an npm run test. We can see right away that our repository summary component has been rendered. It looks like the test is failing. Let's inspect why it is failing really quickly. So we'll scroll up. And you'll notice that it says cannot find an element with the text JavaScript. That's good. 
We expected this to fail. We expected to be unable to find anything that says JavaScript. So now that we've got our test in place, we can go and fix our component. Back over inside my editor, I will go to the component definition. So here's our component file right here. And remember the goal of this entire bug fix, we're just trying to print out the language. So from the repository object, we know this thing based upon all of our debugging, we know it has that language property. So I'm gonna destructure that off. I'll then add in another div down here and I'm just gonna print out the language. That's it. That's all we had to do to fix this bug. We just wanted to get the language visible on the screen. We'll then save this. And then there's two ways we can make sure that this fix works. We can either run our test or we can go check it out on the browser. I have huge faith in our test. So I'm gonna go and check the test first. And if I go over to my terminal, yep, sure enough, the test is passing. So that's very good. I can also check inside the browser. So over here, I'll see that now next to every repository, I see JavaScript, 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 TypeScript, and so on. So that's it. So now that we have fixed up our bug, we can mark this original bug fix as being complete. We have fixed up the bug we were trying to fix, and we've added in a test to make sure that it was in fact fixed. But before we move on, I would like to add in a couple more checks to this test. Right now, we are only making sure that a given language is present in the document, but there are many other properties that should be printed out from a repository as well. So we should see on the screen the number of stars that a repository has, the number of forks, and the number of issues as well. So as long as we are writing out a test and checking for the existence of one property, we might as well check for the existence of the others. So let's take a look at one or two different ways of doing this. To get started, I'm gonna first update the description of the test. We are no longer just checking to make sure that the primary language is present. We're really checking to see that this component is printing out many different pieces of information from a repository. So I'm gonna change the test description to something like displays information about the repository, something just a little bit more generic. So now here's the first way that we could add in some code and make sure we're printing out information about all these different properties. We could really just do the same thing we've done down here, just repeat it a couple more times. So for example, we could say const stars is screen get by text. And in this case, there should be five stars on the project. So we could do a get by text of five. Now we can also expect stars to be in the document. Okay, let's save this and just make sure we're going down the right path. So over at our terminal, yep, looks like the updated test has passed. Now, as you can imagine, we can just repeat this over and over, and eventually we would have four separate queries and four different assertion statements. That's definitely one possible way we could do this, but well, it would just be a lot of repetitive code inside this test. And it would be even more repetitive if we had say 20 different pro properties in this repository and we were printing them all out and we wanted to test every single one. So here's a little bit more concise way of doing this. Instead of writing out a ton of different query functions and a ton of different assertions, we could just loop over all the different key value pairs on this object right here and expect to find every value present inside the document. So let me show you how we would do that. A little bit more concise way of writing this out. I'm going to delete the existing queries and assertions we have and replace it with a single for loop. I'm going to loop over all the different keys inside this object. And remember when we are looping over key value pairs in an object, we do a for in loop. So in is when we want to go over the keys on an object. So now key is going to be language, then stargazers count, then forks, then open issues. To look up and find the particular value, we would say repository at key. So now we can write out a very sim similar query function to what we did just a moment ago. We can say const element is screen get by text with value. And then we can uh, make an assertion and just make sure that this element is in the document. Make sure that it is being rendered by our component. So we will expect element to be in the document. All right, so let's save this. Once again, quick test. And I can tell you right now, unfortunately, it's not going to pass. So if we flip back over, we're going to see that our test is now failing. A little bit unexpected. Kind of would have expected everything to work out just fine. 
Well, let's pause right here, come back in just a moment, and debug our test a little bit to understand what is going on. Our test is failing. We need to do a little bit of debugging. So at my terminal, I'm going to scroll up to the very top and find the reason that the test is failing. So it says right here that we were unable to find an element that has the text 30. Right underneath that, we'll see a printed representation of what our component is currently rendering onto the screen. It says that we are not able to find the text 30. And if we go back over to our test, we can see that 30 is tied to the number of forks. So we can take a look at the HTML that our component is printing up right here and just confirm that yes or no, 30 is present or it's not. And if I scroll down a little bit, we'll see a div right here. And in fact, it says 30. But the reason our test is failing is that whenever we use that get by text query, we are really looking at all of the text inside of a single element at a time. So 30 is present, but what's actually present in the element overall is 30 forks. So if we just try to find an element with 30, it's not going to match this div right here. So because we have that extra text right there, the test is going to fail. Presumably, the same thing would happen with one issues need help as well. So how can we fix this up? Well, whenever we look for elements on the screen using the get by text query function, we can put in an exact value right here, or as we've seen a couple of times, we can put in a regular expression. We could put in something like, say, 30. And now this is going to be used as kind of a loose matcher. It's going to check and see if an element has 30 anywhere inside of it. So we kind of want to use a regular expression here, but if we just put in a hard-coded 30, well, that's not going to work for all the other elements we are trying to find. We also cannot just put in something like value right here, because if we put in value, well, again, that's going to look for the text value and not whatever our value variable is. So to get a regular expression in here, we need to make a new one on the fly, kind of a dynamic regular expression which we can do with a new reg xp, regular expression, and then put in the text that we want to find right here. Now, if we save this, we're going to have a much looser matcher. So we're going to look for any element with the number 30 in it, and it's okay if there's other text inside there. So now if we flip back over, sure enough, our test is passed. Very good. We have solved our first bug report, so it's time for us to move on to the next issue inside this code base. All right, here we go. So here's our next ticket. And you're going to notice right away that this ticket looks a little similar to the last one. It's a very good reason for that. I'm going to tell you why in just a moment. So in this bug report, we are being told that whenever we search for a list of repositories, we should see a link to the repository hosted on github.com. I'll let you read through the text right here. But the long and the short of it is that whenever we do a search for repositories, on the far right-hand side, we want to see a link right here to this repository hosted on GitHub. So essentially a link off to GitHub, not to our own applications code editor. So we really just need to show a separate link over there on the right hand side, one for each repository. Now, like I said, right away, this looks kind of similar to the last bug report we dealt with, and I want you to understand why. The real goal here around this test is, of course, just to get a little bit more experience with testing and whatnot, but it's also going to expose us to three of the much more challenging aspects of testing, and these Three items are what a huge part of this entire course is really focused on. So the first thing we're going to be seeing is module mocking. We're going to be seeing how to handle navigation in testing, which can sometimes be a little bit tricky, but it's not really as hard as the other two. And finally, dealing with the act function, which is really a big headache. I'll be honest with you, a big headache when it comes to testing. So we're not going to master these topics right now. We're just going to get kind of a exposure to them. We're just going to learn, hey, these are things that are serious issues in the world of testing, and they are things that we need to pay a lot of attention to as time goes on. So just keep this in mind. I know this, last, this bug, very similar, but the real goal here is to just get this kind of soft introduction. Okay, so let's get to it. So I think we understand the goal here. We just want to show a link off to the right-hand side. So we're going to go through the same kind of debugging process, same path, same plan here. So the first thing we need to do is find the relevant component in the code base. I know you might think that we've already been working with the relevant component, but let's just double check that. So you'll notice that whenever we do a search on the top right hand side of our application, we get a description right here, some stats underneath it, and then up top we get this little icon and a title. That's a repository title and it is a link. So with that in mind, let's go look at the component we have been working on, which is repository summary right here. And inside of this component, you'll notice that there is a star icon, 
but there's nothing about that file icon. There's also no link inside of here for the name or, or the title of the repository. There's also no description being pointed out or printed out either. So the component we've been working on is not really the component we are trying to kind of fix or add to. The component we've been working on is really only printing out the information down here towards the bottom. And it is probably a separate component that is printing out the entire row. To confirm that, there's a couple of different things we could do. So first and probably easiest, we could once again open up our React development tools on the right-hand side here or in my console. I can use the element inspector. And then you'll notice sometimes I kind of want you to see this bug. Every now and then you will click on the selector and try to click on the element and nothing will happen. If you ever have that happen to you, just refresh the page and then click the inspector again. And now I can actually take a look at these different items. So once I get my element inspector, I'm going to click on, say, just this entire row right here. And I'll see very quickly that there is another component called repositories list item. Inside there is the repositories summary, which we have been working on. So repository summary is just the stats at the bottom of the row. Repositories list item is the entire row. If we want to add a link onto all these different search results, we probably want to make a change or modify repositories list item in some way. Another way we could have figured this out is back inside of our code editor, we could have just done a search for repository summary over the entire code base and seen where it was used. So if I do a search for repository summary, I will see the current file that we are in. Let me zoom in really quickly. There we go. So there's the file we are in. There's the test file that we've been working on. And that only leaves one other possibility, repositories list item. So I think it's pretty clear that we probably want to open up this repositories list item file. And we probably want to figure out how it works and eventually add in a link that a user can click on. It's going to be displayed on the right-hand side of the row. It's going to take the user to this repository hosted on github.com. All right, so we've got the file that we are concerned with. So quick pause here, come back in just a moment. We're going to zoom through steps two through five. We found a component that is very relevant to the bug we are trying to fix. So now on to step two. We need to figure out how the component is getting its data. So state, props, context, hooks, magic, what's going on? Once again, this is a component that's going to receive a repository object through the prop system. Simple enough. So step three we need to figure out exactly what is going on with that data. Now we've already gone through this process with one of these repository objects, but this time around, we're trying to understand this data from a little bit of a different perspective. We need to show a link that is going to take a user to the repository hosted on github.com. So we need to do another inspection of this repository object, either by using our debugger, console log, or whatever else. And we need to figure out how we can use the repository object to generate a link to go over to GitHub. In this case, I'm going to keep things nice and simple. I'll just do a console log of repository. There we go. Then back inside of my browser, I'm going to open up my console. There are the console logs right there. I'm going to scroll up to the very top of the list after searching for React. There we go. And so the first console log should be for the React repository. If I now expand this object, I can scroll through all the different properties in here. And if I go down, I'll very quickly notice that there's one called HTML URL. So this property is a link to the homepage for this repository, again, hosted on github.com. That is definitely a very relevant looking address. So I think that we could probably add in a new link to our component that's going to take a user to whatever that property is right there. Okay, so that's the general idea. Now on to step four. So we're going to Put in a test first, and then we'll go back and start to implement the link inside the component itself. To get started on the testing part, back inside my editor, we need to create a new test file. I'm also going to very quickly delete that console log before I forget. There we go. So inside of our repositories directory, here is the file that we are currently working on. We need to make a test file for it. So I will make a new file called repositories list item test.js. And note that it is .test.js. Inside of our new test file, let's go through the same setup that we have done several times now. So we can import render and screen from testing library slash react. And we can also import our component itself. Mm 
There we go. Before I forget, I'm also going to go over to my terminal very quickly. And I'm going to make sure that I am running only tests for the new test file that we created. We can change our filter once again by pressing W on the keyboard, then P, and then I'm going to look for test files called repositories, repositories, there we go, list item. Right now we, don't not, we do not have any tests inside this file, no problem. We'll add in a test in just a moment. So inside of our test file, I think we really just need one test for right now. We need to make sure that the component shows a link to the GitHub homepage for this repository. I think that is a reasonable description. Inside of the test itself, we need to once again render our component, try to find a link, and make sure that the link has the correct address. We could try to render the component right here, but we might eventually start to put in additional tests inside this file. So let's use the same pattern we used in our last test file, where we define a little helper function at the very top called render component. And this function's job will be to render our component with the appropriate props. And then it's going to return the props that we used so that we can reference those props inside of our individual tests if we need to. So inside this function, I'm going to render repositories list item. And then remember, whenever we show this component, the expectation is that we are going to provide a repository object. This repository object is going to have many different properties, such as a full name, a language, a description, an owner, a name. And as we just saw in our console log a moment ago, we also kind of want to make use eventually of that HTML URL property, because that is the link that we're going to try to show inside of our JSX. So we're going to make a fake repository object inside of our test and then pass it down into our component when we render it. So right above the render statement, I will define a repository object, and I'm going to give this thing all the different properties that my component is going to expect the repository to have. So in total, that's going to be all of these right here. To save a little bit of time, I'm just going to copy those properties, go back over to the test file, paste them in, put in some new lines, and then I'm going to put in some dummy data for each of these. It's going to be dummy data, so fake data, but I'll still make it somewhat realistic. I don't need to know the exact structure of what each of these properties is, but just at a glance, I can probably assume that they're all going to be strings. So I'm going to put in some realistic sounding, yet still fake details. So full name, I'm going to assume that is the full name of the repository. I'm going to put in some data that is going to kind of fake out the Facebook React repository. So I'll put in Facebook React as the full name of the repository. I'll assume it's written with JavaScript. For a description, I can put in something like a JS library. For the owner, I'll assume it's going to be Facebook. The name, I'll assume that is the name of the repository, so that's going to be React. And then finally, the most important part for us, the HTML underscore URL. That's the one we really care about. So whatever value we put right here, we're going to eventually expect inside of our test to find a link that points to this address. So I'm going to put in a somewhat realistic looking link. It'll be HTTPS colon slash slash github.com slash Facebook React. We can then take that repository object and pass it as a prop down into our component. Okay, looks good. So now, last step right now, let's try calling that function, the render component function inside of our test. So I'm just going to call it for right now, and then we'll go back over to our terminal and just see how we are doing. Are we able to render this component correctly, or are we going to get an error that needs to be fixed right off the bat? Well, as you guess, yeah, we end up getting an error. And if we scroll up, we're going to very quickly notice that this is a pretty nasty error. There's a lot of debug text here. There's a definitely something going wrong, definitely something not very good. So we're definitely going to have to do a little bit of debugging here and figure out why we cannot even render our component by itself. We just ran our test, and as we can very easily see, we are getting a tremendous amount of error output. So I'm scrolling all the way up to the top inside of my terminal, and I see the original error messages use href can only be used in the context of a router component. 
This error is a little bit mysterious right off the bat because my component definitely does not call a function called usehref. And as I scroll down, we'll see that there are many, many, many lines of stack trace here, which again, is a little bit intimidating. But if I scroll all the way down to the very bottom and then scroll back up just a handful of lines, more than a handful, I suppose, I'll notice that there is a little bit more of a helpful error message down here. So this one says the above error occurred in the link component. Well, that is a component that is displayed inside of our repositories list item. So if we go over to repositories list item, here's the component definition. Here's the link component that the error is coming from. This link is a link to the code editor feature inside of our application. So this is an existing link to take a user around to different pages in our app. The link component is provided by the React Router DOM library. So right away, this kind of gives us a hint of what the error is talking about. Clearly, it is some issue with React Router DOM. All right, so now that we've kind of narrowed down the cause here just a little bit, let me give you some high-level notes and help you understand how we're going to fix this. So first thing I want you to understand here, and this is really going to be a very big running theme for the rest of the course. In many cases, you are working on React applications that you use outside libraries. In so many cases, as you're writing tests, these libraries are not always super happy about being executed in a test environment. And that's what we're seeing right now. We are making use of a component from React Router DOM. And by default, React Router DOM doesn't really understand that it's being executed in a test environment. So we're getting that error thrown, and the only way to fix it is to kind of make React Router DOM happy, so to speak. So again, let me kind of show you exactly what's happening here. All right, so this is our component hierarchy. Here's the repositories list item. It's going to receive a repository prop. Whenever we render our component, even though we're in a test environment, we are also rendering that component's children. So the repositories list item is going to render repository summary. That is a component we worked on a little bit ago. That one in turn renders a star icon. Our repositories list item also renders a file icon and the link component. The link component is only going to work correctly if it has a React router context available to it. So React Router, whenever we make use of it, if you're not familiar with it, we need to create something called a router. And we put this router component at the very top level hierarchy inside of our application. It's one of our top level components. This component exposes a context object to all the child components inside of our app. Anytime we use another component from React Router DOM, such as the link, that component is going to try to reach up and find the context object at the top of our component hierarchy. So right now, in our test environment, as we are rendering our application, this is all we have. These are the only components we are rendering. So in our test environment, when the link is rendered, it tries to reach up and find that context. But the context doesn't exist because we didn't create it. And so the link ends up throwing an error, exactly what we saw in our terminal, something about, hey, we need to have access to some context or a router or something like that. So in this case, it says, in particular, context of a router component. All right, so to fix this, we got a couple of different options. Whenever we render one of these different React router components, so something like a link or several others that we're going to see inside this application, even though we are in this test environment and we don't really care about navigation at all, we still have to provide one of these routers. So we have three options available to us. We can try to wrap our component that we're trying to test in a browser router, a hash router, or a memory router. Now, the details of each of these are not super relevant to our tests right now. We're going to go into more detail on them in the context of testing over time. But right now, I'm going to tell you, we're just going to go directly with using a memory router. Memory router is recommended in many articles and blog posts to be used in a testing environment. It's eventually going to have a little bit of shortcomings for our purposes. So eventually, we're going to replace it with the browser router instead. But that really is a deeper discussion that we're going to touch on later on inside the course. For right now, the entire point of this discussion, and I'm kind of going overboard by showing you even these router things right here, the whole point that I really want you to understand about this video is whenever we render our component, it's going to render all of its children. And in some cases, those children are going to be maybe provided by an outside library. And those children might try to reach up through the context system. 
or they might try to use a hook, or they might do any of a number of different things that you don't really expect them to do in a test environment. We might not want them to do these things in a test environment because it's not something we are trying to test. Nonetheless, we still have to accommodate for this, and we have to kind of make these child components, like the link, happy just so we can test the actual component we care about. That's the exact situation we are in right now. We have to add in this router thing, even though we do not care about navigation at all, just so the link is happy. Okay, so here's the solution. Back inside of our editor, I'm going to find our test. At the very top, I'm going to add in an import statement for memory router from React Router DOM. And then I'm going to find where we call render inside of the render component function. And I'm going to wrap our component with that memory router thing. There we go. So now when we render this stuff right here, essentially, we're going to create this router context. We'll then make our component. The link is going to be displayed inside there. The link is going to reach up through the context system, find the memory router right there, and basically just be happy and not throw in error. So now we should be able to save this back over to our terminal. And we're still going to get an error or a warning in this case. It is a warning. But if we go down to the bottom, you'll notice that the test itself is passing. The warning that we are getting, you'll notice that it has some text saying something about an act function right here. So you might recall, I told you about a little issue we would be running into around the act function. So that's kind of one of the next big painful topic, so to speak, that we're going to be getting into. We've got this nasty warning at our terminal, and now it's time for us to figure out what is going on with it. So in this video and the next couple, we're going to take a look at a couple of diagrams and understand what these act warnings are. Now, I want you to understand right away that understanding that warning message is a little bit challenging because we're going to have to take a look at three or four different topics. And these different topics are kind of all about different things. The other thing I want to mention right away is that you're going to see these act warnings very, very frequently if you are doing data fetching inside of a use effect function. So if you are expecting to work on an application and do some testing around anything that's going to involve data fetching inside of use effect, I really encourage you to pay attention to the next couple of videos because they're going to save you a lot of time. Okay, so here are the four important topics we're going to go over really quickly to better understand that act warning and how to fix it. So the first thing we're going to discuss is the fact that unexpected state updates in a testing environment is usually a bad thing. And of course, let me explain what I mean by that. Okay, so let's imagine that we are trying to test a very simple component. The goal of this component is to show a button. And whenever a user clicks on that button, we want to make a network request to go and fetch some data, maybe get a list of users, and then show those users on the screen. The code for a component like that might look like this right here. So we might call it users list. We'll have two different pieces of state. One could be called should load, and the other might be the list of users that we are intending to eventually fetch. Whenever a user clicks on the button, we will update set should load or update should load to be true. That will cause the use effect function to run. Inside there, we're gonna verify and make sure that should load is true. And if it is, we'll go and fetch some data. So we're gonna call this imaginary fetch users function and when we get back some data, we're going to use it to update the user's piece of state. Now, if we try to write out a very simple test around this component, I can almost guarantee you we would probably get a warning around that act function, very similar to the one we just got. So let me show you why that is. So let's imagine or kind of picture what would go on in a test that we would probably write out around a component like this. First, here's probably the kind of test we would write we would probably attempt to render our component, find the button, simulate a click on it, and then immediately try to find all the different maybe list items, make sure we actually have maybe three users or however many on the screen. Now let's imagine what would happen behind the scenes if we executed a test that looks like this. And keep in mind that fetching some user data inside of a test, well, it is going to be asynchronous in nature. We would going to simulate the data fetching process to be very, very fast. So it would take a fraction of a second to complete some data fetching request in a testing environment, but it would still take a very, very small amount of time. And just to be clear, we are going to go into data fetching and testing around it very, very shortly. All right, so here's what would probably happen inside of our test. We would simulate a click on the button. 
that would run our click event handler. We would update the should fetch piece of state. That would run our use effect function. And that would kick off our data fetching process. Now, again, it might be a fake data fetching process that we're running in our tests, and it might run very, very quickly, but it's still asynchronous. So the problem here is that after we click on that button, we're then going to immediately go down to the next line of code and try to find all the different users that presumably we have fetched and rendered out on the screen. And at that point in time, our data fetching request is still pending. We're still waiting on it to resolve. So there probably would not be any users and our test would probably fail. Then after our test failed, a very short amount of time later, that fake data request might end up finishing. We would update our state and then the users would be visible on the screen. So the point here is that because we did not really wait for that state update, because we didn't really wait for the data request to be finished, our state updated after the test already failed. And so we kind of had an unexpected state update. Our state update did not really occur when we expected it to happen inside of our tests. Okay, so that's kind of our first little bit. Having an unexpected state update in a test, it's usually bad because it's going to mean either our tests are failing when they should be passing, or they might be passing when they should be failing. So it's almost always a bad thing. So now that we understand the first point, let's move on to step two in just a moment. All right, next important item for us to understand around these act warnings. So in this one, we're going to understand that the act function, this is a function that is implemented by React DOM. It defines a window in time where a state update can and should occur inside of one of our tests. So again, let me show you a couple diagrams to help you understand this. All right, so we just went over this kind of imaginary component and some tests we would write out around it. So now I'm now going to show you another version of this imaginary test right here. And this new version is going to be written without React Testing Library. So we're going to imagine for just a moment we are not using React Testing Library at all. So here's what this test would look like, again, if we weren't using React Testing Library. We would import this act function from React DOM. We would then attempt to render our component. And anytime we try to render our component, when we are not using React Testing Library, we have to wrap it inside of an act function call. So that's what this act function looks like. We call act, we pass in a function, and then inside there, we're going to run some code that either renders our component or contains some code that's going to eventually trigger a change to our state. So something like an event or simulating an event like typing, clicking, and so on. So whenever we are not using React Testing Library, if we ever are going to run some code that's going to change our state, it must be wrapped in an act function call. Because we're using that act function, two things are going to occur. First, it's kind of giving us a window, a window in time where we can safely update our state and we're not going to see the act warning. The other thing that occurs behind the scenes, React is going to process all the pending state updates and all pending use effect functions before exiting that act function. So if we imagine that we were running our tests like this, that same kind of imaginary component, and we had added in these act function calls, here's what would happen. So we would simulate a click on the button that would run our click event handler. We would update should fetch that would run our use effect function because we updated our state inside the use effect function. We would attempt to fetch some data a small amount of time later. We would get back the fake response. We then update our state users would then be visible on the screen, check the screen for users. And then I did not update this last step down here. Users are visible. So in this case, by adding in that act function call, again, we are kind of giving ourselves a window where we are saying all state updates should be applied and should occur inside this little window of time. Now, just so you know, the test I just showed you, it would technically work, but it kind of only works on a huge, big technicality, assuming that we set up the fake data request in a very specific way. And I'm going to go more into that fact, that detail in just a little bit. So I just want you to know this code right here is a little bit tenuous. We're just kind of thanks to a couple of factors kind of like aligning together. I'll explain more on that in just a little bit. Okay, so the entire takeaway for item number two here is that this act function, it just gives us a little window in time. We can update our state in there. If any state update occurs in that period of time, React is going to be happy and we're not going to see any warnings. If we ever update our state outside of these little windows, we will end up seeing the warning that we just saw in our terminal, 
because it's a sign that our state updated when we weren't really ready for it. Okay, now that we got over number two, let's dive immediately into number three. So number three, third important item to understand here, React Testing Library is going to automatically use the act function for you, totally behind the scenes. You do not have to call act. It's a really important item that we're gonna go into a little bit more on item number four in just a moment. So let me show you what I mean by number three. Okay, so we have learned about different query functions like find by and find all by. So like find by role, find by display value, and so on. And the entire point of these find by functions are that they are asynchronous in nature. They give us a period of, by default, one second, where React Testing Library is going to watch our output from our component and see if some element appears, is not visible, or whatever else it is that we are looking for. There's another very similar function called wait for. Wait for is going to kind of open up a span of, by default, one second, and allow us to check for some condition inside of our component. We also get user keyboard and user dot click. Those are synchronous functions, so we can say immediately go and type some text or go and click on some element. They're not asynchronous. The other three are. These two are synchronous. All these different functions are going to automatically behind the scenes call act for you. They're going to call that act function and they're going to use act in the appropriate way. So whenever you try to initialize or create some kind of state change inside of your component by simulating a keyboard typing event or a click event, that is going to ultimately change your state inside of your component. So React Testing Library very helpfully is gonna call act for you inside of these different functions and say, hey, React, just so you know, some state is going to update very shortly here because we are simulating a keyboard event or a click. Same thing occurs up here with find by, find all by, and wait for as well. So whenever we are using React Testing Library, this is the preferred way of using act. We do not use the act function directly. Instead, we try to use these different functions and they kind of give us this window where our state can safely change. All right, so that is item number three. One more quick pause and then take a look at item number four. All right, we've gotten through items one through three onto item number four, and this one is by far the most important one. So anytime that we start to see these act warnings, we are not going to do what our terminal says. So your terminal is gonna give you a warning message that looks like this, the same one we just saw, and it's gonna say an update to blah, blah, blah inside a test was not wrapped in an act. And it's gonna to say to you very, very clearly, it's gonna give you directions. It's gonna say, if you want to update your state, you must do those events or you must initialize a state change inside of an act function. This is extraordinarily misleading because you're going to read this warning. You're probably going to do a Google search to figure out what the warning is trying to tell you. And you might come across some blog post or some article that says, oh yeah, write some code that looks like this. Or you might just read the terminal directly and say, clearly I need to call the act function. So the very important item to keep in mind here is that whenever you are writing your tests while using React Testing Library, you almost always do not don't. You don't want to add in a call to act inside of your test, even though the message says that you should. Instead, we should be using one of React Testing Library's functions instead. So one of these right here. So we're going to use a find by, a find all by, a wait for. And usually we're not going to do these two down here because, well, you'll see reasons for that really quickly. It's because these are synchronous in nature. And whenever you get that warning, it means that we kind of didn't capture or we didn't wait long enough for some state change to occur. Like I mentioned, we're going to most often see the warning message whenever we are doing some asynchronous operation inside of a use effect. So usually we're going to use one of these techniques to solve it. Okay, so just please keep this in mind. This is super important. You are going to see these warnings quite a bit as you are testing your own components. We're always going to address them wherever possible by making use of these different asynchronous functions to help us just kind of wait a little bit and find an element that is produced by our component. All right, so now that we've got that out of the way, one more last quick pause here, and we're going to go back to our test and figure or fix it up by using one of these functions. We got some more information around the act function now and a vague idea of what's going on here. So I'm going to show you how to solve this particular warning we got. I'm going to show you how to solve this a variety of different ways. 
All right, so in total, we're going to look at a couple different ways here. We're going to start off with what is by far the best solution. This is a solution we are almost always going to try to go with. I'm only showing you these other options as kind of last ditch efforts. So whenever you get an act warning, you always want to try to use a find by or a find all by query function. But there all the, are these other different ways you can go with it, try to solve the problem. I'm going to show you them. But again, option number one, almost always the best. Okay, so option number one, let's get to it right away. To solve the act warning, we want to use a find by or a find all by function to detect when our troublesome component has finished its data fetching. So let me show you the process for this. To get started, I'm going to take a look at the act warning message itself. It says an update to the file icon component. So this is a component that exists inside of our project. Let's go and find it right away because that is the component that is giving us some trouble. At my code editor, I'm going to go to a repositories list item. You'll notice that we are importing file icon into this component. We are displaying it right there. So again, that is the component that is giving us a little bit of trouble. I want you to notice that right away, we are passing down the primary language of the repository as a name prop into that component. Keep that in your mind for just a little bit. Now I'm going to go and find that component really quickly. It is inside of the components tree directory. So I'll find components tree file icon. Here it is right here. Inside of this component, we'll notice right away that there is a use effect function, and it looks like there's some kind of asynchronous code inside of here. It's not using async await, but it is using a promise. So some kind of promise is being created right here. And then after the promise is resolved, we update a piece of state. This is an absolute classic telltale sign that we are going to run into an act warning. Again, anytime you have a use effect function that contains any kind of asynchronous code, and after the promise gets resolved or after we get back some data, we update some state, we are almost always going to see an act warning. So now that we have identified the component that is giving us the trouble, let me show you what the next step is. To make use of a find by or find all by, our goal is to somehow detect when the component has finished its data fetching. That's what we're trying to do here because we want to create an act window and make sure that this act window that we're going to create by using find by or find all by is going to include the period of time when we finish the data fetching and update some state inside of that troublesome component. So to do this, I'm going to go back over to my test. I'm going to find the test function right here. I'm going to mark the enclosing function as async. And then I'm going to show you a little trick. So underneath my test, I'm going to create a pause function. We've done this a little bit ago inside the course. The only goal of this function is to allow us to kind of introduce a very small pause of time. So just a couple of hundred milliseconds. From this function, I'm going to return a new promise that is going to be called with a resolve function. I'm then going to use a set timeout to wait for 100 milliseconds. And then after 100 milliseconds, I'm going to call the resolve function. So now I can use this function to just put in a very small arbitrary pause anywhere inside of my test. Right after rendering the component, I'm going to do a screen.debug to print out the contents of my screen. It's going to show me exactly what my component currently looks like. I'm then going to await pause. So that's going to put in a 100 millisecond delay. And then I'm going to do another screen.debug. So the goal of this is to allow me to take a look at the output of my component and see what the difference is before finishing that file icon data loading request and what it looks like afterwards. I'm then going to compare the two different outputs. And by using this difference, by taking a look at the difference in the output of my component before and after that data fetching is complete, I'll then have something that I can wait for, something that some element or some class name or something that's going to change in the output of my component that I can wait for. And I'm going to use that as the kind of basis to detect when the component has finished its data fetching. Okay, so I'm going to save this back over to my terminal. Now I get a lot of HTML printed out here, a lot of stuff going on. So I'm going to scroll up to the top of my tests. This first console log right here is going to be before that file icon component 
has completed its data fetching. So I can scroll down a little bit and I'll notice right away that I get a div with class of flex, then an anchor element, and then I see React right there. I'm then going to scroll down a little bit. And then there's the warning. And then right after that, I'm going to get another console log. So this is the second screen.debug. This is the one after we put in that 100 millisecond pause. And we can see right away that now there is an additional element here. It is an I element that has a role of image and an ARIA label of JavaScript with no capital S, just plain JavaScript. So the difference between these two screen.debug statements is the presence of this I element that has a role of image and an accessible name or ARIA label of JavaScript. So what we can do to fix this act warning to somehow detect when that file icon component has completed its data fetching, we can do a find by. So that's going to open up a window where we can safely change our state without getting any warnings. And we can watch for the presence of that I element. As soon as the I element has appeared on the screen, that is a sign that our component finished its data fetching. And so we can move on to the rest of our test. Okay, so let me show you how we would do that. Back over inside the test, I'm going to delete all the screen.debug stuff and replace it within await screen find by role image. Now, if I save this right away and rerun my tests, I will still get a warning. The reason for that is that it turns out there are two different images that are being displayed on the screen right now. Let me just show that to you really quickly. I'm going to undo and redo the big console logs. So you'll notice that when I first display my component, we actually do show the SVG for the stars element right here. This counts as a image because it's been given a role of image. So when our components first rendered, we already have an SVG. And so if we just put in a simple await, oh, let me undo the other way. If we just put this in, we're going to find that SVG for the star icon right away. So we need to be a little bit more specific on what item we are trying to find or what image we're trying to find. We are trying to find the one with that accessible name of JavaScript. And that's why I pointed that out. So now if I save this and flip back over, there we go. Tests are passing. Warning message is gone. Okay, let me pause for a moment just right here. I know this is nasty. Yep, this is, there's just plain no two ways about it. This is hard. How in the world would you reproduce this on your own when you're working on your own project? Well, the thing to keep in mind is that you kind of have an idea of when you're going to run into these act warnings. You now know that if you are ever starting off some data fetching inside of a use effect function, you're probably going to see that act warning. And the best way to solve the act warning, we want to use a find by or find all by to detect that the component has finished its data fetching. Usually, if you are testing a component that is doing the actual data fetching, you're going to know exactly how to write out this find by really quickly. So for example, you might recall we spoke about that component, the imaginary one right here that was going to load some data. Remember this one? And I showed you the code for that component right here. So I didn't really show the entire component, but presumably after fetching some data, we would then render out the list of users on the screen. I'm not really showing the JSX for that, but presumably that's what we would do. So a very easy way to solve the act warning that would come out of this component right here would be to do a find all by statement and maybe try to find every user that is being rendered to the screen. So that's a very simple or kind of a more obvious case of how we would solve the act warning. Usually when you are testing a component that is causing the act warning, you're going to have a much better idea of what is going on with it. In this case, we just came up against a component where we didn't really understand what the file icon component was doing. So we had to do that console log or the screen.debug statement to figure out how we could detect that its data fetching was complete. But the obvious thing here is that sometimes that's not going to be quite so easy. Sometimes you're not going to be able to figure out exactly what element is being displayed when the component has finished its data fetching. So there are some fallbacks here, some other ways in which we can solve these act warnings where we don't have to do quite so much analysis. And Again, I want to show you some of these other methods because I do think that on real projects, you're going to eventually have to use them as well. All right, one or two other ways of how we can solve these act warnings without falling back to the find by or find all by solutions. So option number two, 
we can use that act function that we saw a little bit ago. That's again, kind of the entire core of the issue here to control exactly when the data fetching request gets resolved. Now we're not quite at the point where we're talking about data fetching inside of testing just yet. So we're gonna take a look at this technique later. Instead, we're going to go down to option number three. In option number three, we're gonna use what is called a module mock. And the goal of this technique is to completely avoid the component that is giving us that warning or causing any trouble at all. So at present, back inside of our test, we are trying to test and make sure the repositories list item component is working as expected. It is only kind of a total byproduct that we are running into the act warning because our component of repositories list item is displaying file icon. File icon is the component that is giving us trouble. In theory, if we were not displaying file icon at all, then we would not get that warning and we wouldn't have any troubles whatsoever. So I'm gonna show you how we can render the repositories list item component. And when it comes time to render file icon, we're just gonna pretty much skip over it entirely. We're gonna say, you know what? I don't wanna deal with file icon for this test. I wanna skip over it. I don't wanna render it because I'm getting that warning. In this case, I don't care about fixing the warning or I can't figure out how to fix it or whatever else. And again, we're gonna do this by creating a module mock. So to do so, back inside of our test file, at the very top, I'm going to add in a jest.mock call. The first argument is going to be the path from this test file, the relative path from this test file over to the file or the component that we do not want to actually render. So I'm inside right now of the repositories directory inside of repositories list item test. So it's that file right there. I do not want to actually render the file icon inside of this test file at all. I don't want to render it. I want that component to just pretty much not exist, so to speak. So I'm going to put in a first argument right here of up one directory into the tree folder and then file icon. Then as a second argument, I'm going to put in a function and I'm going to return another function. And from that other function, I'm going to do one more return here of file icon component. Okay, so what's going on here? Well, we can use jest.mock to kind of pretend of the contents of another file. So by putting in a jest.mock of tree file icon right here, it means do not actually go and import the real fi file icon file. Don't import that thing at all. Instead, if anyone ever tries to import that file, just give them this code right here. Give them a function that's going to return a string of file icon component. So we can think of this as being the contents of file icon.js. This kind of override or this faking out of the contents of the real file icon.js file is going to apply to our repositories list item. So when repositories list item tries to import the file icon component, now instead of getting the real one, it's going to get this function right here. So our repositories list item component is going to render out file icon component, that string exactly when it tries to render that thing right there. So instead of seeing file icon, we would see file icon component. So as you can guess, this is a pretty powerful technique to make sure that we just plain skip over a component that is giving us trouble. To verify that this works, I'm gonna save this. I'm gonna go back down to the bottom and I'm going to comment out the find by role stuff. And we're going to make sure that we do not get that act warning. Okay, back over at my terminal. I'll notice now that my test is passing and I'm not getting the act warning at all. And just to give you a good idea of what's going on, I'll do a screen.debug inside the test. Save this. And now as soon as I put that in, if I scroll up a little bit, I will see that instead of the file icon, so the I element, I see file icon component. So that is kind of the fake component that I defined at the top of our test file. Okay, so again, this is kind of method number or three here to avoid or solve these act warnings. We're just skipping over the component that is causing the issue. Now, obviously this is not always gonna be feasible because the act warning might be coming from a component that we are actually testing. It is only going to be feasible if we are rendering a component that shows another that is causing the act warning and we really don't care about that other component being rendered at all.
one last way of solving all this act stuff. And I want to be super clear here. We really do not want to use this approach pretty much ever. We're only going to use this approach as a last ditch effort when we are trying to test some component and it's really urgent for us to fix this test or maybe make the test work. And we just plain can't figure out how to get the act warning to go away. So this is really absolute last case. I really would encourage you not to use this technique. I'm only showing it to you because I think it's going to give you a better idea of how the act function works, behaves behind the scenes and so on. So again, I can't say enough. Really, you don't want to be doing this, but I'm going to show you how to do it anyways. Okay, so I'm going to go back over to my test file. Here we go. I'm going to remove the screen.debug. I'm going to go back up to the top of the file. I'm going to comment out the module mock we have put inside of here. And then from testing library slash react, I'm going to import the act function. Now the act function itself is actually defined by react dom. That's what's actually making the act function. Testing library slash react imports the act function itself. It makes a very small change to it, and then it re-exports the function. So again, act actually implemented by react dom, but we are importing in our project from react testing library. Okay, now back down at our test. I'm going to re-implement that pause function really quickly. I'm going to implement it in a kind of shortened format here. It's going to do the same thing. So I'm going to make a new promise that gets called with a resolve. I'll then do a set timeout that calls resolve after 100 milliseconds. I think that should work right there. So again, a function that we can just await. It's going to put in an arbitrary, very small pause into our code. And then inside of our test itself, I'm going to put in an await act. I'm going to call it with an async arrow function. And inside the arrow function itself, I'll do an await pause like so. So this is going to open up an act window that is going to last for one second. Pretty much just says over the net, or excuse me, not one second, but one tenth of a second, 100 milliseconds. So it's going to give us a little window that's going to last for 100 milliseconds. And if we make any state updates inside there or anything like that, we're saying that's absolutely okay. And we are expecting to receive these state updates. So I'm now going to save this once again, back over to my terminal. And again, I see the test passing and I do not see an act warning. I want to repeat just one last time. I really would not expect to see many of these on a professional project. So this is an absolute last case fallback just when we absolutely cannot get the act warning to go away, can't figure out a better solution, and we really, really, really need to finish our test and get the test working right now, maybe due to some urgent deadline or something like that. So I'm going to undo this change. I'm going to go back to the preferred solution, which is to use that find by or find all by. Okay, back over here. I'm going to uncomment that one and remove any trace of the bad code that I had in here. I'm also going to remove the module mock at the top because again, even though that does work, it is not really our preferred solution. And I'm also going to delete the import for the act function at the top. And we are left with just this. At long last, we have finally finished up all the stuff around act and we can finally get back to the feature that we were trying to add in here and the test around it. So remember what we're working on right now. We want to show off to the right hand side of each of our repositories a link that will take a user to this repository hosted on github.com and we really want that link to be an icon of sorts i really want to show a little github icon that a user can click on it will take them off to the repository for react or whichever this one is whichever one this is and so on so just remember that is the goal that's what we're trying to work on right now so that in mind inside of our test we have finally rendered out our component and now to finish up the test we probably want to try to find a element with a role of link and then make sure that it has an appropriate href assigned to it. So we could do that very easily using some of the query functions we have already learned about quite a bit. We could do something like const link is screen get by role link and then do maybe a expect link to have attribute. We'll then put in the attribute that we want to specifically look for. I want to double check its href property. And then the second argument to this matcher is going to be what we want to make sure the attribute is equal to. So in this case, we want the href on the link to be whatever we pass down 
in this repository object as the HTML underscore URL. I know it's been a while, but just remember, this is the link to the repository hosted on github.com. So we want to make sure that the href is equal to that string right there. To do this comparison, we can very easily copy the string down into the test, but anytime we are copy pasting strings around inside of a test file, that's usually a bad sign because another engineer might come into this test file and, and decide to change this URL for some reason. It happens all the time, to be honest with you. So rather than copy pasting this string right here, I'm going to take a slightly different approach. Inside of our render component function at the very bottom, I'm going to return the repository inside of an object. So now inside of each of my individual tests, whenever I call render component, I'm going to be given back an object that contains all the props that were passed into the component. So I will know exactly what was actually passed down into our repositories list item. So now I can destructure out the repository. So that is the entire repository object. And when we make sure that the link has the appropriate attribute, we can say that we want that href to be exactly equal to repository.html underscore URL. And that's it. Our test is looking good, but let's go and run it really quickly. Now, remember, we have not actually put any implementation inside of our component just yet. So if I go back over to my terminal, I will notice that the test is failing, which we definitely expect, but I want you to take a look at why the test is failing. If I scroll up a little bit, it says that we, in fact, are already finding a element with a role of link, and it has an href property of repositories, Facebook slash React. So this is not quite right we should not already be finding a link element because we have not added in our link just yet. We have not added in the link over here on the far right hand side. So what's going on? Well, if we go back over to our component itself, so repositories list item, you might recall that our component is showing a link component from React Router DOM already. This link component is gonna generate an anchor element. So when our test is running right now, it is finding the anchor element that is created by this link component. And it's checking to make sure that the anchor elements href is equal to the HTML underscore URL property. So in other words, our selector that we just added into our test, it's not quite working correctly. It's finding the incorrect element inside of our component. So to fix this up, we just need to be a little bit more specific with our selector. So we need to make a couple of decisions around exactly what element we're gonna show over here on the right-hand side and make sure that this element can be uniquely selected Make sure that we can select that one instead of the link that is currently being displayed already inside of our component, the one that is showing up right there. So I'm gonna make a big assumption right now. I'm going to assume that when I implement this link inside of my feature, I'm gonna give it an accessible name. And the accessible name is gonna be something like GitHub repository. That's it, just the string GitHub repository. And I'll show you why I am choosing that accessible name in particular in just a moment. Okay, so back inside my test, I'm going to find my query function right here to find the element with a role of link. And I'm going to add on an accessible name kind of filter criteria to this thing. I'm going to say that I want to find a link specifically with an accessible name of GitHub repository. So now I will save this back over to the terminal. And now our test is failing for the right reason. It is failing because we can't find a role with the appropriate accessible name. That is good. So now that our test is failing correctly, we can go and implement our actual feature. Let's do that right away. So to implement the actual feature that we've spent all this time writing out the test for, I'm going to go back over to repositories list item. At the very top, I'm going to add in an import for an icon of mark GitHub icon from at primer slash octicons oct icons dash react then down at the bottom of our component inside of the very bottom div right here i'm going to add in another div with a class name of grow flex items center justify dash end pr dash two and inside that div, I'm going to put in an anchor element with an href of repository 
dot html underscore url an aria label of github repository and then finally inside of the anchor element i will put in mark github icon so we just added in an element that has a role of link and we gave it an aria label remember the aria label serves as this element's accessible name the reason that I specifically added in an ARIA label here of GitHub repository is for the same reason around these ARIA labels we discussed earlier on inside the course. There are sometimes going to be elements that just don't have an easily accessible, accessible name, so to speak. So in this case, this mark GitHub icon, it probably doesn't have an accessible name. It might, it might not. I don't really know what it is off the top of my head. So if anyone using a screen reader ever tries to figure out what this link does, I want them to understand right away where this link is going to take them. It's going to take them to the GitHub repository. So that's the purpose of this ARIA label. It is giving people who are using a screen reader a little bit better idea of what this link is and where it's going to take them. Also, by adding this ARIA label, we now also have a better way of selecting this link in particular. Okay, so let's now make sure we save the file. Go and run our tests. They are passing. Fantastic. I'm also going to go back over to my browser and test out the application. So there's the icon right there. And if I click on it, it will take me off to the repository hosted on github.com. Excellent. So that's it. We have added in this additional small feature on this component and added in a test around it. Before we move on, I would like to add in a couple of additional tests around our component just to make sure everything else works. Whenever we are going back to a component and adding in some tests to solve a bug, we always might want to add in just another test or two if we see that there is some critical behavior that is completely untested. So right now, some additional tests we might want to add in. We might want to make sure that we show this file icon off to the left-hand side and just make sure that the correct icon actually shows up. We also might want to make sure that a link appears right here and that the link has the appropriate href attribute assigned to it. So in this case, to show Facebook React, that would take us to the code editor page. And to generate that link, we have an anchor element with an href property of repositories slash Facebook slash React. So I think we can very easily add in these two additional tests. Not going to take a lot of time and just going to make sure that our component, again, really is working as we expect. All right, so let's get to it. The first thing we'll take care of is the icon over here, the file icon. So we've discussed that component a little bit. We even know how to select that icon already because we had to go over all that find by role stuff with the image, blah, 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 to solve that act warning. So at the bottom of the file, I'm going to add in another test. And for this one, I'll give it a description of something like shows a file icon with the appropriate icon. This function is going to be async. We know that because we're going to show this same component we've been displaying. And we know that to get the act warning to not display, we have to do the await find by role stuff. And that's going to apply to really every test inside of here. So inside this test, we could probably do something like render component. We could then attempt to find that image, so the file icon, using the same exact query we wrote up here. So it'll be something like await screen find by role image and then name of JavaScript. I'm going to assign that to icon. And then I don't really expect you to kind of guess this. I'm just going to tell you something here that we could test about this to make sure the appropriate icon actually shows up. If I go back over to my element inspector, it's on my browser and I inspect the file icon, again, you'll notice it is an I element. And most importantly, you'll notice this thing gets a class name of JS-icon. That means that it's going to show a JavaScript icon. And you can confirm that if you go down the list and find some other language icon. Here's one for TypeScript. If I inspect that one, you'll notice this one has a TS, TypeScript icon. The library that's being used to show the file icons takes a look at the file name that gets passed down into that component and then uses the file name to take a guess at exactly what icon should be displayed. So to make sure everything is working correctly, 
we could attempt to make sure that these i elements have a appropriate class name. So in the case of a JavaScript repository, we could write out an assertion, make sure the icon has a class name of js-icon. Back inside of our test, if we take a look at render component, take a look at that function again, you'll recall that we are in fact passing down a language of JavaScript. So that means that our file icon inside of our tests should be showing a image element that has that class name of js-icon. So that's the assertion we are going to write out. Okay, so down here, we can do a expect icon to have class. So that's another matcher that is made available to us by just dom. And we're going to put in the class we expect it to have. It is simply JS icon. Okay, let's save this. Back over to our terminal, and it looks like our test is passing very good. Okay, I would like to put together one more test just to make sure the top link up here is working as expected. We'll deal with that in just a moment. Let's add in one last test here. So at the bottom of the file, put in a description and say, shows a link to the code editor page. Again, I'll mark this thing as async. I will render my component. I'm going to await for screen, find by role, img. Same stuff we've done previously, again, to solve the act warning. And now we need to find that link element and just make sure it has the appropriate href property. Once again, to do this effectively, we probably need to look at our component itself, the code for it, and figure out how this link gets generated and how we can make sure that our test kind of generates that link correctly. So if I go back over to repositories list item, here's the link element. You'll notice that it is going to take a user to repositories slash full name. And then in addition to that, the link itself is going to print out owner.login. And it's going to then print out a slash, then a span, and inside there is the name of the repository. So owner.login, that's coming off the repository object. So if we go back over to our render component function up here, you'll notice that when we put in our fake repository right here, we kind of made a mistake. We put in owner as a string, and that was really my fault. But it's clear that our component has worked correctly up to this point, even though we put this incorrect prop type inside of here. So owner is actually supposed to be an object, and clearly, as we just saw, it is going to have a property of login. And presumably, that is going to be the login of whoever's, kind of like the username, so to speak, of whoever owns this repository. So if we put this in, now, back down inside of our new test, I'm going to get the repository that gets returned when we call render component. I'm then going to try to find a link with an await screen find by role link. And I want to find one with a name that is going to include a regular expression. And this is going to be dynamic because we're going to look up the repository owner name off the repository object. So I'll do new regular expression with repository dot login, excuse me, owner dot login. And then we will expect the link to have attribute href. And we want to make sure that it takes us to whatever repositories slash repository full name is. So it should be template string repositories and the repository full name. And I think that's full underscore name. Let's double check that really quick. Yep, underscore. Okay, let's save that again. Back over to our terminal and we've got another pass. Very good. On to our next big bug report. So this next one is gonna be pretty interesting because at first, when we look at it, it's gonna seem like a real easy thing to fix inside the application. And when we look at the code, it's gonna be really easy to fix, but actually testing it, well, the testing is gonna be really hard. So here's our bug report. Here's what we're going to try to fix. So the title is, homepage should show popular repositories for six languages. In the steps to reproduce, it says, just go to the home screen, go down to the popular repositories listings. And then we should see 
popular repositories for JavaScript, TypeScript, Rust, Go, Python, and Java, but Python and Java are missing. And here's a screenshot down here. So you might recognize this view. It is from the homepage of our app. So if we go to localhost 3000 and scroll down, we will in fact see JavaScript, TypeScript, Rust, and Go, and we do not see anywhere the missing Python and Java. So that's it. We'd really just need to add in two more tables here. Now, as usual, we're going to use the same kind of bug tracking down process. We're going to figure out what components we care about. We're going to find the data inside them. We're then going to hopefully write out a test and actually fix it by writing out some code. So step one, let's take care of it right away. We need to figure out what component is showing this content on the screen. Once again, I'm going to make use of the built-in Chrome developer tools and go to the React developer tools inside of here. Once I'm at that tab, I'm going to use the element selector. And I'm going to click on any of these tables. And again, if you can't seem to click on a table, just reload the page and try it again. That always seems to fix it. So now if I click on one of these tables, I'll see on the right hand panel over here. Looks like we are working with a repositories table component. Now the repositories table component looks like there's one for each of these four different tables. And they are all being displayed by another component called home route. So let's try to find the home route component first, because it is showing multiple tables and it's clear that one of these tables or two of them really is what is missing. So back inside of my editor, I will do a search with a command P for home route. And sure enough, it looks like there is a home route component inside of my SRC routes directory. Inside this home route component, we can see right away at the top of the component itself, we've got a call to some different hooks. Well, four separate calls to the same hook. And you'll notice right away that it looks like these are all pretty repetitive. It looks like we've got user repositories four times, and one has a language of JavaScript, TypeScript, Rust, and Go. It looks like we call them, we get back some data, and then all that's really happening with that data is we're making use of it to show one of these different repositories table components. So almost immediately, we are in a scenario where we can probably fix this bug without writing out any test. I bet we can probably fix this right away. Let's just try to do it just by following some of the patterns that we already see inside this file. So I'm going to write out two additional use repository hook calls. And I'm doing this because I want to show some additional table for the list of Java and Python languages. So I'll do one, say data is Python repos equals use repositories. And then it looks like what we have to do here is put in a string with stars over 1000 and then a language of whatever language we are going for. So again, I'm just going to follow that same pattern. Stars greater than 10,000 language of Python. And then I'll repeat that again with Java repos. Stars greater than 10,000 language Java. So again, without really knowing a whole lot around this component, well, kind of seems like we're just following the pattern and this might work. So now I can take the Python repos and Java repos. I'm going to go down to the bottom of the component and I'm going to display two additional copies of repositories table. It looks like these components expect to receive props of a label and some list of repositories, presumably whatever we just got back from calling those hooks. So I'll put in repositories, repositories. I always make typos on that word. And I'll do most popular Python. Python repos. And then I'll just copy that. I'll change it to Java right there. And then Java repos. All right, let's try to save this back over to the browser. And if I refresh the page and scroll down, sure enough, right away, I see some popular Python repositories right here. And the name of the repositories definitely look like Python. And I also see most popular Java. And they all look like Java repositories. So almost immediately, by just following some patterns inside this component, hey, looks like we kind of solved the bug. So our options here are to either mark the bug as fixed, or we could do the right thing, which is probably to go back and write out some tests and make sure that this component is in fact working as expected. And naturally that's what we are going to do. So this once again is going to be a scenario where fixing the bug and 
making a change to the component is super, super easy. We just had to kind of recognize a pattern and duplicate the pattern. But again, writing out the tests going to be surprisingly challenging. So we're going to have to learn a lot around data fetching inside of a test. That's really the focus here. The whole goal of testing this component is to better understand how we deal with data fetching inside of a testing environment. So I want to take a look at the implementation of the use repositories hook right away. As you might guess, this hook is going to eventually make a data fetching request when we run it in our normal application. We can find the hook inside the SRC hooks directory. I'm going to find use repositories inside there. Inside the use repositories file, you'll notice that there are two separate functions inside of here. There's a repositories fetcher function and the actual use repositories hook. Now this file and just about all the data fetching inside this project are making use of a library called SWR. SWR is a nice little hook itself that makes data fetching inside of a React project pretty straightforward and pretty easy. We are going to eventually get a better understanding of what SWR is all about. I only really used it in this project because, well, number one, it's really easy to use. Number two, I thought it might be a library you have not seen before. And so testing it would be a little bit interesting because we would have to figure out how it works. Now behind the scenes, SWR is still making use of the very popular Axios library to make requests. So at the end of the day, once again, we're still using Axios. SWR is just being used to kind of handle the response and get some data over to our components. Okay, so let me show you a couple diagrams and show you the problems we're going to immediately run into as we start trying to test our home route component. So as soon as we start testing a component that tries to make a network request, we're going to start running into a lot of different issues. We never actually want our components to make network requests or API requests of any kind in a test environment. And the reason for this is very simple. First, making actual requests is usually relatively slow. It might take a couple of hundred milliseconds in the best case, or even several seconds to make a single request. And so if we are making requests for every single one of our tests, well, running our tests is just plain going to take longer. The other issue is that if we were making actual requests, the data that we get back inside these requests might eventually change. And that could have unexpected results on our tests. They might start to break unexpectedly. So whenever we are trying to test a component, that tries to fetch some data inside of a testing environment, we are almost always going to fake or mock, remember that is the term, we say we mock something, some data fetching process. There's a couple of different ways to do this. I'm gonna show you several different ways inside this course. So let me show you a couple of different ways we're gonna deal with this. Okay, so option number one here for dealing with a component that is trying to do some data fetching, we can attempt to mock the file that contains the data fetching code. So let me explain what that means. Inside of our home route component, you'll notice that we import the use repositories hook right here. We then call it, so clearly it is a function, and it's going to give us back an object that has a data property. So without even really studying that hook or knowing anything about it, it's pretty clear what it does right away. We import that function, we call it, it's gonna return an object that has a data property. That's all it really does. So with that in mind, we could create a module mock. And we looked at this very briefly in the last section. The goal of a module mock is to find, create a test file and to put in a little bit of an override. This says, hey, if our home route component ever tries to import the file at hooks, use repositories, rather than importing the actual file, give it this code right here. So this code pretty much says return a function that when called returns an object that has a data property. And presumably that data property is gonna be an array of repository objects or something like that. So using this approach is a really simple and easy way to deal with data fetching because we can just say, don't actually attempt to do any data fetching whatsoever. Just use this imaginary code right here. Whenever you call this function, you're gonna immediately get back some data to use inside the component. So again, pretty easy. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward, and really does not require us to have a lot of knowledge around the data fetching process. The downside to this is that now the interaction between our component and the hook is completely untested. So if we use a module mock, it means our actual component that we're trying to test, home route, is not calling the real hook. 
and there might be some really special interaction between the component and the hook that is not covered inside of our test. So that's just a part of our application that doesn't really get tested at all. Our component might be using the hook incorrectly, and we might just plain not know because, well, we're not using the actual hook. So even though module mocking can be really convenient and really easy, again, it's not always the first thing we're going to reach for just because we are inherently testing less code with each test we are writing. So instead, you're going to see a lot of professional projects go for option two and sometimes option number three. So quick pause right here, come back in a moment, and we'll discuss what option two is. The second way of dealing with handling data fetching inside of a test environment is to use a library to mock Axios. And I don't have to be using Axios here. If I'm using the built-in fetch function or anything equivalent, we can still use the same kind of approach. So the idea is that we still are going to use the hook that is doing the data fetching, but when it comes time to actually go and fetch some data, we might intercept the network request that is issued and kind of resolve it automatically. That's a little bit complicated to understand. So again, a couple of diagrams here. All right, so when we usually run our application on a user's computer, we're going to have some kind of network request function or library. So that might be Axios, or it might be the fetch function that is built directly into user's browser. And this library, this function, whatever we are using, it's going to eventually make a request off to some outside API in an attempt to go and get some data. And again, this is not what we want to have happen when we are running our tests. So one way to solve this problem is to make use of a library very commonly used one is called MSW, which is short for Mock Service Worker. The goal of this MSW library is in a test environment, we're still going to use Axios or Fetch, but rather than letting the request that these things issue, rather than sending that out to some outside API, the MSW library is going to intercept the request. It's going to say, hey, don't actually send that out. It's going to grab the request and then automatically respond to it. So no request actually leaves our test environment but we still get the benefit of testing a huge amount of our code, everything from the component to the hook to the request itself. So the request is still kind of issued. It just doesn't actually get sent out. The MS library is, MSW library is pretty easy to use. We're going to import it as usual. We're going to say, hey, if you ever intercept a request that has this route, then just go ahead and immediately respond to it and resolve it with some data. So the code that you and I have to write, you and I have to write in this particular case, well, it's not going to be far off from this. We're, we are pretty much going to say if there's ever a GET request that is sent off to API slash repositories, then just go ahead and respond, send back some JSON, respond with an array of objects where each object re represents a repository. So MSW, again, very often used, very frequently used. You're going to see it in a lot of real projects and the great thing about it is that you don't really have to mock out a lot of your code. You're still using Axios or Fetch. It's still all the same behind the scenes stuff. The only difference is that the real request is not being sent off to a outside API. Okay, so let's take a pause right here. Just a moment, we're going to install this MSW library and then understand how to wire it up inside of our tests. Let's get some experience with MSW to test out our component. Now I've got yet another checklist here to explain exactly how this is going to work. So step one, everything begins with making a test file. Let's do that right now for our new component that we are working on. So back inside my editor, the component we are working on is called home route, and it is located in the SRC routes directory. So inside that same folder, I will make a file called home route test.js. I'm then going to add in a couple of imports at the top. Some of these are going to look really familiar. Others are going to be just a little bit new. So I'm going to import render screen from at testing library slash react. I will get setup server from MSW slash node rest from MSW. I will get memory router from react router dom. And then finally, the component we are actually trying to test. So home route from same directory, home route. Okay, that step was easy enough. Next up, we're going to take a look at the requests that our component is actually making, because we need to eventually intercept these requests and then return some appropriate data. 
when our component makes these requests in the test environment. So to do this step, I really recommend using your Chrome developer tools. It's one of the easiest ways to handle this. Back over inside of my browser, I'll go to my homepage. Here we go, localhost 3000. I'm then gonna open up my network request tools. And if I refresh the page and filter by fetch slash XHR requests, I'll notice that there are several different requests being made right now. It looks like there's one request to a route of user. I don't think that's related to the component we are trying to test right now. I'll then see that there are six different requests that are made off with a route of, if I click on one, API slash repositories, and then a query string. And the query string has one query parameter of Q equals. And then it looks like it has some search criteria after that. So it appears that our six different requests are all going to be sent off to API slash repositories. They are all going to have a query string that contains the kind of language they are looking for. In addition, they are get requests. Finally, if I go to the payload tab, or excuse me, preview tab, I'll notice right away that it looks like the response is an object that has an items property. Items is going to be an array of objects, and each of these, once again, looks like it represents some kind of repository. If we take a look at our component, so really quickly, I'm going to go back over to my component. Here's home route. You'll notice that inside of home route, we are not really directly making use of the data that gets sent back. The data that gets sent back is being used by the repositories table. If I go and find that component inside of components, repositories, here's the repositories table. And inside of here, you'll notice that we receive a list of repositories. And then out of all these different repositories, the only property that we really use is the repositories ID and its full name. We don't make use of anything else. So that leads me to believe that out of this big response we get sent back, we really only care about this items property. We just care about the array of objects. And out of each of these different objects, even though there are a ton of different properties assigned to them, there's really only two properties we really care about. And they are the ID of the repository, which is right there. And the only other property that we probably really care about is the full name, which we can find right here. So in total, let's kind of review what we have learned about this component. First, we're going to make a series of different requests to API slash repositories. They're going to have a query string that includes a language. They're going to be get requests. We send back or we get back from the request an object that has an array of items. And out of all these item objects, the only thing we care about is an ID and the full name. Okay, so now that we've kind of understood the requests that are being issued, back over to our steps here. So that was step two. Now on to step three. In step three, we're going to create an MSW handler. So this is a function that's going to intercept a request that's being sent by our component. And it's going to send back automatically some fake data that our component is going to use. So let me show you how we do step three. This is going to use everything we just learned from step two. All right, so back inside my test file. Here it is right here. I'm going to make a new array called handlers. Inside there, I'm going to define one single function. I'm going to call rest.get, and I'm going to put in an argument of API slash repositories. The second argument is going to be a function that's going to be called with a request object, a response, and a context object. So you might be able to see where this is going. Just a moment ago, when we were looking at our network request log, we saw that requests were being made off to API slash repositories, and they were all get requests. So this function right here is going to watch for any request that is being made by our components in the test environment, and it's going to intercept any get request to API slash repositories. Notice that we only put the route right here. We do not have to add in the query string or anything like that. To access the query string of the request, we would write out res, or excuse me, rec dot url dot search params. This is a search params instance. So it's an object that contains all the information out of the query string. As we saw just a moment ago, all the requests that are issued have a query string with a letter Q in it. And Q 
contains some filter criteria. So I'm going to try to access that Q thing. And for right now, I'm going to assign that to a variable called query. I'm going to console log that. We're just going to make sure it's super clear what that value is in a little bit. Then after that, inside this function, our goal is to send back some kind of response. So whatever we send back inside of here is the data that is going to be sent back to our component. So we need to make sure the data we send back has the appropriate structure. It needs to basically be the same exact structure of data that we would normally get back in any normal request. So that is why we look so carefully at the data that gets sent back in our network request log. So like we just mentioned, we know that the response is going to be an object. Out of all the properties on it, we really only care about items. Items is going to be an array of objects. And for each of these objects, the only property we really care about is ID and full name. That's it, nothing else. So to simulate that kind of response, we're going to write out return res ctx or context dot json. And then inside of here, that's where we're going to put the data we want to send back to our component. So once again, we know we need to send back an object that has an items property that is going to be an array of objects. And out of each of these different objects, the only thing we care about is the ID and the full underscore name. For right now, I'm just going to send back two objects. The first one is going to have an ID of one and a full name of full name. The second one will have an ID of two and a full name of how about other name. We're going to replace the full names with something that makes a little bit more sense in just a moment. This is just for preliminary kind of testing purposes to make sure we understand what is going on. Now, one thing that's really important to notice here is to just understand that we are sending back an array with two objects inside of it. Our actual component is going to receive an array with 10 objects inside of it. And that's why on all these different tables, we see 10 different links. So as we are testing our component, we're going to expect to see some tables that only have two links inside them. So we just need to be aware of that for when we eventually go and write out our different assertions. We're going to eventually write an assertion to make sure that we've got a table for this JavaScript stuff, and it's going to only have two links inside of it, instead of the 10 that we see inside of our real application. Okay, so for right now, we've put together this initial handler to intercept these requests. Now, the last thing we're going to do very quickly, we're going to set up a couple of functions inside of our test file. These functions are going to make sure that the MSW functions are actually being used and to make sure that they are actually intercepting requests from our component. Just creating this handler array doesn't really do anything for us. We have to tell MSW to actually make use of these different intercepting functions. So for that, at the bottom down here, we're going to create a new variable called server. That's going to be set up server. We're going to put in dot, dot, dot handlers. And then we're going to call three separate functions that's going to tell the server to start up and start intercepting these requests. So first, we're going to do a before all. We will then do an after each and an after all. These different functions are built into the Jest test runner. They are global variables, so we do not have to import them. Whenever we call before all, after each, and after all, we can pass in a function. That function is going to be executed automatically depending upon the name of each of these different functions. So if we ever call before all, the function right here is going to be executed one time before all the tests inside of this file. After each is going to run the code inside of here. After each individual test is executed inside this file, regardless of whether it passes or fails. And then finally, after all is going to run after all of our different tests inside of this file have executed. Inside of the before all, we're going to put in a server.listen. So that means before we run any of our tests, run this little bit, start our server up, and start listening for incoming requests. In after each, we are going to call server.reset handlers. That's going to tell the server to reset each of these handlers to their initial default state. Not super relevant for us because we are not really changing how this handler works over time, but it's still something that's required for us to do. And then finally, in after all, that's after we have executed all of our tests, we want to stop our running server. Just shut it down. We don't need it anymore. 
So we'll do a server.close. Okay, so that's it. So now that we've done all this initial setup, we would go ahead and start to define our different tests, render our component, and we'll start to actually test the thing. When the component gets rendered, it's going to make some requests. It's going to get intercepted by MSW. We'll get some data back in the component, and we'll write out our actual assertions. So everything we just took care of is kind of the standard setup that we're usually going to do one time whenever we are making use of MSW inside of our test. All right, time for us to write out an actual test. So back inside of my test file, at the very bottom, I'm going to write out a test with a description of renders two links for each table. And maybe to be more descriptive, I could say two links for each language. The reason I'm expecting two links in particular is that inside of our request handler right here, we are returning two objects. So that means two repositories. When I write out the test, I'm going to mark the enclosing function as async. Our component is going to eventually try to make some network requests. So without a doubt, we know right away because we're making requests, even if they are going to be instantly responded to, this test is still going to be asynchronous in nature. Then at the top, as usual, I'm going to render my component. So home route. Remember that our home route component, just a quick aside here, if I go to the home route component file, this thing displays repositories table. That's another component. And repositories table in turn displays a link component. Remember an issue we ran into in the last section. The link component is a part of React Router DOM. Whenever we render a link, it's going to reach up using the context system and expect to find a React Router context at the top of our component hierarchy. So in order for us to render these links, we must wrap our home route component with a memory router once again. And we already imported that at the top right here. OK, I'll put in a memory router. There we go. So now let's try to just save the file. We're going to go and run our tests and see how we are doing. OK, back over at my terminal, I'm still running our test for repositories list item. I'll do a W, P, and then home route. And there we go. So initially, it looks like our test is passing. Probably not actually passing as expected. Let's scroll up a little bit and just see what we got out of this. So right away, we'll notice that we are printing out the, those query strings. In particular, we're printing out the Q property of the query strings. And the query strings, Q property in particular, has some filtering logic on the requests that we're making. So it's saying only give me repositories with greater than 10,000 stars and has a language of Rust, TypeScript, Go, Python, and so on. So that console log is coming from our request intercepting function right here. That right there is the query that we are currently logging. It's what we're looking at inside of our console. So it looks like we are definitely intercepting the requests, and we are definitely sending back these arrays with two objects inside them. So that's really good. It means we're making progress here. Back over inside of our terminal. Let's keep scrolling up to the top. Yep, looks like that's it. Okay, so initially, this looks all right. Looks like we're kind of going down the right path. So now the next thing I would like to do inside of our test, I'm going to do a screen.debug right here. I just want to see what the structure of our component looks like at this point in time. We can use that to figure out how we're going to eventually write some assertions to make sure that we've got two links for each language. Okay, I'm going to go back over, scroll up again, and I'll see the output from my component. So right away, I can see the different tables. So that's kind of like one table right there, one table right there. And at this point in time, there's no links inside them. And this kind of makes sense. Remember, it takes some amount of time for the fake request, even though it is fake, it takes a very, very small amount of time for the fake request to be resolved. So when we render our component initially, request is sent out, it gets intercepted by MSW, and MSW is going to respond to it as quickly as it can. But we're not kind of waiting for that. We are not saying wait for MSW to respond. We're just going straight down to the next line of code and immediately printing out whatever our component looks like. So at this point, well, we don't have any response from MSW. We need to somehow wait for that response. And the number one way in which we wait for responses when we are making use of React Testing Library is by making use of those find-phi queries, which we've spoken about many times. 
So here's what we're going to do inside of our test. We expect to eventually see six different tables, one for each of those different languages. I want to loop over each language. And for each language, make sure we see two links. And I want the links. I'm going to assert that the links have the appropriate full name. That's how we're going to implement this test. All right, so now we've got a plan going forward. One more pause. We'll start to wrap this up in just a moment. All right, time for us to write out some assertions. Now, to get started on this, I first want to give you a quick demonstration. I want you to see what our component actually looks like in the testing environment after we get a response from MSW. So an easy way to do this is, again, we're going to use that little trick of defining a pause function. So I'm going to put in a const pause. This is going to be a function that returns a new promise. I'm going to call it with an arrow function. I'm going to take that resolve argument. I'm going to define a set timeout. I'm going to put in resolve, and I'm going to resolve the promise after 100 milliseconds. Then inside my test, I'm going to do an await of pause, and then right after that, a screen.debug to print out the contents of our component. Okay, back over inside of my terminal. So here's the console logs from the query handlers. Totally fine. Then if I scroll down, I see some stuff around a act warning. Totally fine. We're going to fix that up. And if I keep on going down after a couple of those warnings, I'll see the output from my component. So right away, I'll see the H1 and some description. This is the stuff from the very top of our homepage route. So I'm going to keep on going down. And now I'm going to start seeing some of the output from the tables at the bottom. So I see most popular JavaScript. And there's my link right there. That's the first one. And then the second one. So it looks like for the JavaScript category, I get two links. The first one is going to have a name of full name, or I should say text of full name. And the second one will have some text of other name. If I keep on going down, here's TypeScript. This one has some text of full name, and that one has other name. So you might be able to recognize a little issue really quickly. At some point in time, we need to write out a test that makes sure that each of these different tables shows two links, and we probably want to make sure that these links are showing the appropriate text, so like the actual name of the repository, and we probably also want to make sure that they have the correct href property as well. And at present, every single one of our different languages, JavaScript, TypeScript, everything, they all have completely identical links. So what that tells me is that back up here inside of our fake request handler, it's probably not a good idea to always return the exact same two items, same exact two repository objects for every different request that we are responding to. Instead, we probably want to customize these a little bit for each different language that we are trying to get links for. So let me show you how we're going to do that. The first little bit of code we're going to write out is going to be just a little bit complicated. So let me just give you a quick reminder. Remember, the console, console log we are currently doing gives us back this string of stars, blah, 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 language, colon, and then the actual language that we're making the request for. I want to write out a little bit of code that is going to extract just that part of the string right there so that we can understand for every call to this request handler, every time we intercept a request, what language are we looking for? So a very easy way to do that. I'm going to put in just rec URL search params get Q. So that's going to give us that entire big string. I'm then going to split this string into two separate strings. I'm going to split on language colon. So I'm going to put in dot split on language colon. I'm going to assign that to result really quickly, and I'll console log it, and then save the file, just so you can see what we get out of that. So now we've got an array. The first element is going to be some part of the URL or query string that I don't really care about. The second part is what I really care about. That's the language we are making the request for. So to get access to that string, I'm going to do an index over here, index lookup. So I'm going to put in square brackets one, and I'm going to assign that to language. I'll then do a console.log of language once again, just to make sure we're going down the right path here. And now sure enough, inside of each of our different intercepting request handlers, we can see what language we are looking for. Okay, so that's good. 
We know what language we are looking for, so now here's step two. In step two, when we send back the list of items, we're going to customize the full name a little bit just to reflect the language that we are receiving the request for. So for this one right here, I'm going to put in a template string, so backticks, not single quotes, with dollar sign curly brace language underscore one, and then backticks dollar sign curly brace language underscore two. So now once again, quick save, back over. Now I don't see any console logs, totally fine, because we removed them. And if I scroll all the way down to the bottom, once again, we'll see what our component now looks like. So here's the HTML. I'm going to scroll down a little bit. And now this is much easier for us to test. Here is the most popular JavaScript table. Now we get a link with a anchor element that has an href2 repositories JavaScript underscore one. And it has a title of JavaScript underscore one. And then we've got another link right here with JavaScript underscore two. So this is a lot easier for us to test. Now we can make sure that whenever we make a request looking for JavaScript repositories, we get back some data that is tied to JavaScript, and we can very efficiently write some selectors in our code to find link or anchor elements with names like these, accessible names like these. Because before, all of our links had the exact same text. And like I said, that would make it really hard to make sure that we had the correct links showing up inside of our component. So what we've got here now is much easier to test. All right, so this is looking good. Let's go back down to our test at the bottom. We're going to start to wrap this thing up. First, I'm going to take out the pause and the screen debug. That was just to understand what was going on here. I'm then going to define an array called languages, and I'm going to write out a string for each of the different languages we are trying to fetch. So we are trying to get JavaScript, TypeScript. We are trying to get Rust, Go, Python, and one other one, what was it? Python and, oh, I don't remember. It's Java. That's right. We're then going to loop over each of these different strings. So we'll do a for let language of languages. And then just like the comments say, for each of these languages, we're going to write out a query and try to fetch all the links that contain some text with that language name. So in other words, we want to write a query that's going to find an anchor element that has an accessible name of JavaScript 1 and JavaScript 2. We want to find two links that have accessible names of TypeScript underscore 1, TypeScript underscore 2, and so on. So I'll say const links is await screen.findall by. And I'm doing the find all here because we want to find two separate links. Find all by role, to be precise. We want to find elements with a role of link. And because there are many links, we need to define a accessible name here to give a little bit more definite criteria on what we are looking for. So I want to find links with an accessible name. We really want to put in a regular expression here, but we need to build up the regular expression on the fly because the language we are looking for is going to be changing for every iteration of the loop. So we will make a dynamic regular expression. And we want this to be language and then underscore. That's kind of our matcher. We are trying to find JavaScript underscore, Java underscore, Go underscore. We want to find all the links with that pattern as their accessible name. Then for right now, just to make sure we're going down the right path, we can do and expect links to have length two. Now you'll notice that we are using an await find all by here. Remember, we are doing this to solve that act warning. Anytime that we get the act warning probably means we are fetching some data and we might be updating our state at some unexpected time. We always solve that by making use of find all by. In general, whenever we are doing any data fetching at all, especially with this MSW library, you probably want to use find all by at some point in time or find by either of the asynchronous ones. Okay, let's save this. Flip back over and sure enough, yay, test actually passes. So that means that we are correctly checking for two links for each individual language, each of these. Perfect. Now maybe the last thing we do here, we can assert that the links have the appropriate full name so we can make sure that the links have the right text. We can also make sure they have the right href. So for that, we could do an expect 
maybe links at zero to have text content of template string. And we can put in language underscore one, and we can duplicate that down. Make sure the second link has language underscore two. We could also check their href, as I mentioned. So we can do a expect links at zero to have attributes. And the link that we're looking for here, we can go and check back in the browser exactly what href we expect to have. So if I inspect one of these links right here, you'll notice that they get a href property of slash repositories, and then pretty much whatever the full name is of the repository. That's the second part right there. It's the full name of the repository. And in our case, the full name of our repositories are language underscore one, language underscore two. So in total, we would expect these links to have an attribute, href attribute of slash repositories slash language underscore one. And the other link, the second one in this case, so links at one should be repositories language underscore two. Okay, one last save. Look back over. Once again, we are passing. Excellent. So it worked out. Well, a lot of work here. Anytime we are testing a component that does data fetching, yeah, there's a pretty amount that goes on. And most importantly, there's a lot because we really truly have to analyze and think about what data our component expects. And we need to return some data of a very similar structure. And we need to shape that data so it's something we can actually test. As we saw a moment ago, when we return these repositories with the full name, if we just put in some dummy full name right here like that, it doesn't really give us something that we can effectively test. Instead, we had to go through all this extra work to customize the response for each of the requests that come into our handler, and then make sure we send back a response that gives our component some data that we can effectively write a test around. We've got our first example of fake data fetching inside of a test put together. And I know we've only gone through one example here, so we're still kind of figuring out what is going on. Nonetheless, even though we've only done this one time, there's a very important kind of pattern that I want to warn you about. I want to show you something that you're going to see recommended in a lot of blog posts, articles, and whatnot. And I just want to kind of warn you about it right away. It's so important that I want to show it to you as soon as possible. Okay, so here's the issue. Now, as you go and start to read more about testing, and in particular, faking the data fetching process, you're going to see a lot of recommendations for creating a single file inside of your project and then defining a lot of these fake route handlers inside there. So we might make one single file called handlers.js, and inside there, we might define several different fake route handlers. The idea here is that you would share these different fake route handlers between multiple different test files. So we might define this fake route for API slash repositories. And then we might try to use this across one component like home route.test and another one, maybe repository list.test. And at first glance, this seems like a completely reasonable approach. We only have to define the fake route handler one single time, and then we can use it between all of our different tests. So again, at first glance, hey, completely, absolutely normal, no issue whatsoever. But you're gonna realize pretty quickly that this is maybe not the best approach. The downside here is that if we define all these fake route handlers in one single place, then all of our tests are kind of locked in to always getting the exact same kinds of responses. So in other words, if we define all of our different fake route handlers inside of handlers.js, then we have one single implementation for this fake API slash repositories route. It means that we are always stuck into getting this kind of response right here across all of our different tests for all of our different components. And in some cases, well, I should say many cases, that's really not desirable at all. For example, we might eventually add in a new component called something like repository search, and we might want to test it. This new component we put together, we might want to test it without getting back this exact kind of response. So we might want to test the case in which this component gets an error response. Maybe the case in which this component gets 100 items instead of just two. Maybe the case in which this component gets back repositories that have no full name, or maybe full name with special characters inside of it, or any different kind of variation. It would be really hard for us to 
kind of test the component in that way, because again, we are kind of locked into this one single implementation of the fake API slash repositories route. And we're kind of implicitly saying that we're going to reuse this exact implementation of this fake route across all of our different tests. So clearly as our code base grows, we might not want to always get back this exact same response for every single test we ever put together that's ever going to try to request this route. So we probably want to think up some way to maybe still be able to reuse route handlers to some degree across our different tests, but still allow different components, different test files to define or say exactly what kind of fake response they get back. Okay, so that's what we're gonna do in just a moment. We're gonna go back to the fake route handler. We're gonna do a little bit of a refactor to it, and we're gonna make sure that we can easily reuse the implementation we put together inside of some given component that we are testing. And we're gonna make sure that another component that we might try to test could still define a completely different kind of response to come back from API slash repositories. All right, in this video, we're gonna do a little bit of a refactor. And the entire goal here is to make sure that we don't have to write out all this boilerplate when we set up MSW, and to make sure that each of our different test files can very easily specify their own custom responses to these different fake routes that we're trying to define. So for example, home route.test should be able to very easily define a route handler like this, because it always wants to see a list of repositories with two objects inside of it that have full names that kind of reflect a different language and then maybe some other imaginary components that we're going to create in the future, they might not want to see this exact kind of response. They might want to get a different response back to test out different behaviors. So again, that's the goal. And that's what we're trying to do. We want to make sure it's really easy to define these routes in very different ways in our different test files. We're going to do this by just plain making it easier to set up these different route handlers. Right now, to set up the fake route handlers, we have to put in a tremendous amount of boilerplate. We have to write out the array of handlers. There's a ton of mysterious function calls inside of here. For example, what is this res function? What is context.json? Just a lot of stuff going on here. Seems like there's more boilerplate than we really need. In addition, after we define the list of handlers, we have to call setup server and define these before alls, after each, after all, all that stuff. Just all really, really tedious. So now that we understand kind of what the issue is here, I want to help you understand the solution and the refactor we are going to do. Here is the goal. This is what I want to be able to do in our different component file tests. So the goal, I'm going to put a little section here, and I'm going to show you exactly what I want to be able to do. I want to be able to define and call a function. We will call it create server. I want to be able to pass it an array and inside there, we're going to define some different configuration objects. Each of these different configuration objects is going to define a different fake route that our components can access. We're going to say that each of these configuration objects will have a path property that's going to define exactly what the path is for incoming requests that we're going to try to respond to. So for this first one, it would be API slash repositories. I also want my config objects to define a method. So are they going to respond to a get request or a post request or a delete or what? And then finally, I want to be able to define a res function on these. This res function is going to be called whenever an incoming get request to API slash repositories is received by the fake MSW node server. This res function is going to receive the request, res, and context objects. So those are the same arguments that come into this handler down here. And then inside of this function, I want to be able to return an object that's going to contain whatever data. So really, whatever we return right here, that's what I want to send back to my component. So maybe it would be for us in this example, we want to be able to send back a list of items like so, and there will be some fake repository objects inside there. So that's the goal. And now if I want my component tests inside of this file to get another fake route, I should be able to add in another configuration object here. And then maybe you say, well, this one's going to respond to maybe post requests to API slash repositories. And in this case, maybe we're going to receive a request and we're going to respond with, I don't know, an additional item in the list of repositories or something like that. So this is the goal. 
And you'll notice right away that if we can implement this correctly, there's way less boilerplate, way less code we have to type out inside of each of our different test files just to set up MSW. Because again, right now, going through all this boilerplate in each test file will get really, really laborious really quickly. And because it's going to be so much easier to define these different routes, it's going to be just plain easier to make sure that each component test file can define their own separate routes. And so each test file can say, oh, well, I want to make sure that API slash repositories gives me back two items, or maybe 10 items, or maybe returns an error, or whatever else. Okay, so again, that's the goal. That's what we're going to try to do here. And again, I want to repeat one more time. I know that we only just started looking at testing with network requests. And so it might seem like we're going off the deep end here really quickly. But the reason we're doing this is that you're going to see just so fast that as you start testing components with requests, you have to write out these fake request handlers a ton. Because every different component that makes a request, you're going to have to put these mock routes together. So on a real project, you have to define so many of these fake routes. And that's why I want to make it really easy to set them up in our different test files. Okay, so now that we've got an idea of the goal, let's start implementation in just a moment. All right, let's get to it. Let's start the implementation of this create server function. So create server is going to receive and array these config objects. It's then going to pretty much do all of this longhand boilerplate that we put together in the previous number of videos. So it needs to define some routes that look like this using our config objects. It then needs to call setup server and then call all those appropriate before all after each after all functions. That's everything that needs to go into this new create server function that we are going to put together. So to make this function, that's our goal. I'm going to create a new directory inside my SRC folder. I'm going to call it test. And we're going to put a lot of our different test helper functions and whatnot into that directory. I'm going to make a new file inside there right away. I'm going to call it server.js. So inside this file, we're going to put some code that's going to set up a fake server while we are running our tests. At the very top, I'm going to immediately add in an import for setup server from msw slash node and rest from msw. I'm then going to define and export a function called create server. This is going to receive that array of configuration objects. So I'm going to call this argument handler config. So again, that is the array as the configuration objects, the one that I just mentioned, so pretty much this array right here in the last video. So now we're going to map over this array. And for every object inside of here, we are going to build up a brand new handler in the same style that we did right here. So we pretty much need to take one of those configuration objects and kind of transform it into something that looks like this. Okay, here's what we need to write. I'm going to go over this code a little bit quickly because understanding the exact specifics of every little bit is not super important. Really, the goal here is for you to really, truly just understand that it's really convenient to make it easy to define a server in our tests. So I'm going to say const handlers is handler config. I'm going to map over that. I'm going to receive each of those config objects one at a time. I'm then going to return rest square brackets config.method or git. So this is the first little piece of mystery right here. Remember, this rest object has different functions on it, like rest.git and rest.post and rest.delete. And they specify exactly which kind of request or what the request method is that we want to watch for. So I'm putting on config.method. I'm saying, look at that config object we just passed in. And if we define a method on it, then try to call rest.git or post or delete or whatever else. The or git right here is just a little convenience thing. If we are defining these config objects back inside of our test file, I might not always want to have to define method.git. So we are putting in a default of git requests. So if we are trying to define a git request, we should be able to write out an object that just looks like this. And it's only if we are trying to specify a post or a delete or a put or whatever else that we will have to define a method. So again, just a little convenience thing there. So that's going to give us back a function. I'm going to call it. We're going to tell that function that we want to watch for incoming requests at the given path that's defined on the config object. 
And then the second argument is going to be the function that actually gets executed when we receive one of those requests. So rec res context. Now I know once again, this code looks all bit mysterious. All we are doing is taking this array of config objects and kind of transforming them into a set of handlers like the ones that we just defined down here. So then inside of here, I'm going to return res ctx.json. And then to get the JSON that we want to send back in the response, we're going to run config.res and put in rec res ctx. And let me save that line, put in some indentation to make sure it's easier to read. Okay, so that's going to build up our list of handlers. So now we can use that to create our server. So I'll say server is set up server, put in dot, dot, dot handlers. And then we can define those before all, after each, and after all. So I'll do a before all. Inside there, I want to call server.listen. And after each, we'll do a server.reset handlers. And then an after all. And this one is a server.close. Okay, so now that's pretty much it. Let's save this. We're going to go back over to home route, our test file, and test it out. So now back inside of home route.test, at the very top, I'm going to import that create server helper function we just made. So I will import create server from up one directory, test server. Then I'm going to go to our create server call right here. We only want to define one fake route. I only put the second config object in here as demonstration. So I'm going to delete that. Whenever we receive an incoming GET request to API slash repositories, we, in this case, want to do exactly what we were doing before. So I still want to extract the language out of the query string. I then want to generate these two fake repository objects using the language. So I'm going to cut those and paste them in right here. And that's it. So now I should be able to delete all the previous handler stuff we had put together. So this big list of handlers right here, I can delete it. I don't need the setup server call, the before alls, the after eaches, after alls, and we're left with just this. I'm not using the response function or the context object, so I can delete those arguments. And I'm left with just this little bit. And I think you'll agree this is far easier to read and far easier to type out. And so it's just plain so much easier now to define these different kinds of route handlers inside of each of our different test files instead of centralize them all inside of one single file and making all of our tests share the same set of route handlers. So this is looking pretty good. Let's save the file now. Back over to our terminal. Just make sure our test is working and I made a typo here. Looks like in the after all, I did a server.closer. So it should be, of course, server.close. I'm going to fix that up inside the server.js file we just created. Now back over and yep, tests are passing. Very good. The next set of tests we're going to work on are going to again focus on data fetching. Now this next set of tests, we're not gonna have a bug for it. Instead, I really just wanna focus on a very precise problem, show you how to diagnose it, how to fix it, and of course, write a bunch of tests along the way. So we're gonna focus on testing the authentication buttons up here inside the header. Whenever a user comes to this page by default, if they are not signed in, we show a button that says sign in and sign up. If a user then creates an account, which we can do by entering some fake email, and then signs in, we then show the sign out button. That's pretty much it. This component is defined inside the SRC components auth directory. It is authbuttons.js. Here it is right here. This component itself is super simple. It's going to use this use user hook, presumably to figure out whether or not the user is currently signed in. And then depending upon whether or not they are authenticated, we're going to show a link to sign out or show the links to sign in and sign up. And that's pretty much all the component itself does. So we're going to write out a couple of tests around this. 
Now, right away, I want to highlight what is going to be a big issue here. Okay, so quick diagram or two. So here's our off buttons component. Off buttons is making use of a hook called use user. This hook is responsible for reaching out to the API and figuring out whether or not the user is currently signed in. Use user, that hook, is making use of a library called SWR. And I've pointed out SWR once or twice previously, but we haven't really taken a look at the library very closely just yet. SWR is responsible for making use of Axios to go out and fetch some data whenever it's actually required by a component. So clearly a couple levels of abstraction here, kind of a couple things going on. Now to be super clear, the entire goal of this set of tests is naturally to write out some more tests. It's to get more experience with data fetching and testing. But the real goal, I want you to be aware of this right away, is that we're going to run into a really annoying bug. A bug that's kind of hard to diagnose. It's going to be a little bit challenging to figure out what exactly the problem is. But we're going to run into an issue as we are testing our component, and we're going to do some troubleshooting. That's pretty much it. I want to show you some strategies for troubleshooting stuff and figure out what is going wrong. I know I've focused on how we kind of do these strange things a little bit inside the course, but to be honest with you, understanding the matchers and assertions and whatnot, that's all kind of the easy stuff around testing. Understanding how to use or really test these third-party libraries that we make use of in all React projects, that's really the hard part of testing. And if you haven't quite noticed yet, that's what I really want to focus on here because it is without a doubt where you're going to be spending the vast majority of time as you are testing your own applications. So in short, we're going to realize that SWR is going to cause a really big problem inside of our tests. We're going to diagnose the issue and figure out how to solve it. Let's get started on these tests around the auth buttons. So inside of the SRC components auth folder, I'm going to make a new file called authbuttons.test.js. Inside of there, at the very top, I will add in some imports for render and screen from testing library slash react. I will get memory router from React Router DOM. I'm importing that because the off buttons component shows a link component. And remember, the link component is only going to work correctly if it has that router context available above it. Next, we know that our component is going to eventually make a network request. And we're probably going to want to fake that request out in our testing environment. So I'm going to add in an import for our create server helper function from up to directories, test server. And then finally, I'm going to import auth buttons from the same directory. Okay, good start. Next up, we need to think about what we actually want to test. Well, I think that there are a couple of different ways we can go about this. We could make sure that whenever a user is not signed in, we see a button to sign in and sign up and we do not see a button to sign out. So let's take that kind of approach. Let me show you what I mean by that. Back inside of our test file, I'm gonna write out a couple of tests here. I'm gonna say, when user is not signed in, sign in and sign up are visible. And I'm gonna mark this function as async because we know we're going to need some data fetching. I'm also going to check to make sure that when the user is not signed in, sign out is not visible. And then we'll check the two opposite cases. So when user is signed in, sign in and sign out are not visible. Making sure I mark all these as async. There we go. And then the last case when user is signed in, sign, excuse me, I put sign in and signed out are not visible, should be sign in and sign up are not visible. And then on the last one down here, when user is signed in, sign out is visible. Now, you'll notice right away that keeping track of all these different cases is pretty challenging, because we have to type out when user is not signed in, not signed in, is signed in, is signed in, and we get all these different kind of comparisons, all these different variations. And yeah, it's kind of a tongue tie really quickly. So that's the first sign that something here, maybe we can eventually find some improvement. Now, the next thing I want to point out is that for each of these different tests, we're going to have to somehow fake an API response. 
because our component, when rendered, is going to make a request to figure out whether or not the user is currently signed in. So it's very clear right away that we need to understand how the authentication API works and how we're going to actually fake that response. So to figure that out, I'm going to go back over to my code editor, or excuse me, my browser, not the code editor, and inside the browser, I'm going to open up my network request log. I'm going to open up and filter by fetch XHR requests. Now you'll notice that right now I'm not authenticated at all. So if I refresh the page, I'll see a request right here, with the name of user. And if I go to the headers tab, I see that it is a get request to API slash user. And the response I get back is an object with user is null. Next, I'm going to try to sign in really quickly. I can sign in either by signing into an existing account or signing up. I'll go to sign up, put in a fake email. And then once I am signed in, I'm going to refresh the page. And now if I look at that same user request, I'll notice that now I get back a response where the user property is now set to an object. And presumably this is an object that is speaking or kind of telling us something about the currently authenticated user. So it has an ID of four and an email. So right away, we're kind of getting a hint on the how the authentication API works. If a user is signed in, then we're going to get back a response that looks like this. So it is an object that has a user property that is set to some kind of user object that has an ID and an email. If the user is not authenticated, then this same exact request is going to send us back a user of null. So that's a big hint to us. That's kind of telling us how we need to fake out the API, telling us how we need to set up the create server. So in these first two tests up here, I'm going to put in a comment to myself. I need to call create server and I need a git to slash user, excuse me, API slash user to give me back a response of user is null. That's how I'm going to tell my component or make my component think that the user is not signed in. And then on the two tests down here, I need to somehow call create server a second time and a get request to API slash user. I need it to return a response of something like user is some object with an ID and an email. Like so. Okay. So we kind of have our work cut out for us because we have spoken about how we made this create server helper function to make sure that we can very easily have different test files return different kinds of responses. That's the entire re reason we made create server. But now we are in a case where we need tests inside of the same test file to be able to call create server and set up completely different responses. So that's what we're going to figure out in the coming videos. How can we somehow make sure that these two tests are going to get this kind of response and these two tests are going to get a very different kind of response. As I just mentioned, we need to set up a copy of our fake API server that's going to return some very specific response for the first two tests. And then we want to have some very different responses for the next two. So this is going to require us to get a little bit more information around how this server is created, what it's doing, and also we're going to require us to understand Jest itself a little bit better. So first thing I want to do is show you one possible option that you might be thinking would work. And I want to help you understand why this option wouldn't. So could we do something like this? Could we call create server right above the first two tests and say, okay, if anyone makes a get request to API slash user, return an object with a user of null. And then right before the next two tests, could we call it again? And on this one, return a user that is defined. And that would simulate a user not being signed in for the first two and being signed in for the next two. Unfortunately, this would not work. And I want to help you understand why using a little bit of interactive code here. So back inside of my test file, I'm going to add in a create server right here. I'm going to put in an array with an object, and we're just going to pretty much do exactly what you saw in that screenshot. I'll put in a method of git. We don't actually need that because remember, we have that as the default method. So I'm going to take that back out. So if anyone makes an API request to API slash user, I want to respond and I want to send back an object with a user of null in this case, because we are currently trying to set up the user not signed in scenario. And I'm going to copy this down here. 
And on this one, I want to send back a response where a user is an object. And a user has an ID of some ID, it's going to be a number, and an email. Any email, doesn't really matter what it is. Okay, so that's pretty much what is in the screenshot. Now, here's the next thing I want to do. I'm going to go around to each of these different tests, so all four of them. I'm going to open them up, and I'm going to add in some console logs. I'm going to put in test one. The next one, I'm going to do a console log of test two, and then test three, and test four. And then before we run this, one last thing I want to do, I want to go and open up the create server file, or the file that defines that function. So recall that is the test server.js file. Here it is right here. And then remember, inside of here, whenever we call create server, we define a server, but it doesn't actually start listening for requests until we call before all, or I should say when jest calls before all, and it closes the server down with server.close. So here's the last thing I want to do. I'm going to add in a console log right here of a server is listening. And then down here, a server is closed. Okay, so let's now save all this back over to our terminal, and we're going to run this test. So back over at our terminal, remember we can do a W and then a P, and I want to run all the tests that have the name auth buttons in the title. Okay, looks like our tests are passing, but remember we don't actually have any assertions just yet. What we really care about here are the console logs. So I want you to scroll up and I want you to take a look at the console logs and what you see might be a little bit surprising. So it looks like we start off with two, a server is listenings, we then see test one, two, three, and four, and then we get two, a server is closed. So what is going on here? Now, if you think about it, the output that we're getting at our terminal might look a little bit out of order. And the reason for that is that we are calling create server right here, and then we don't call the second one until way down here. And you might think that we would expect to run these two tests before the second server is created. But unfortunately, that is not how Jest actually runs your tests. Here's what actually goes on behind the scenes. Whenever Jest runs one of your test files, it's going to run all the code in here at the very top level. And it's not going to immediately execute your test functions just yet. So this arrow function does not get instantly executed the moment Jest comes across it. Instead, Jest is going to run all the code inside this file, and it's going to collect all your tests. It's going to say, oh, here's a test for me to run, and it's not going to run it just yet. So Jest is going to run this create server. That's going to set up a before all, where we're going to do a console log of a server is running, or excuse me, a server is listening. Jest is then going to notice you have two tests here, but it's not going to run them just yet. Instead, it's just going to keep a hold of them. It's then going to continue execution and go down to the next create server. We run that create server. We're going to run a second before all, and so we get a second console log of a server is listening. It's then going to register the next two tests down here. Then Jest is going to realize it has executed all the code inside this file, and so now it's going to go back. It's going to find all the tests that it noticed, so test one, two, three, and four, and run those tests. And then after all the tests have been executed, then it's going to run the before alls that were registered. So that's why we are seeing this particular order. That is why we see two, a server is listening. We then see test one, two, three, and four, and then two, a server is closed. And that's why we do not see what you might have expected. You might have expected to see the one server set up, and then test one, test two, and then another server is set up and listening. So is this a problem for us? Well, absolutely yes. It means that we have two separate fake API servers running at the same time with this approach. And obviously, we do not want that. We only ever want there to be exactly one server running. So we want this server to be running only for these first two tests, and then we want to close it down. And we want this server running just for these first two tests, and then we want to close it down. So we're going to learn a little bit more about Jest in the next video, and we're going to understand how we can limit the amount of time or kind of for which tests each of these servers are actually running. All right, so let's take a look at how we're going to limit or kind of scope down how long this first server is running, make sure it's only running for the first two tests, and same thing for the second server down here.
So we're going to use a technique called test nesting. Right above this first comment, I'm going to add in a describe. And I'm going to pass in as the first argument a string of when user is not signed in. The second argument is going to be a function. I'm going to take this first comment and everything down to the first two tests. I'm going to cut all that and I'm going to place it into the describe. I'm then going to call describe a second time down here. I'm going to give it a description of when user is signed in. Second argument of a function. I'll then take everything from the comment down to the last two tests. I'm going to cut all that and paste it into the describe. So now our test file, if I collapse my code here, I'm going to collapse each of these describes. It should look like this. So we've got one describe where the user is not signed in, another describe where they are signed in. And then on the first describe, I've got a create server in there and the two tests. On the second describe, I've got a create server and the two tests. So now let's save this, go back over to our terminal again and see what order our console logs are in now. Okay, so take a look at these console logs. You'll notice that they are much closer to what we want. So now if I scroll up to the very top, I see a server is listening, test one, two, and a server is closed. Then a server is listening, test three and four, and a server is closed. So this is very good. This means that we are creating a server. It is existing and listening for incoming requests just for the first two tests, and then it shuts down. We then create a completely different server. It is running for only test three and four, and then it gets shut down. So we have set this up by using this describe function. A describe function lets us nest tests. This has two important results. First, it allows us to just organize our code a little bit better inside of a test file and describe some overall conditions or just kind of mark a set of tests as being kind of about one precondition. So in this case, if another engineer saw this describe function, they would immediately understand that all the tests inside of this function, this describe block is how we refer to it, are about the fact or the case in which a user is signed in. And then up here on the first describe, another engineer would see this and understand all the tests inside of here are about when a user is not signed in. So that's the first nice thing about the describe function. The second nice thing is that it, it scopes the before all, the before each, the after each, and the after all functions. So if these functions are called at the kind of top level of a file, they're going to apply to all the tests inside that file. But when these functions get called inside of a describe block, they're going to only apply to the tests inside of that describe. So when we call create server right here, we can kind of imagine that we are really kind of doing something like this. So I'm going to zoom out here just for a second so you can see this entire line. And just for a second, I'm going to remove that code. You don't have to make that change. I'm going to undo this in just a moment. So when we call create server in the first described block, this is kind of what we are doing. We are calling before all, after each, and after all. And these little hooks right here are only going to apply to these two tests, the tests that are defined inside of this described block. If we want to define before all, after each, and after all they're going, that are going to apply to all the tests inside the file, then they would have to be placed outside of the described block. Okay, so this technique is going to allow us to make sure that we create one server that gives us a very specific kind of response for these tests, and then a very different server that is going to give us a totally different kind of response for these tests, which is exactly what we are looking for. So this is good. So now that we've got this set up, we can start to render our component. When the component gets rendered, it's going to make a request, try to figure out if the user is signed in. It's going to make a request to the respective fake API server, and then we should be able to very easily write out some assertions and make sure that, say, the sign in and sign up buttons are visible or sign out is not visible or whatever else. All right, my friends, let's get to it. We're going to write out our actual assertions here. So to get started, at the very top of the file, I'm going to create a function called render component. We're going to have to render our component four times, once for each test. So we're just going to save ourselves a little bit of time here by making this reusable function. Inside of here, I'm going to render my auth buttons. And I'm going to wrap this with a memory router. 
Then I'm going to go around to my different tests. I'm going to replace the console logs with a render component. Down here as well. There we go. The other thing I'm going to do really quickly, you'll notice that our describe function is now stating whether or not a user is signed in. So I don't really need that description inside of each test statement as well. So I can remove the when user is not signed in right there and that one right there. And then I can do the same thing down here as well. So when user is signed in, I'm going to take those out. Okay, let's save this back over to our terminal, see how we're doing. And so right away, you'll notice that we're getting another one of those act warnings. Okay, that's fine. We'll address that in just a moment. First, I want to scroll down, take a look at our test output. So you'll notice that when we put in a describe block, now we get kind of a section here inside of our test report. So we see when user is not signed in, and it's very easy to read the entire test here. So we would read this as when user is signed in, sign in and sign up are visible, and sign out is not visible. And when user is signed in, blah, 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 blah. So using that describe block is going to put in this nicely formatted text in our test report. Now we're going to address that act warning in just a moment. First, before I forget, let's go back over to the server.js file. I left in the console log in the for all and the after all. So I'm just going to clean those up really quick. There we go. Okay. So back over inside of our test file, as we saw over in the terminal, we're getting a act warning yet again. And remember the number one way in which we resolve these act warnings is to just make sure that we watch for some element to appear, some element that indicates that our data fetching is complete. So we can kind of figure out a good way to do that by using that little trick I showed you a little bit ago. We're going to repeat it here really quickly. So I'm going to find the sign in and sign up our visible test. And the trick is to put in a little bit of a pause right here and then do a screen.debug before and after it. So we can take a look at how our component is changing before and after a pause, and that's going to give us an idea of what element we can wait to appear on the screen. That's going to give us a sign that the data fetching process is complete. Let's define a little pause helper function once again. So down here, I'll do a const pause. And I'm going to return a new promise that will be called with resolve. I'll then call set timeout with resolve and a delay of 100 milliseconds. Okay, let's save this. Then back over in the terminal. I'm going to scroll up, 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 up. So here's the first screen.debug. It looks like we start off with pretty much nothing visible. And then very quickly after that, it appears that some anchor element becomes a visible. So this is a sign that once these anchor elements are visible on the screen, once we see any link at all, that is a sign that we are ready to actually run our test. It's a sign that the data fetching has finished. So to solve the act warning, we could do an await, find all by role, and just to look for links. And as soon as we see any links appear, that's a sign that we are ready to go. So let's try that out really quickly. I'm going to remove all the screen.debug stuff and the pause helper down here. And then inside of this first test, I'm going to do an await screen find all by role. And I just want to find any links at all. And I'm going to do that in the second test down here as well. And then for right now, I'm going to comment out the entire second describe block. We'll just focus on making sure that these two work. Okay, save this again. If I flip back over, looks like the test is passing and we no longer have any act warnings. That's definitely good. We are definitely on the right path here. We've got the nice find by role function just to solve that act warning. And you'll notice that right away, it seems like we are writing out this await on both these tests. And we're probably going to have to do the same thing down here as well. Because on every single case, whenever we call render component, we are always going to run into this act warning. So rather than having all of our tests have to call find all by role as the very first thing they, thing they do after calling render component, let's just move this up into the render component function. So I'm going to cut that line up here at render component. I'm going to mark this function as async. I'm no longer going to return the result of render. 
and then I'm going to await screen find all by role. So now down inside of our two tests, we can await the render component statement. And now this function is not going to resolve. We're not going to resolve that promise until our component is ready for testing. So just condensing our code a little bit. Okay, that looks good. Next up, let's write out some assertions for these two tests. To decide what assertions to write, let's go and look at the auth buttons component again. So here's auth buttons. We're currently trying to test a case in which a user is not signed in. So if a user is not signed in, we're going to show a link to slash sign in, and it has an accessible name of sign in. We also show sign up, and it shows a link with a accessible name of sign up. So let's write out some assertions for those. On the first one, I'm going to try to find both of those links using a query function of screen dot get by role. I'm going to look for an element with the role of link and a name. Remember, this is the accessible name. I'm going to put in a regular expression of sign in. And then I'll do something very similar for the sign up button. So sign up button. In this case, I'm looking for one with an accessible name of sign up. Then we can write out some assertions and just make sure that these things are in the document, number one, and make sure that they have the appropriate href property. So I'll do an expect sign in button to be in the document and expect sign in button to have attribute href to sign in, so slash sign in to be precise. And then we can duplicate that, put it down, change this one to sign out, or excuse me, sign up button, getting these mixed up all the time. And this one will have an href of sign up. There we go. Okay, let's save this back over to the terminal. Yep, very good. So now we can take care of the sign up button. So in this case, we want to make sure that an element is not visible on the screen. Remember that if we use a get by query helper here, if we are not able to find an element when we are making use of get by, then an error is going to be thrown. That is going to fail our test. So if we ever want to assert that an element is not present, we're going to instead use query by role. Query by role just returns null if we are not able to find an element. So we can do a sign out button is screen query by role link with an accessible name of sign out. And I will expect sign out button not to be in the document. There we go. So let's save this back over to the terminal. Once again, looks like we are passing. Excellent. So our first set of tests is working perfectly. So now we get to move on to the second set. And this is where we're going to start to run into a little bit of trouble. But let's just see exactly what that trouble is and see if we can't do a little bit of debugging to figure out what is going on. Let's move on down to our second set of tests here that handle the case where a user is signed in. I'm going to uncomment all these tests, and then we're going to put the entire implementation of these together. So first on the test where we make sure that the sign in and sign up buttons are not visible, I'm going to make sure I await render component. I'm then going to try to find the sign in button with a screen query by role. And same thing to find the sign up button. And remember, we're once again using query by, because if we use a get by to find an element that is not present on the screen, we're going to immediately get an error. In this case, we want to make sure these things aren't visible. So we should not be getting back a result. We can then do an expect sign in button. Once again, same thing here, not to be in the document. And same thing for sign up button. Let's then take care of the last one down here. So we will await render a component. I'll then do sign out button. In this case, we can do a get by role because we do expect this thing to be present. Link with an accessible name of sign out. 
and then we will expect the sign out button first to be in the document, and then second to make sure that it has the appropriate attribute. So expect sign out button to have attribute href and to sign out, remember the link that we're looking for or the href is slash sign out. There we go. All right, so our first set of tests worked just fine. And so I've got every expectation in the world that the second set is gonna work perfectly as well, right? I don't see any reason that it shouldn't work whatsoever. So let's save this test file. So go back over to our terminal and see how we're doing. And sure enough, both tests are failing. So let's take a look at the error messages. And as soon as we do so, we're gonna see some very surprising results. On this first test right here, so it's when the user is signed in, sign in and sign up should not be visible. In this case, it looks like the sign in button was found. It was in the document. That is very much unexpected. Down here, sign out is visible. So we should find sign out. And sure enough, we get an error message that says, well, we were not able to find one that has a name of sign out, but it did find a sign in button and a sign up button. So it looks like these two tests are completely reversed of what we expect. In the case where a user is signed in, both tests are completely wrong. They're the exact opposite of what we expect to find. Inside of some of the output, we can also just really confirm that very plainly. So this is the output when a user should be signed in, we are continuing to see the sign in and sign up buttons. So once again, without a doubt, something is just plain not right here. I want you to understand right away that our test is written out exactly, perfectly, correctly. Everything about this is totally fine. And it turns out that it's actually a completely separate, totally different library that's at fault here. So I'm going to give you some details around this in the next video, help you understand what is going on. Unfortunately, our test is not working, even though it really appears that it should be behaving as expected. So before we say anything else here, I just want to give you a quick heads up on what's going to be going on in the next couple of videos. So we've got a bug here. There's an actual bug, so to speak, and we're going to have to figure out how to fix it. And fixing the bug, well, it's going to be a little bit nasty because it's going to require us to have some knowledge of one of the libraries inside this project. So you might be a little bit frustrated with that. You might say, Stephen, I don't know this library. I don't know how to use it. That's totally fine. Just so you know, the real goal here, the reason I'm showing you this stuff, is so that you can see some strategies for debugging tests. And I also, really important here, I want you to understand that sometimes you're going to be using libraries and they're not going to just kind of magically behave as you would hope they would behave in a testing environment. In many cases, the default behavior of a lot of the libraries that we use, well, it's just plain not going to behave as expected when we are trying to test our components. And that's pretty much what we have here. It's something related to our data fetching process. Something related to our data fetching is behaving kind of as intended in a production or development environment, but that behavior is not at all what we want in the test environment. Okay, so let's get started. We're going to first take a look at some debugging strategies. So it's very clear that our test is failing, even though we really expect it to pass. We need to figure out why that is. We need to be able to somewhat narrow down the cause of this failure. So a couple of strategies here. The first one that we're going to focus on is using a test.only or a describe.only statement. These are functions that are built into the Jest test runner that allows us to specify exactly what tests we want to run out of all the tests inside of our project. So let me show you how to use this. I'm going to go back over to my editor. I'm inside of authbuttons.test. And I'm going to collapse both the describe blocks once again. And the first thing we might do is just check to see what happens if we run only the second describe block. Because right now, the tests inside of that describe block are failing. So we kind of want to focus on those tests. To make sure that we can focus on just those tests alone, we can change the describe right here to a describe.only. So that tells the Jest test runner that we only want to run the tests inside of this describe block and to ignore the tests inside of the other one. So again, just allows us to focus on one set of tests inside of our test file. Another way we could do this, if there's only one single test we want to run, we can go and find the appropriate test and then change it to right here, test dot only. 
And as you guess, that means we're going to run only this test out of the entire file. All right, I'm going to undo that. And again, I really just want to run the second describe. So I'm going to change the second describe to describe.only. I'm going to save this back over to our terminal, and we'll see how we are doing. And right away, I want you to notice the output here. We get some yellow circles next to when user is not signed in. And that means that we have skipped those tests. Jest has recognized that they exist, but we just skipped over them entirely. So now we are only running when user is signed in. And right away, we get some extremely important information here. This is super critical. Just a moment ago, when we were running all of our tests inside this file, we saw that when user is signed in was failing. But now, this is again really critical, it appears that when we run only the test for user is signed in, the tests are passing. That's super interesting. It means that, well, maybe there's some interplay between these two sets of tests, which we would really not want. And what I mean by interplay, it looks like maybe some of the setup or something we're doing around these tests is affecting what's going on in these other tests. And we can kind of deduce that by the fact that when we run only these, it appears that they work. Okay, so as you can see right away, running only a certain set of tests inside of a file, it can give you some really valuable information and help you narrow down or start to understand what might be going wrong. There's some other things we can do here to kind of narrow down the cause of our failing tests. The next big thing is going to be setting up a debugger. Let me show you how we do that in a test environment in just a moment. The next technique we're going to take a look at is setting up a debugger. This allows us to pause the execution of our tests or our components as we are testing them and just take a look at some of the different variables that are flowing throughout our different components and whatnot. Now, setting up a debugger just requires a couple of different steps here. So here's what we need to do. First, we're going to go into our package.json file. We're going to add in a brand new script to it. And the script is going to be what you see right here. We only have to do this one time for each project. So let's do it right away. Back over inside of my editor. I'm going to find the package.json file. Here it is right here. I'm going to go on down to the script section. And then right after the existing test command, I'm going to add in another command of test colon debug. And then I'm going to paste in my command. So make sure you copy that down. React scripts, inspect, dash, brk, and then some additional arguments. And notice that test right here, no dashes in front of it, just the word test. Once we have added that in, I'm going to save the file. I'm then going to go back over to our test file. And I'm going to undo the describe.only. So I'm going to change that back to a describe. So now if we want to, we can pause execution of our code by placing a debugger statement. So somewhere in either a test file or a component, we can add in one of those debuggers. So let's go over to maybe authbuttons.js. I'm going to find authbuttons right here. And I'm going to try putting in a debugger right there. And the goal here is that we should be able to see how often this component is being rendered. And we'll be able to take a look at this user variable to understand whether or not it is currently or whether or not we are currently signed in. So now we're going to skip over the test.only for just a moment. We're going to go over to our terminal. We're going to run the npm run test colon debug command that we just added in. That's going to run our test in a very special mode and tell the test runner that we don't want to just go ahead and run all of our tests right away. Instead, we want to pause on the first debugger statement it finds. So over at my terminal, I'm going to open up another terminal window still inside the same project directory, and I'll do an npm run test colon debug. Now we'll be given some output right away. You'll notice that it gives us some URLs that we can navigate to. We don't really want to use those just yet. Instead, what we're going to do is open up our browser, and we're going to navigate to about colon inspect. So over inside my browser, I will open up a new window, go to about colon inspect. And now I'm going to see right here, that's my running test process. So I can click on inspect. And now I'm in a debugger and I can take a look at what is going on inside of my tests. When you first attach the debugger, we're going to be kind of at the very first point of running all of our different tests. So usually we're going to want to click on that blue play button on the top right hand side to fast forward execution to get to the debugger statement we had added in. So I'm going to click on the blue arrow 
And then after a brief pause here, I will go to the debugger statement that we had added inside of our component. And so now we can say print out the user variable. And we'll see that right now that user variable inside of the auth buttons component is undefined. How about the is loading variable? Okay, that's defined. So now we can use that blue arrow again to fast forward to the next time this component gets rendered. Maybe take a look at user again. Can fast forward again, take a look at user again, fast forward again. You get the idea. We can repeat this process a bit and to get a better understanding of exactly what's going on inside of our tests. Now, at first glance here, it kind of seems like, hey, just printing out user a whole bunch and seeing that it is null, yeah, it doesn't seem that useful, right? We don't even really know what test is currently running. So clearly, even though creating a debugger is possibly useful, it's not really clear why it is just yet. So let's take one more pause. Now that we understand how to set up this debugger, we're going to take a deeper look at how we can use this technique to better debug our tests and figure out what is happening. Now that we've got this debugger technique, let me show you how we can use it to better inspect what's going on inside of our tests. So I'm inside of our auth buttons component. I'm going to leave in the debugger statement right here. I'm then going to go over to our test. At the top of the test file, I'm going to find the first describe block. I'm then going to find the first test statement right here with sign in and sign up are visible. I'm going to put in a test.only right here. And then the first thing I'm going to do is place a debugger. I'm then going to scroll on down to the second describe. I'm going to find the first test in there and also mark that one with an only. And then I'm going to put a debugger right there. I'm then going to collapse some code here just to make sure it's super clear what we've now got going on inside of our test file. So let me do some collapsing. There we go. All right, so now whenever we run our tests, we're going to run only two of these tests, only sign in and sign up are visible and sign in and sign up are not visible. And as we run these tests, what we should see in terms of these debugger statements, we should first pause execution inside of this first test right here at that debugger statement. We've added in this debugger just so we know when this test is active and running. When we then fast forward execution of our code in the debugger, we should then land on the next debug statement, which is inside of our component right here. So now we're going to be able to understand when we are landing at this debugger in our component based upon which test we are currently running. So just keep that in mind for a moment. Okay, I'm now going to go back over to my terminal. I'm going to make sure I'm still running that npm run test colon debug command. I'm going to go back over to my browser and remember the URL is about colon inspect. And once I've got that open, I'll click on inspect right here. And now I'm going to fast forward execution. I should land inside of one of those tests. And I did right there. So this is the test or the describe when the user is not signed in. So now I am 100% aware I'm currently running this test. And when I fast forward execution again, I should land inside of my component and it should be in the context of this test. So I'm going to click play. Okay, I'm now inside of my component. I can now inspect that user variable. And right now it is undefined. I'm then going to press play again. I'm still inside of here, which means I'm still running that same test. And chances are this component just re-rendered because it fetched that user. So if I now print out user, I'll see that it is now null. So it wasn't undefined and now it is null. Let's just keep that in our head for a second. I'm going to click on play again. Now I'm in our second test we are running. This is in the describe block that is currently failing. It is a case when the user is signed in. So now that I know that I'm in this test, I'm going to play again. I'm back inside of my component. Now I know that my component is rendering while I am inside of that second test. So now I'm going to print out user again. And I want you to notice something really important. This is another big clue to us as to what is going wrong. User is null. On the previous test, it started off as undefined, and then it went over to null. And in this test, it just starts off as null entirely. Now I'm going to press play again, and it looks like nothing happens here. But if I go back over to my terminal, I'll see that the test completed running. And it appears that, yep, that second test did in fact fail again. Okay, so did we learn anything there? Well, we definitely did. We saw something very important. 
And let me show you some diagrams just to make sure it's really clear exactly what happened as we are debugging these tests. All right, this diagram is a little bit crazy, but I did my best to kind of illustrate what is happening. So we are starting off here at the top. We've got the describe block where we are not signed in. Now I want you to think about what is going on inside of that describe block. Inside the describe, we are creating a server. And that fake server should be sending back a response whenever we try to figure out if we are signed in or not of user is null. Remember, that indicates the user is currently not authenticated. So we create that server. We then run that first test. We render the component. And then we want to see, we expect to see user of null. That's what should be coming out of that hook. The use user hook. We should be getting back user of null, which indicates the user is just not signed in. And that's exactly what we got. That is completely what we saw. We saw user start off as undefined, which means we had not yet fetched them. We then saw it transition over to null, which means we had fetched some data and we now know the user is not signed in. So everything about this first describe block looks like it is working as expected. So now let's consider the second describe. This is where our tests are failing. So inside there, we should be making a server that is going to return a user object. And remember, that's going to be an object that has an ID and some email address as well. We then start up our test, we render the component, and then we have that debugger statement. And we saw very clearly that even though we want to get back some user that is defined, that's not what we saw. We saw that inside of this test, user was null. That's what it was. So I think that this is a huge sign to us that we might be creating the server correctly. Maybe we're not, that's definitely something to inspect. But what really appears to be happening right now is we've got some leaking of data. Some data from a previous test is somehow kind of getting into the next test down and it's making the second test right here fail because we're accidentally thinking that the user is not signed in when they definitely should be. So again, a really big sign that something is not quite right. An easier way to confirm this would be to switch the order of our tests. It's kind of hard to figure out what's going on if we have this null value. You know, we see null and it's kind of like, what does null mean in this context? But what we could do is try moving this entire describe block up first. And now if we see a user object appear in our component here, we might see this user object leak on down to the second test. And that would be a very clear sign that we've got some data that is kind of contaminating or kind of persisting across these different tests. And so again, that'd be a little bit more clear sign than just relying upon this null variable. So we could try out that variation really quickly as well. I'm going to do it myself. You don't have to do this. I'm just going to show you very quickly. So back over inside my editor, I'm going to find the entire second describe block. I'm going to cut it and I'm going to place it before the first one. And I'm going to collapse my code again just so you can see really easily what I've done. So now I've got when user is signed in and then not signed in. Now I'm going to save this back over to my debugger. You'll notice it popped right back up instantly for me. So debugger persists even if I restart my tests. And it looks like, you know, I'm looking at this. Okay, yes, when user is signed in, sign in and sign up are not visible. Okay, that's good. That's what we want. And so now if I press play, let's look at user now. So user starts off as undefined. Okay, that's good. So that's kind of the initial render of our component. I'm going to fast forward. And now I would expect this to be our user object that's coming back from the server. Yep, definitely is. That's very good. I'm going to press play again. So now I'm in when user is not signed in. So this is the next test. I would expect to only see user be undefined or null here. I can press play, I'm back inside the component. And now if I print out user, I see the user object. And that is again, completely unexpected and very much not what we want. So once again, we're in this scenario where we are running this test first, we've created a server that is gonna return this user object. And we are now seeing that user object appear correctly. So that means that's good, we want that. But now when we get that down to this test here, we are seeing that same user object appear. And that's again, just not what we want. We want to have a user of null to indicate that the user is not signed in. So again, this is just really clear sign that we've got some leakage of data between our tests.
through extensive use of our debugger, we have realized that we've got some data that is being created or served up inside of whatever test is running first, the first describe block here, and whatever data we are returning inside this first test from our server, it's somehow getting down to our second describe block, the second set of tests inside this file. So the next thing we would probably want to do here to figure out what is going on is remove all the debugger statements we have added. Let's take care of that really quickly. So we've added in three in total. One is inside of our component. There it is right there. I'm going to delete it. I then got one inside of our test file inside of the first describe block. Here it is right here. I'm going to delete the debugger along with the test dot only. So now it's just test. I'll then go down to the second describe. I'm going to delete that debugger and again, change it back to a test function. So the next little bit of debugging that we can do here is to verify, make sure these servers are being actually created and are receiving requests. So to confirm that, super easy, we could just add in some console logs inside of these response functions. So inside of this response function, I'll do a console log of not logged in. How about not logged in response? I think that's good. I'll then go back up to the first describe, find the create server right there, and inside of the response function, put in a console log of logged in response. So now if we run our test, we should be able to take a look at the console logs and hopefully see some number of logged in response and some number of not logged in response. So back over to our terminal. Remember, we have two terminal windows open right now. One is running the debugger version of our tests. We don't need that anymore. So I'm going to close that terminal window and go back to our normal npm run test command. Then in here, I'm going to scroll up a little bit, and we're going to try to find those console logs. So if I scroll up, here is the total crux of the issue. So this is the whole problem right here. Notice how we get exactly one single response, this, or one single console log, and it says logged in response. This is absolutely not good, because right now we are rendering our component a total of four times. One time in that test, one time in that test, once there, once there. So I would expect to see at a minimum four console logs. And then out of those four, I would expect to see two saying logged in response. And I would expect to see two that say not logged in response. So this is kind of the last big clue that we get as to our problem. It kind of narrows down the issue entirely. So this tells us in particular that the issue is probably not our server setup because it's clear that the server is receiving requests, that fake API server, it is receiving requests. We see a console log right here. We only see the one single console log. So this again is a really big clue that all the fake API stuff is completely working as expected. And the issue must be between our component and the actual fake API server. So the only other place where this issue could really be coming from is probably going to be inside of that use user hook. That's kind of the only bit of code that sits between that fake API server and our component where we are trying to make use of this user property. And that's going to take us into that hook. So that's going to be our last stop for debugging to figure out this problem and understand how to fix it. Through a little bit of debugging, we have narrowed down the probable cause of our failing tests to the use user hook inside of our auth buttons component. So let's go ahead and take a look at that hook definition. Inside my editor, I will find the src hooks use user.js file. And here it is right here. All right, so here's our hook. You'll notice that this hook is making use of the SWR library. If you are not familiar with this library, that is totally fine. It is deceptively simple. You can think of use SWR as being like a combination between use effect and use state. So this is pretty much saying whenever first rendered in a component, or whenever we first make use of a use user inside of a component, use SWR is going to run this user fetcher function. And user fetcher is going to make a request and then just return whatever data is requested, whatever data we get back. Use SWR is then going to hold on to that data. It's going to cache it. And if for some reason we ever call this hook again, rather than making another request, rather than trying to get whether or not the user is currently signed in again, 
this hook is going to return the data that it already fetched previously. And that is the key to our entire bug. Let me repeat it just to make sure it's clear. The use SWR hook, it is used for data fetching. It's only going to attempt to fetch some data one single time when our component is first rendered. When it fetches that data, it's going to cache the response in some central cache. So SWR has its own cache that it creates, and we don't really see it or interact with it. If we then ever make use of this hook ever again at any point in time in this component, in another component, any other time, rather than fetching the data again, it's going to serve up the response it already has inside of its cache. So that kind of explains what is going on inside of our component in our tests. Back inside my test file, I'm going to again collapse everything here. Quick collapse, collapse. There we go. And right here, there we go. So inside of our tests, we have seen that whatever set of tests is first, it seems like that test always passes and the other one always seems to fail. So what's going on behind the scenes is inside the first set of tests, we are rendering our component. It's making use of the use user hook. That causes us to make that fake network request and get back a response of either the user is signed in or signed out. We then hold on to or cache that response. And that cached response that is being maintained by the use SWR library is then held on to and eventually used in the next set of tests down here. So we are serving up or just getting some fake or stale data, some cached response in the next set of tests. So in the first set right now, I'm getting back from my server a user object. And then as we go and run the second set right here, we get still the user object, the one that is cached. And we saw that repeatedly inside of our debugger as we're trying to debug this thing and figure out what is going on. So that's it. We are serving up cache data. The cache is not being cleared out between our different tests. And that's why we are seeing the complete opposite of what we expect to see when we are checking to see if the user is signed in or not. Now, I want to repeat really quickly here something that I said just a little bit ago. The entire goal here was to see some debugging strategies and understand that sometimes these libraries are going to kind of sabotage us in a test environment. And so after going through all this debugging stuff, you might come out on the other side saying, Stephen, wait, you're telling me it's the SWR library. You might not even be familiar with that library. You might think this has been not super useful, but again, the real goal here was to see those debugging strategies and just understand that sometimes your libraries in a development or production environment, they're going to do things like caching. And that's very desirable. We'd like that. But when we go over to the testing world, that same exact behavior is really bad and we want to turn it off entirely or our tests are going to fail in really unexpected ways. That was the whole point of all this, not really to focus on SWR too much. Okay, so now that we understand the problem, all we have to do is solve it. And fortunately, solving this caching issue is going to be super simple. The real problem was just figuring out exactly what the problem was. All right, let's take a look at how we can solve this caching issue. Now, once again, I want to show you how you can figure out how to solve this on your own. What I would probably do is go off to Google. We are using the SWR library. I might do a search for something like SWR reset cache because we want to reset that cache in between each of our different tests. I can go to the documentation page for the SWR library, and this entire page is all about the cache. And you'll see on a description right here, by default, SWR uses a global cache to share data across all components. And so that kind of confirms what we suspected. There is a global cache. It is sharing data across all components, even between these different tests. I also notice a note right here. It says, here's how you can reset cache between test cases. Seems like it's super relevant for what we are trying to do. So if I go to that link, it's going to tell me very simply, very plainly, exactly what I have to do. Whenever I render my component, so here's a render function, I just need to place in this SWR config component around it and provide this value prop of a provider is some map object. That's pretty much it. So behind the scenes, just so you know what's going on here, this map object is being used as the cache. By providing an empty map, it is telling SWR we want it to kind of reset or empty out all the data it has already fetched. So that's it. That's how we're going to solve this problem. So let me show you how to do it. Back over inside of our test file at the very top, I'm going to import SWR config from SWR. 
Then inside the render component function, I'm going to put in SWR config. Close it off. Put in that value prop, two sets of curly braces, and then a provider. And I think that was going to be an arrow function. Yep, arrow function, new map, like so. And that should be it. So let's try saving this back over to our terminal. And now at the very top here, I see that I am in fact getting all the console logs out of our server. And we are seeing all these console logs because now we are not reusing cache data in between every render of our component. Instead, we are dumping that cache entirely, which means when our component is rendered, it's going to make a brand new request off to the fake API and try to get some data. It also looks like our tests are all passing now. Fantastic. So that fixed the problem exactly what we wanted. Last thing I'm going to do here, inside of create server, I'm going to delete those console logs. So that one right there. And we've got another one down here. I will also delete that console log. And that's it. Okay, so this has been eye-opening. I know a little bit of a hassle. I, I was kind of on the fence on whether or not to include this section in the course because having to go through all this effort just to realize it was from a library that you might not be familiar with, yeah, a little bit painful. But again, I really want to show you that debugging process, help you understand how you can kind of narrow down the source of a problem in your tests.